Only 15% that watch my videos are subscribed. Please don't forget to if you like my content. This helps me out a lot. Enjoy the video. 11 September 2001, Hilltop Road, Lancaster, Massachusetts. Jeff Knox sat at his kitchen table looking out across his backyard. Outside, the sun shined brightly on this late summer morning in Lancaster, Massachusetts. Of course, that could change in a moment in New England. He hoped the good weather would hold for his shift later that night. With one supervisor out on bereavement and another two on vacation, Jeff would fill in as tonight's shift commander for Devon's medical defense. They were a class five ambulance service using SUVs to bring paramedics and their equipment to support municipal ambulance services of eight towns surrounding Fort Devon's and to the base's service. Working an overnight shift was unusual for him these days now that he was the division operations manager. Since DMD was part of the Brophy Ambulance Group, Jeff's seniority in the original Brophy EMS division transferred to the new division with him last year. He'd worked for Seamus Brophy since 1993, over eight years now. The laughter from his wife and children brought him back from his musings. Keiko taught English at Devon's Regional High School in neighboring Shirley. Normally, she was already at work by this time of the day. Today, however, she sat at the table having breakfast with him and their three kids because of a doctor's appointment later. Her presence, while unusual, was welcome. The coffee maker behind Jeff gurgled, signaling that it was done. With Keiko home for the morning, he made a full pot. He rose and retrieved his mug, which read, World's Greatest Dad. The kids each signed it with different colored permanent paint markers and gave it to him for his birthday in August. Jeff used it every day since opening that gift, and it was his favorite. He filled the mug with the dark brown elixir of life known as coffee. Jeff would not defile it by adding cream or sugar. He drank his coffee black and, almost, never iced. His wife drank her coffee with cream and sugar, though without the ridiculous amounts of both, which his younger sister Kara used. Jeff filled Keiko's cup and brought it to her. She smiled up at him while listening to something their middle child, Ryan, told her. Jeff stood near his chair, sipping cautiously at his brew, not wanting to burn his mouth. He was tough, not stupid. Jeff turned on the television in the living room during family mealtime, an unusual occurrence. He wanted to check the weather forecast for tonight, to plan for his shift. The local news stations ran their weather segments during the last five or ten minutes of the eight o'clock hour, right before they switched to their national network's morning news shows at nine. Instead of a local newsroom on the screen, Jeff saw a national network broadcast already in progress. It showed an image of one of the towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. A large hole in one side of the tower streamed smoke into the clear blue sky. As you can see, a reporter said, a small plane has crashed into the side of the North Tower of the World Trade Center. At this time, we're not sure what happened to cause the crash. Jeff paused while about to take another sip of his coffee. The news reported a small plane crash, but something about the image on the screen didn't seem right to him. Jeff knew that a bomber crashed into the Empire State Building in 1945. That seemed more in line with the image he now saw. The size of the jagged scar on the side of the skyscraper seemed out of proportion for the reported light aircraft. Rather than sit at the table with his family, Jeff remained on his feet and watched the images on the screen. The video feed came from an orbiting helicopter. The building's image slowly rotated clockwise while he watched. Alex, their oldest child, was the only other family member who could see the TV without turning around in their chairs. Keiko, Ryan, and Sabrina, their youngest, continued talking unaware of the image. The network news show continued uninterrupted through nine o'clock. The news ticker at the bottom of the screen continued to scroll text while the anchors tried to sound knowledgeable about the incident they were reporting. The truth was that news anchors rarely sounded knowledgeable to Jeff when they went off script. The news ticker told him more than the talking heads. The South Tower began to slip from view behind the burning North Tower as the helicopter continued its orbit. It was like watching a solar eclipse in a time-lapse film. Jeff started to raise his mug for another sip of coffee just before the South Tower slipped completely out of view. A jetliner streaked in from the right side of the television frame toward the towers. 
Jeff didn't see the moment of impact, but he saw the inevitable result. A huge fireball that blossomed out of the opposite side of the almost invisible tower. Whoa! Alex exclaimed upon seeing the explosion. The heads of the others at the table swiveled to look at him. Cool! Jeff's mug slipped from his nerveless fingers. Oh, shit! The coffee mug fell as one would expect. The coffee it held rose above the rim as inertia fought to keep it in place as its container dropped. The mug shattered with a crash, mimicking the explosion Jeff had just witnessed. Keiko and the kids turned to Jeff. He stared at the television in shock. The legs of his pajamas and his slippers were soaked with coffee, and steam rose from both. Jeff didn't notice. The image of both Twin Towers burning captured his whole attention. Keiko followed his gaze and gasped when her mind processed what the image meant. Terrorism. She turned back in time to see the look on her husband's face shift from shock to rage. She had come to the same realization in that moment, and tears fell from her eyes. The tears were for those who had just lost their lives, and for those who would surely die in the minutes and years to come. Keiko was an American of Japanese descent, Jeff a history major with a concentration in military history. They both thought the same thought. This was their generation's Pearl Harbor. With that thought, Jeff remembered a quote from Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, architect and commander of the December 7, 1941 attack. I fear all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. Their children were all under five years old and didn't need to see the horror displayed on every network by that time. Jeff scooped the remote off the table before the kids saw too much and shut the television off. Without looking, he tossed the remote in a negligent arc onto the counter behind him. It landed with a sharp, and the battery cover flew off in a different direction. He walked to the basement door to retrieve the mop and broom behind it. Jeff swept the remains of his dad mug into a dustpan, but hesitated before dumping the porcelain shards in the trash. He stared down at his kid's colorful writing on the pieces, wondering, is this a harbinger of things to come? He prayed it wouldn't be. The United States would soon hurl its military might at whoever did this. Jeff hoped the American people had the stomach for the long fight that was coming. He set the pan aside. He would try to glue the mug back together. Jeff helped Keiko carry the kids from the kitchen to the living room so they wouldn't cut their feet on any small pieces of the mug he overlooked. He'd mop the floor in the kitchen twice to catch anything the broom might have missed. Jeff didn't remember actually mopping the floor. He found himself loading the dishwasher some minutes later, with no recollection of when he started. When Jeff returned to the living room, the kids weren't there, but Keiko was. He heard the kids playing upstairs. Keiko sat on the couch watching a muted television. The video of the second airliner's impact played, again and again slowed to a sickening frame-by-frame -frame replay. Even at that speed, the plane sped across the open space from the edge of the scene, with a fireball erupting behind the already burning North Tower. He stepped around the couch to join Keiko and froze. Tears streaked down her face more than before, her face reflecting abject horror. Jeff shut the television off again, sat down beside her, and gathered her in his strong arms. She turned her face into his chest and cried. He'd never seen her look so out of control, so helpless, not even after her brother Ken was killed. My God, Jeffrey, she whispered. What is happening? Having learned Japanese first while growing up, Keiko's speech pattern was more formal than most people's. We're under attack, Keiko. I know you thought Pearl Harbor at the same time I did. That's exactly what this will be for our generation and our country. I wonder what our nation's response will be. What if they come to Massachusetts? What if they come here? Then I'll make it rain lead, Jeff said in a cold voice, one she'd never heard him use around her or the kids. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him, he quoted. Whoever did this will curse the day they were born if they come here and try to harm my family. I will become that rider, and Hell will seem like a vacation spot. Soft thumping sounds came from outside. They grew louder while Jeff and Keiko listened. Jeff recognized the sounds. They were those of UH-60 Blackhawk helicopters from Moore Army Airfield at nearby Fort Devens. 
He released Keiko, Rose, and peered out the window. As the pair of helicopters passed over the house, a flight of F-15s raced across the sky much lower than he would have expected, moving from east to west. Jeff watched while they curled south. The noise of their engines increased as the exhaust faced the house, then faded again when the jets pulled away. I recognized the sound of Black Hawks before, but what was that, Jeffrey? F. Fittings. He told her while still peering out the window. A flight of four. They're probably out of Otis, not Westover, given their flight path. I'm guessing they came up from the Cape to check Boston's airspace, then the air over Hanscom and Devon's. They're on their way to Worcester now. My parents, Keiko gasped before diving for the phone. Hiro and Mayumi Takahashi were supposed to fly back to Spokane, Washington today to correct an issue with the deed to their former home. His in-law's new home sat about 150 yards from his front door. Keiko jabbed at the buttons on their phone and waited. She grumbled in disgust, hung up, and redialed, and redialed, and redialed again. Disgust turned to frustration, then fear, while Jeff watched. Tears fell from Keiko's eyes again when she was unable to reach her parents. Jeff sat next to her, placing his hands over hers. They weren't supposed to even be in the air yet, Keiko, he reminded her. Their flight wasn't scheduled to lift off until 10. They were probably headed out to the runway and they told everyone to turn off their electronics. We'll give it a minute. Keiko began sobbing again, the worry overwhelming her. Jeff took the phone from her and wrapped her in his arms once more. He rocked her and rubbed her back in an attempt to calm his wife. When her sobs stopped, he carried her up to their bedroom and laid her on the bed. Jeff covered her with a blanket and then closed the door when he left the bedroom. Daddy, is mommy okay? Alex asked in the hallway. Jeff could hear Alex's twin brother Ryan and younger sister Sabrina playing in the boys' bedroom. Come into the guest room for a second, Alex. He closed the bedroom door most of the way and lifted his son onto the bed. At four and a half, Alex weighed less than 50 pounds. Since the boy's last birthday, Jeff often described his oldest's demeanor as four going on 40. So, Alex, what did you see on the television during breakfast? A movie. Saw that explosion. Jeff knew he had to be careful here. Alex, he said gently to his son, that wasn't a movie, that was the morning news. Not a movie? Alex looked confused. No, Alex. That was real? Jeff nodded. Is that why mommy's upset? Alex, what were Sobo and Sofu doing today? Sobo and Sofu? Tears welled up in Alex's eyes. Are they... No, Alex, Jeff said quickly. No. Their flight wasn't supposed to take off until 10 this morning. They wouldn't have been on the runway until well after what we saw happen. Mommy's upset because we haven't been able to talk to them yet. I think their phones are off and they're stuck in their plane right now. Come on downstairs with me and we'll try to call them again, okay? Alex and Jeff headed back to the living room, with Jeff picking up the phone there and redialing his father-in-law. Hello? Jeff heard in English. Hero? Jeff sighed. Thank God. You and Mayumi are safe then? We are. We pushed back from the gate, but we sat on the taxiway for a half hour before they brought us back. The cable feed to the televisions in the terminal is out, and I think cell service here is overwhelmed. This is the first call our knot of travelers has received or been able to make since we deplaned. What's going on? Hero planes, commercial airliners, were flown into both towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. We're under attack. Hero whispered an epithet in Japanese. He continued speaking in English. Yes, we are. We'll try to get our bags back and we'll head home. Don't hang up yet, Hero. There are some people here who want to talk to you. Call us when you get to your house. Jeff handed the phone to Alex. Talk to Sofu while you head upstairs, then hand the phone to Mommy. If she's asleep, wake her up so she can speak to her parents. Alex nodded and ran back to the stairs. Jeff turned the television on again while the time on the cable box changed to 10 o'clock. The image of a smoke-shrouded lower Manhattan greeted Jeff when the set snapped on. The picture changed to a taped scene, one that he never could have imagined. 
video of the collapse of one of the towers. Minutes later, all of the major networks confirmed the news. Jeff noticed the news ticker reporting a plane also struck the Pentagon. Reports of other explosions in Washington were also mentioned. Jeff darted to the front hall closet and pulled a section of the wall away. Moving the piece of drywall revealed a safe, one that held a pistol. His trusty 45 caliber M1911 was in his main gun safe in the bedroom closet, but this safe held a new Sig Sauer 40 caliber semi-auto that was becoming his favorite. Jeff tried to clip the pistol's holster to his belt, only to realize he still wore his pajama pants, so he held the weapon in his left hand. Before returning to the television, Jeff scanned his property, paying special attention to the trees surrounding his yard. With all the windows at ground level in the house, they were vulnerable. Anyone intent on harming them wouldn't care about the scream of an alarm siren, neither would Jeff. He'd just kill them. Jeff's rage returned. Thousands of his countrymen and women, people he swore to protect half a lifetime ago, were dead. He knew that somewhere there were people who were happy with that news. He hoped they would meet an untimely and violent end to match the one they inflicted on his fellow citizens. His knuckles turned white while he gripped the pistol in his left hand. His right hand clenched so hard his knuckles cracked on their own. Jeff gave out an explosive exhalation, which startled himself and took much of his rage with it. He had two families to think about. He needed to stay focused. His family here was safe. He picked up his company's cell phone to check on his work family. Devon's medical defense. This line is recorded. Is this an emergency? Jeff recognized the voice at the other end of the phone. No, Sheila, it's Jeff Knox. Hi, boss. Three hours into her dispatch shift, and Sheila Klausner already sounded exhausted. What's our status? Everyone's in quarters and accounted for right now. Is Tom in the supervisor's office? He'd relieve Tom Stratton as the shift supervisor at seven that evening. Yes, would you like me to transfer you? In a minute, Sheila. Has Tom given you guys any guidance so far after the happenings in New York? A whole bunch of it. Like what? Absolutely no visitors in dispatch except for you or him. No visitors at any of our bases other than known first responder personnel. All non-Army student ride time is canceled until further notice and will be rescheduled. All bases and vehicles are to be locked tight at all times. We've already called our crews to let them know. All meetings scheduled here with outside personnel have also been canceled until further notice. Thank God for good employees, Jeff thought. Perfect, Sheila. I have no changes or additions to those points. Would you transfer me to Tom now, please? Okay, hang on. Jeff heard the company's hold music next. Hi, Jeff, came Tom Stratton's voice moments later. Hi, Tom. Good work with locking things down so far. Thanks, even if it wound up being an overreaction, I figured better safe than sorry, today. Absolutely, is Fort Devens on alert? Yes, with loaded automatic weapons visible at the gates, Tom confirmed. Paramedic 1 was politely but firmly escorted out of Cutler Army Hospital and off the base following a call. Paramedic 4 is currently still on post and allowed to respond with Devon's rescue, but is restricted to the base. Tonight's crew change will be handled at the main gate, within sight of the MPs, unless we're told otherwise. I'm waiting for a call from Colonel Lawton about handling resupply and ongoing access to the base for assigned crews and on-duty supervisors. Not sure how they're going to handle the veterans and personnel who live off post and are headed to Cutler and town ambulances yet. Colonel Curtis Lawton was the commander of the 308th Medical Brigade, their primary army contact, and a big fan of their service. It's a damn good thing they have that fence surrounding the base already up. It's strong enough to stop a semi. P1 reports they saw a crew placing Jersey barriers at the Verbeck gate on their way out. It looks like they're setting up a slalom course to slow any speeding vehicles. No moss growing on the provost or the base engineers, that's for sure. The Jackson Road gate off Route 2 will present a challenge. I wouldn't be surprised if they close that gate and block the off-ramp today. No argument there. Tom, my in-laws were supposed to fly today. Jeff heard Tom inhale sharply. They're safe. 
I've already spoken with Keiko's father. I'll be in early today, but not until Hiro and Mayumi get home. Keiko's pretty shaken. I can't picture your wife shaken. We'll be fine here until your family is taken care of. The alert for a second, incoming call sounded in Jeff's ear. He recognized the number. Tom, it's the paramedic program coordinator for Quinnipoxit College on the other line. Good luck, Tom offered with a mirthless chuckle. Call me back when you can. Thanks, Jeff grumbled back. He ended the call to DMD and picked up the other. This is Jeff Knox. Jeff, it's Sharon Jessup. The nasal tones of QC's paramedic program coordinator grated on his raw nerves. Normally he could handle speaking to her, but today was anything but normal. Hi Sharon, what can I do for you today? Bill Jefferson, Maya Short, and Amy Franklin have all called me within the past half hour to say their ride time for today has been canceled. They said they've been asked to leave your stations and all student ride time is on hold until further notice. What the hell's going on? The rage that had slipped from him returned while Sharon ranted. It had a negative effect on his verbal filters. Well, Sharon, terrorists have stolen at least three commercial airliners this morning, and they have flown them into three separate buildings, likely killing hundreds or thousands of Americans, and God knows how many people from other countries. Knocked down one building, which was 110 stories tall, and have thrown an entire country of 300 million people into a state of near panic. One of those 300 million people happens to be my wife. Her parents were supposed to fly today. Why don't you tell me what the fucking hell's going on? Uh, that's right. You don't know what the fuck is going on any more than I do. So you'll excuse me if I think about the safety of the people I love here at home and the ones I work with at DMD first. I don't even know if my Fort Devons unit will be allowed to stay on post yet or be asked to leave. Your students may be needed at their full-time jobs or in the towns they work for today. Let's pray they're not. Until you hear from me directly, Sharon, no students will ride at DMD until next week at the earliest. If by chance there isn't an invasion going on, we will likely welcome your students back at that time. Notice of a fourth aircraft down is scrolling across my television now. If this isn't the end times, I will speak to you later. Jeff thumbed the phone off. Cell phones robbed one of the ability to slam a receiver down and end a call with emphasis. He turned the TV off again, dropped onto the couch and scrubbed his face with his hands. Jeff leaned back and sighed, allowing his head to drop back. When he opened his eyes, the image of his wife smiling down greeted him. She ran her fingers through his short black hair. I'm used to seeing you upside down when you fling me through the air at the dojo, but this is a little strange, Jeff said in Japanese. As a fourth Dan black belt in karate, Keiko often got the better of Jeff, a second Dan when they sparred. No less strange than you, husband, she replied in the same language, bending down to kiss his forehead. Keiko's brother taught Jeff Japanese when they were roommates in the 82 to Airborne after high school. Ken was killed in action during the Gulf War. You spoke with your parents, I imagine? Yes. Alexander brought me the phone, as you know. Thank you for sending him upstairs. My parents will return to their residence, leave their luggage there, and come here. I'll have to go in early tonight, but I'll wait until they arrive before I get ready to leave. Jeff waved for her to join him on the couch, which she did. Rather than lean back into him, Keiko faced him and pulled herself into a hug. How are you doing, Keiko-chan? Jeff stroked her long black hair. Better, as always, when you do that. What we saw on the television earlier... Is that all that has occurred? No. He offered no elaboration. She asked for none. With whom were you speaking? Someone from work? With whom were you speaking? I think your English teacher is showing. She poked him in the ribs. That was the person who runs one of the programs where our paramedic students come from. She's a little upset Tom Stratton sent three of hers home early today. With everything that is going on today, one would think she would understand in this situation. One would think, yes. I think we can give her a pass on that today, though. I hope things don't get any worse. Jeffrey, why is one of your pistols on the couch? Because it's too heavy to clip to my belt. Another poke. My emotions are all over the place today. I suddenly felt the need to arm myself. You will not be bringing the firearm to work, though, correct? 
You know the Commonwealth's EMS office doesn't allow us to carry weapons on the ambulance. Bringing them onto the base, especially today, would be a bad idea too. Alex asked me why you were upset, Keiko. I tried to tell him as gently as I could. Jeff relayed their conversation. He told me, beloved, you handled the subject perfectly. I do not believe Ryan or Sabrina understood what was on the television earlier, thankfully. We will not need to discuss this with them today, though that day will come. Alexander is reading a book in our room for now. The couple remained on the couch together, finding comfort in each other's arms. The sound of Keiko's soft snores eventually reached his ears. Jeff tried to get his thoughts under control while he held her. The ringing of the home phone startled Keiko from her slumber. Glancing at the Caller ID screen on the cordless phone, she answered the call from her gynecologist's office. From her side of the conversation, Jeff gathered that Keiko's appointment for today had just been canceled. They canceled your appointment? He asked when she hung up. Yes, they have already had others call to cancel this morning, and Donna's sister is believed to have been on one of the planes which crashed in New York. Donna Aitchison ran the office for Dr. Marie Nuno. Jeff hugged Keiko tighter when he heard that news. Part of Jeff wanted to turn the television back on to learn what else had happened. He decided to continue holding Keiko instead. There'd be plenty of time for more bad news later. 11th September 2001, Lancaster, Shirley and Air, Massachusetts. Mayumi and Hiro Takahashi arrived at the Knox house around one in the afternoon, drawing a flood of relieved tears from their daughter. Alex was misty-eyed himself when he hugged his grandparents. Ryan and Sabrina were still unaware of the day's events, which Jeff was thankful for, but he knew that wouldn't last. After three or so hours of visiting with his in-laws, Jeff got ready for work. Jeff drove the DMD SUV through the eerily empty streets of Lancaster. At 4.30 in the afternoon, on a warm, late summer's day, there should have been scores of kids running across the lawns at the schools in town, playing on playgrounds or in the yards of the houses he passed, but they were all empty. No customers lined up outside the ice cream stand on Route 70. Only a few cars shared the road with him. Without them, he'd have thought he was in some post-apocalyptic movie. Operations, you can show Sierra One on the air and available. Jeff called over the radio once on Route 2. Roger, Sierra 1, was the brief response. When dispatch said nothing else, Jeff sighed in relief. No news was good news today. The same, however, could not be said of the news from New York and around the nation. There was plenty of it. After three earlier planes struck the Twin Towers and the Pentagon, a fourth hijacking ended in a passenger uprising. That group of hijackers was stopped before they reached their objective and the plane crashed in a field in Pennsylvania. Everyone on board was killed. Rest easy, ladies and gentlemen, Jeff thought to the brave passengers. Rest easy. There were reports of three additional hijacking attempts in the Soviet Union. From the reports, an apparent coordination problem kept those attempts from starting until well after the ones in the US, and the Soviets were on guard. They placed special interior ministry troops on flights as soon as news of the New York attacks broke. Takeovers on the three flights were thwarted by direct action. Like the US, the USSR ordered a halt to all non-military air travel within their borders after those incidents. Jeff arrived at DMD's headquarters in Shirley less than 20 minutes after leaving his house. He backed his truck into the small garage and closed the overhead door. He swiped his company ID badge through the card reader by one of the doors leading out of the garage. Card access systems and magnetic locks were new and expensive, but on a day like today, he felt they were worth the expense. Once inside, he noticed the closed card reader secured section doors, which compartmentalized the base. Emergency routes out of the building wouldn't require ID cards. Jeff entered the reception area. He was surprised to see everyone still in their offices along the way. Abby, have there been many calls or visitors today? He asked Abby Shearer, the young woman in charge of greeting visitors. Almost none. Go ahead and start packing up then. No sense staying until five exactly today if it's been like that. I'll send everyone else home to their families early with pay, of course. Is everyone accounted for? Abby blinked at him for a few seconds before answering. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. 
No losses among staff at either division. We got lucky today. Let's hope our luck holds, he muttered. Jeff walked back through the admin wing and let everyone know they were free to go home early if they wished. Everybody took him up on his offer. After making sure the front entrance was secure, Jeff made his way to the dispatch office. Jeff's supervisory badge allowed him access to communications. Heads turned when the door's lock snapped open, and he entered. You guys don't have the TV on? Jeff asked in surprise. No, Sheila Klausner answered. It was the same stuff over and over, so we shut it off a few hours ago. Jeff nodded in understanding. Does anybody need anything? Food, coffee, a break from the phones? We were talking about ordering out at lunchtime when we were all here yesterday, Scott Neumeyer said. But with what's been happening today, we ate what we brought for dinner at lunch. I guess we need to start thinking about getting something else for dinner now. All three dispatchers on duty were working 16-hour shifts that day. Jeff was sure none had left their chairs in hours. Chris, why don't you pull out the food protocols binder and see which restaurants are open and for how long. When you decide what you want, order it and we'll send someone to pick it up. DMD's buying today, so splurge if you want to, okay? Food protocols is EMS humor for menus. Thanks, boss. I want you guys, one at a time, to get up and go for a walk. Keep your eyes open if you go outside, but get up from those chairs and move around. If you need me, I'll be in the supervisor's office talking with Tom. Okay, boss, Sheila answered. Jeff nodded and left the room. He knocked on the doorframe of an office down the hall and its occupant looked up. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Tom, how you doing? One hell of a day. The man sighed while he stretched. It's been that, that's for sure. Any new news since I talked with you this morning? Yeah, Colonel Lawson got permission from the new Fort Devens Provost Marshal for us to keep P-4 on the base. They'll be allowed to come and go so we don't have to worry about resupply, and our supervisors will be allowed on the base. We've all been through the background checks to get access to the base, so it's not much of an issue. I wouldn't be surprised if the MPs asked to search our vehicles, though. Me either. I told Sheila, Scott, and Chris to order something for dinner, that we'd pay for it and have it picked up. I also told them to each get up and take a walk. I don't think the three of them have left the dispatch office all day. Wouldn't surprise me if they hadn't, Tom muttered. I dropped the ball when it came to them today, Jeff. I left them to fend for themselves while I ran around checking on things in the field. Tom sounded embarrassed. They would have been fine if they needed something. It's not like they don't know how to figure stuff out. True, Tom admitted. Will you arrange pickup for whatever they order, Tom? I want to head over to the base for shift change and I need to check in with the other crews. Sure, no problem. I'll pick it up myself. Thanks. I'll grab some money out of petty cash to pay for whatever you guys want to order before I leave. Call dispatch and tell them you're ordering something too. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. You all deserve it after a day like today. I'll have to figure out how to say thank you to everyone who worked today. I'll be right back. Jeff left DMD's headquarters five minutes later, headed for the Fort Devon's main gate. He wove around the newly placed Jersey barriers meant to slow vehicles approaching from Ayer's Old West Main Street. The MPs no longer wore their polished helmets and pressed Class B uniforms. This afternoon, they wore full combat gear, complete with flak vests and M4 rifles. An armed Humvee, parked well behind the gate, backed them up. Another MP manned its roof-mounted M60 machine gun. The heavy gate security made Jeff uncomfortable. He preferred being behind the guns, not in front of them, especially when unarmed. Good afternoon, sir, one of the specialists at the gate said. Specialist Krieger, good afternoon. Jeff handed over his base access card. What is the purpose of your visit today, sir? Jeff looked at the young man who cleared him through the gates at Devon's numerous times. The friendly smile he remembered was absent today. I'm headed to the fire station to check on my paramedics. Krieger's partner gave him a thumbs up to say the SUV was clear. He'd just checked the vehicle's undercarriage with a mirror. Krieger handed back Jeff's ID and waved him through the gate without another word. As quiet as the surrounding towns looked on his way to work, Fort Devens looked like an angry ant colony. 
Truckloads of troops and engineering equipment streamed north on MacArthur Avenue while he headed south to the fire station. More trucks could be seen leaving the Vicksburg Square Barracks, heading west. He assumed they carried troops to relieve those reinforcing the other gates. The terrorists have already changed how we live, he thought. Jeff walked into the fire station. He chatted with the Army's firefighters and the DMD medics before P-4's relief began to arrive. With no issues to handle there, Jeff left the base and continued east to DMD's air garage. They'd finally moved into the old fire headquarters on Washington Street in the spring. Jeff chatted with the off-going day shift and greeted the night shift's Jerry Markbright when he wandered out to check his truck. His greeting to Jerry's partner, Claire Wallace, died on Jeff's lips when she entered from the parking lot. Claire? He asked, stepping closer. Claire, what's wrong? My little brother, she sniffed while tears leaked from her eyes. He was on the flight that crashed in Pennsylvania. He called my parents before they tried to take back the plane. Timmy's... Timmy's dead. Jeff gathered Claire in a tight hug and she broke down. The rage Jeff worked so hard at controlling that day returned full force. He didn't see red. His vision blacked out completely. Jeff was lucky Claire was crying in his arms, or she'd have noticed him shaking in anger. One of the offgoing DMD medics saw the look on his face and took a step back. Jeff was able to dial back his emotions after a moment. Claire, you didn't have to come in. Not tonight, he whispered. I had to, Jeff, she said as she stepped back and wiped her eyes. I couldn't spend another minute alone in my apartment. All I've done today is watch the news coverage and speak with my parents in Florida. If you want to be here, you can, but I have to be honest with you, if Jerry doesn't think you're on your game. I understand, boss, she smiled weakly. I have to try, though. I can't let them beat me. If you're sure? Claire nodded. Okay, you'll let me or one of the other supervisors know if you or your family needs anything? I promise. The other DMD paramedics came over to hug Claire one by one. When Jerry and Claire went to check their truck, Jeff walked out to his. The day shifts Joe Ernst walked out of the building with Jeff. I've seen a lot of things in my 16 years on ambulances, Jeff, but I've never seen a look of rage like yours. DMD is family, Joe, and the country is my extended family. Those bastards fucked with both, he whispered with anger in his voice. I told my wife earlier today that I would unleash hell on earth if anyone tried to hurt my family. I meant her and the kids at the time, but these terrorist assholes keep pushing. I'd gut one of them with my bare hands right now. He closed his eyes and blew out a long, slow breath. I'm trying to keep my rage bottled up while I'm working tonight, but I'll find a way to vent it tomorrow after a nap. I'll probably head to the range and unload a few hundred rounds on something. Lead therapy? If it's stupid, but it works, it's not stupid, Joe. That night's shift was routine. Jeff responded into air just before midnight for a rollover at the at Route 2A 110-111 rotary. Claire Wallace crawled inside the upside-down car to calm and comfort the entrapped driver. While the fire department worked to extricate him, the intoxicated 19-year-old repeated over and over in those 20 minutes that he was so sorry and so drunk. The five minutes he'd been alone in the inverted car before someone found him literally scared the piss out of him. <laughs> Claire stayed with the driver when they placed him in the back of Ayer's ambulance. She explained what was going on and kept him from hyperventilating. He was so calm when the police questioned him. He told the investigating officer to keep his license when he handed it over. I won't be needing it for a while, he said. Jeff followed the crew up to Air Community Hospital on the Groton Line. He listened to Claire's report in the ER while he looked around. The normal joking around behind the nurse's desk was missing. That gave his anger another boost. He later found Claire staring into space in the EMS charting area, with her report half-written. She snapped out of her trance and noticed Jeff watching her. She returned his sad smile, sighed, and turned back to her report. Claire will be okay, Jeff thought. I wish I could say the same about myself. Jeff responded to a fire scene in Harvard next. He noticed that everyone seemed to be over-the-top somber. Many also appeared angry, much like he knew he'd been throughout the day. He knew they weren't angry at the others on scene, but at the faceless evil that reached out to their country earlier that day. 
The Harvard fire was Jeff's last call of the night. He caught three hours of much-needed sleep curled up on the couch in his office. He packed up his things and put them in his truck before Tom Stratton returned at 7 the next morning. Jeff leaned against his SUV while he filled Tom in on the night's happenings. Just before 7.30, his cell phone rang. Glancing at the number, he saw it was his best friend from his high school class, Jack Jarrett. He excused himself and answered. Hey, Jack, how's it going? He asked. Jack lived in Prescott, the town northwest of Enfield, Massachusetts, where Jeff grew up. Jeff's smile disappeared when he heard sniffling at the other end of the line. Jack? Jeff, it's Kathy, he heard between sniffles. Kathy Stein Jarrett was Jack's girlfriend while the three of them were at the small private Tompkins school in Enfield. She was now his wife and was due to deliver the Jarrett's first child in October. Kath, what's wrong? Is the baby okay? The baby's fine, Jeff. It's Jack. Twenty minutes later, Jeff pushed down on the accelerator. The growl of the SUV's big V8 engine increased while it accelerated the truck into the hillside curves west of Leominster and Fitchburg. The well-tuned engine sped the marked DMD vehicle westbound down Route 2, back to the valley where he grew up. The Swift River Valley occupied a mythical and magical place in Jeff's memory. He loved growing up there. He found comfort there when he returned home from the army. Most of his family still lived in and around the valley. In fact, he was one of only a handful from his generation who didn't live there. If he and Keiko could commute to Shirley from Enfield in a reasonable amount of time, they'd have built their house there. Jeff reached the two-lane section of Route 2 in Templeton just over 30 minutes after he left DMD's Shirley headquarters. He fought not to turn his red emergency lights on when the car in front of him forced him to slow to the posted speed limit of 55 miles an hour. The SUV's tires squealed when he sped into the exit for US Route 202 at close to 40. Prescott, Massachusetts was still a popular place to live for physicians working at Greenwich Valley Medical Center in neighboring Greenwich. Jack Jarrett bought and renovated his house after moving back from his residency in Dallas. Jeff knew from previous visits the Jarretts enjoyed fabulous sunrise views from their back deck. Kathy Stein Jarrett opened the front door of the huge 1940s home on Prescott Ridge when Jeff pulled into the driveway. When he approached, her puffy and red-rimmed eyes told Jeff she'd been crying. She began sobbing again when her longtime friend hugged her. Jeff guided Kathy into her foyer and closed the door behind him, rubbing her back to help calm her. Is he still out there? Jeff asked. Kathy nodded while wiping her tears away. I think I know how to handle this. Do you have any coffee made? Coffee? She asked, confused at the non sequitur. Yeah, I made a new pot about a half hour ago. Why? Jack Jarrett stared out over the Swift River Valley, though he didn't see the vista spread out before him. Holding a framed picture in his hands, he replayed scenes from his childhood in his head. Jack rose from a restless sleep before the sunrise and made his way to his deck. After hours of trying to gather his thoughts, they were no more organized than they'd been at 4.30 that morning. His concentration broke when his nose detected a familiar odor. He nearly jumped out of his chair when he noticed someone sitting in a chair next to him. Pretty day, Jeff commented while taking a sip of his coffee. He gazed east with his feet perched on the Jarrett's deck railing. The sun was out and the trees in the valley waved gently in the mid-September breeze. How did you get here? Same way you did, Jack. You see when a man and woman fall in love? Asshole. Takes one to know one, buddy. Jeff looked down at the picture frame Jack held. Kathy told me, Jack. I can't tell you how sorry I am. Jack looked down at the photo in his hands, finally seeing it for the first time in hours. Two young boys smiled up at him from the picture. Both wore baseball uniforms, the older boy with his arm around the younger's shoulders. A teardrop splashed when it landed on the glass. This was the last sports team Tom and I were on together, Jack said in a thick voice. My bicycle accident was a month later, just after the end of the Little League season in Williamstown. A car hit Jack while he rode his bike at age eight. The resulting injuries ended his playing competitive sports and hindered his walking until a corrective operation a dozen years later. 
Jeff heard the wood framing the picture creak when Jack's hands tightened around it. They killed my big brother, Jeff, Jack whispered. They killed Tom. I'm so mad right now, I want to break everything I can get my hands on. They say thousands are missing, but the terrorists just dropped a couple of 110-story buildings on them. I'm a goddamn doctor. I know what that kind of force will do to a body. At best, they're going to scrape Tom off a slab of concrete with a damn spatula. Our family, his wife and kids, will get a weighted box back, not my brother. Tears rolled down Jack's face while he stared out at the view that convinced him to buy this house. Jeff had no answer for his friend, no platitudes that would ease the pain Jack felt. Rather than say the wrong thing, he said nothing. He sat in silence, holding his coffee mug while the liquid it contained grew cold. The mugful Jeff drank on the ride to Prescott roiled in the pit that was his stomach. Adding cold coffee to it would only make things worse. He put the mug aside. Jack lurched from his chair, springing for the deck's railing. Jeff snatched the photo Jack held from his hand, afraid his friend would throw it and only add to his pain. Jack gripped the railing, tipped his head back and let loose with a cry of pure anguish. Nearby birds scattered. He gulped air and screamed again. His screams echoed off the hillside. A third scream followed. Jack collapsed to the deck, sobbing. Jeff knelt next to Jack and put an arm around him. When Jeff glanced over his shoulder, he saw Kathy standing in the doorway with tears streaming down her face, her pain mirroring her husband's. Jeff beckoned her over and had her join the hug. The three old friends shared their common grief. Jeff's rage erupted anew. He imagined similar painful scenes repeated a thousandfold across the nation. An old calling surfaced, but Jeff pushed it back, not yet ready for that idea. He helped Jack and Kathy up and into their chairs on the deck. Jeff staggered back to the railing while his friends sobbed together. His knuckles blanched as his grip tightened on the oak rail. Tom Jarrett, Jack's older brother, was the first friend Jeff met at Tompkins School, where he started high school in 1983. He and Tom both played soccer and met during the preseason practices the week before school. Jeff, Jack, and Kathy graduated in the class of 1987, Tom the year before. They'd all been friends since they met. Jeff gulped the mid-morning air and tried to get his emotions under control. Jeff almost drove through the garage door at DMD's headquarters when Kathy told him about Tom, wanting to reach his friends as fast as he could. He held a terse conversation with Keiko during his speed run west, telling her only that there was a problem with Jack and he was headed to Prescott. Jeff wished he could return to the simple days of the mid-80s when he was in high school with his friends. Everything seemed so easy then. Go to school, do the homework, work a part-time job, hang out with your friends. Now life seemed so much more difficult, so much less black and white. He knew he had it easier than many people, but he also knew that nothing worth having was ever truly easy. Jeff, Jack called, startling Jeff out of his daydreams. Jeff turned to see his friend standing behind him. Thanks for driving out here, man, Jack whispered while they hugged. What the hell happened, Jack? Why was Tom even in the building yesterday? He, he started a new job Monday at an equity firm on the 89th floor of the South Tower. Nick got him to leave his old firm. Tom said it would give him more room to advance. Nick? Nick who? And Sonia. Nick and some other traders from his old firm started this new one last year. Nick knew of Tom's growing reputation on the street and recruited him. Nick was in the tower yesterday, too. Nick Ansonia was another of Jeff and Tom's soccer teammates at Tompkins. He graduated in 1985. Jeff scrubbed his hands across his face and turned back to the deck rail, taking another deep breath. He didn't want Jack or Kathy to see the look on his face before he was able to compose himself. Nick hadn't been one of their close circle in high school, but he'd been a friend nonetheless, even if they hadn't spoken in close to 10 years. Jeff calmed himself and turned back around. Uh what about Lise and the girls, Jeff asked. Are they okay? They're safe, Kathy assured him. They were at the girls' school in Westchester when the attacks began. I'm sure between you and your families they'll be okay, Jack, but let me know if I can help. Lisa Jarrett was a nurse and a super cool lady. Her daughters were spitting images of her 
and would have given Tom chest pains while they grew up. Now, at ages seven and eight, they would have to come to grips with a world gone crazy, one that their dad wouldn't be there to help them navigate. She'll have a job in a heartbeat if they move up here to be near us, Jack said. Lisa's experience at that hospital in NYC before she changed jobs would convince most headhunters. She and the girls are true New Yorkers, though. I can't see them moving to enemy territory. The Jarrett ladies were Yankees fans through and through, while Tom had held true to his love of the Red Sox. Your family has a lot to figure out, Jack, Jeff sighed. I'll leave you two alone and do some visiting out here before I head home. You know you're always welcome here, Jeff. You worked last night. Do you need a nap before you head home? I'll be fine, thanks, though. Jeff said his goodbyes before driving down the long, raised finger of land that made up the Prescott Ridge. Joe Knox was happy to see his son when he walked into Valley Automotive, Joe's repair shop at the base of the ridge. Jeff declined an offer of breakfast at their favorite diner, the Enfield Lunch Car, not trusting his ability to keep anything down. He left after an hour's visit, saying he needed to stop and see his mother before heading back to Lancaster. Jeff made a long detour through the center of Enfield. He and his family made regular visits to his parents' house, the same one he grew up in, but he rarely made it to the center on those visits. Parking in front of Swift River Valley Community College on Main Street, he gazed across the street at Bilzerian's hardware. There he sat for five minutes, while he remembered the good times he had working there and living in the apartment above the store. He frowned when he recalled the firebombing of his truck that drove him from his home in 1993. Still wearing his DMD supervisor's uniform, Jeff strode into the main office of Tompkins School on Hardwick Road. There, he said hello to the people he knew, signed in as a visitor, and walked down to his mother's classroom. Seeing the 1930s wood paneling on the walls and catching the faint scent of the lemon oil used to keep it conditioned brought back more fond memories. The students in the halls between classes looked at him like he was an alien. He knocked on the open door of a classroom on the first floor. Jeff! Marisa Knox cried, rushing over to hug her son. During the hug, Jeff looked around her room. The basic layout of the classroom hadn't changed in the almost 30 years she'd taught here. Only the math-themed posters changed often during that time. This would be his mother's 30th and last year as Tompkins' sixth grade math teacher. Man. Jeff, what are you doing here? I thought you worked last night. I did, Mom, but I had to come out and see Jack Jarrett after Kathy called. Is everything okay? No, he sighed. Tom Jarrett was on the 89th floor of the South Tower when it fell yesterday. Marissa gasped in shock and horror, covering her mouth. She'd been Tom's math teacher when he started sixth grade at Tompkins in 1979. The Jarrett boys were frequent visitors to the house on Westware Road during Jeff's time at the school. She tried to give Jeff's friends, who were boarding students, a sense of a welcoming home outside of a bland dorm room. Both boys still sent her Christmas cards every year. Jack and Kathy still visited the elder Knoxes often. No, she whispered. Jeff nodded his head. He started a new job there on Monday, working with Nick and Sonia. Marisa turned from her son with tears in her eyes. Nick was also one of her former students, though they weren't as close as she and the Jarretts were. She stood by her classroom's windows, looking out over the quad between the school's buildings while she composed herself. The students of her next class started to arrive and stared at the stranger with Mrs. Knox, wondering why she looked like she was crying. I'm sorry, Mom, he said, hugging her and kissing the top of her head. Do you need to arrange for a sub or something? I can't let this stop me, Marissa said, shaking her head emphatically as she turned back to Jeff. I doubt much math will get taught this period, however. Now it was Marissa's turn to sigh. I'll be okay, Jeff. Call the house tonight. I'm going to need to talk to my grandchildren after this. Marisa always felt better after talking to the boys and Sabrina. Jeff nodded, rubbing her back before he departed. While he stepped out of the room, he heard his mother address her students. Class, today I'd like to tell you about two special young men. 14th of September, 2001, Canal Street, Shirley, Massachusetts. Jeff stood in the Devons Medical Defense Communications Center, sipping his coffee and shaking his head. 
CNN replayed a tape of a Soviet television broadcast from Wednesday, which featured a speech by the Soviet General Secretary, Yevgeny Vavilov. In that speech, he railed against the acts of barbarity committed on Tuesday. He called on the United States and its allies to join with the Warsaw Pact in their stand against terrorism. Vavilov recalled their great alliance during the Great Patriotic War, World War II, and declared their ideological differences mattered little at times like these. Reports of a West German Bundesmarine destroyer, FGS Lutyens, rendering honors to USS Winston S. Churchill and USS Gonzalez, made the rounds of the news services as well. During the NATO vessel's approach, the Americans reportedly noted, she flew an American flag alongside her West German flag as her crew manned the rails in their dress uniforms. The West German sailors on the bridge wing held a large banner declaring in English, we stand by you. The American captains called their own crews to the rails in gratitude. Reports of American sailors in tears while returning the salute also circulated. American tourists at Buckingham Palace crying while a British military band played the Star Spangled Banner during the changing of the guard was no rumor. DMD's defensive posture relaxed bit by bit as the days passed. The section doors inside the building were unlocked that morning. The satellite bases would continue to be locked down for some time, as would the front doors of DMD's headquarters. The troops at the gates of Fort Devens weren't as numerous, though the crew served automatic weapons were still there. Hardware and flag stores couldn't keep up with demands for flag sets after crews at the World Trade Center raised an American flag found in the rubble. Nearly every house he passed in the past two days now flew one. Jeff was glad he installed a flagpole in front of the house in Lancaster when they built it. Otherwise, he'd be waiting months to install one. DMD's truck lettering contractor was out in the garage, applying reflective flags to the sides and rear of his truck, the supervisor's SUV and paramedic three. The other intercept vehicles would rotate through to have theirs applied later. There hadn't yet been any reports of retaliatory strikes by American forces in distant parts of the globe, though it was only a matter of time. Jeff hoped they'd deliver a knockout blow and not a message to whoever was responsible. He knew there wasn't a simple answer to the question of why the attacks occurred. If it was Islamic terrorism, as the press speculated, he wondered how much was culture clash and how much was 60 years of foreign policy decisions which upset the people who attacked them. Jeff walked out to his vehicle once he heard it was ready. The new flags looked great and not at all out of place in the original lettering design of the SUV. Jeff stopped at his favorite coffee shop in Shirley before turning east. The specialist checking IDs at the Fort Devons gate was polite, less terse than the guards had been on the 11th. Jeff figured the MPs would never return to the Class B uniforms and polished helmets. Now that the military was shifting to a war footing, the M60 machine gun tracking him still unnerved him. He made his way to the Provost Marshal's building. There was another armed Humvee stationed at the entrance to the parking lot there. The MPs directed him where to park after they rechecked his ID against a list of appointments. Jeff showed that ID again once inside the building and an MP escorted him to the provost's office. Lieutenant Colonel Gabriella Nava was a scant 14 days into her assignment to Fort Devons when the sun rose today. The three days she'd been on duty since the attacks, each seemed longer to her than the previous 10 combined. Rising from her desk to welcome her visitor took every bit of effort she could muster. Still, she put a smile on her face and extended her hand in greeting. Gabriella Nava, she said while shaking Jeff's hand. Jeff Knox, ma'am. Thank you for coming, Mr. Knox. My company has a vested interest in keeping your office happy, Colonel. He smiled. It's good to finally meet you. I've heard much from Colonel Lawton about you and your company since my arrival. All lies knowing the good Colonel. Jeff smiled again. We've developed a good rapport over the last year, particularly with the medics under his command. I'm hoping we can develop a similar rapport, Gabby Nava said, smiling despite her fatigue. I don't see why we wouldn't, Colonel. I like to think I'm not unreasonable. I'd have understood if you told us to get off the base after Tuesday. I wouldn't have taken it personally. 
If your employees hadn't undergone the background checks they did, I might have had to. She sighed. A week ago, I agreed with those who thought General Barrett was a crackpot. Now I firmly believe he was a man ahead of his time. Major General Marshall Barrett was the commanding officer of Fort Devens in 1993 when terrorists attacked the World Trade Center, attempting to topple one of the towers with a bomb in an underground parking garage. The general convinced Guilford Rail Systems to close an old branch line running along the fort's eastern edge. He also successfully lobbied to have West Main Street in Ayer rerouted alongside the MBTA commuter rail line between Ayer and neighboring Shirley. Those closures and other improvements left Devons as the only military installation in the continental United States with a full secure perimeter fence before the September 11th attacks. What do you need us at DMD to do, Colonel? Call me Gabby or Gabriella, first of all, Jeff. For now, I'm going to ask that your people be patient with us, Jeff, especially once my office issues new access protocols. Our ID requirements will become stricter after this, and I'm anticipating visitors from other bases will soon start arriving to study our security arrangements. You'll be giving lots of tours in the future, I imagine. Swell, Gabby griped. She changed the subject in her demeanor when she asked, I see you're a veteran? She waved at the jump wings Jeff pinned to his uniform shirt every morning. Airborne all the way, ma'am. I served four years as a paratrooper between 1987 and 1991. I was with the 82 d Airborne's 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment. I'm guessing you were in Panama from the mustard stain on your jump wings. Mustard stain is army slang for the combat jump star on the risers of Jeff's silver paratrooper wings. Yes, as well as the Persian Gulf. My roommate and best friend from the 504th introduced me to his little sister the summer before Panama, too. Keiko's now my wife. That was the best part of my time working for Uncle Sugar, as far as I'm concerned. And your brother-in-law? Does he visit much? A shadow crossed Jeff's face. The other way around, I'm afraid, Gabby. Ken is buried in Lancaster, about a mile from our house. Keiko's parents moved his body here from Spokane, Washington, when they moved to be closer to Keiko and our children. I'm sorry, Jeff, Gabby offered with an apologetic look. I didn't mean to stir bad memories. You didn't, Gabby. Ken's always at the back of my mind, even ten years after his death. He was killed in action at the end of the Gulf War. My twin sons each have one of his names as their middle names, and I have his name tattooed on my right arm. He won't be forgotten in our household anytime soon. May I see your tribute to your friend? Jeff pulled his sleeve up to reveal the gold memorial star above the kanji of Ken's name. What do the characters say, Jeff? That's Ken's full name in Japanese, which he also taught me to speak. Kenji Isoroku Takahashi. My sons are named Alexander Kenji and Ryan Isoroku. After a long silence, Gabby asked if Jeff could drive her around the base while they continued their talk. When he agreed, she buckled on a pistol belt and retrieved a 9mm Beretta M9 pistol from a safe. I hope you don't mind me being armed, she asked. I'd have brought my M4 to work Tuesday if I could have gotten away with it. I didn't think that would go over well, though. Our state EMS office doesn't allow us to be armed in any fashion. Plus, your folks at the gate were wound tight enough as it was. If our state's EMS office has a problem with someone from the Army being strapped while they're riding in my truck on post, they can take a flying leap. This is federal property, not state. You have an M4? Gabby asked while they walked down the hall and out to his SUV. Well, the civilian version. Seems the ATF frowns on civilians having fully automatic weapons, he grinned. I've also got an M1911, a SIG-40, a Remington 12-gauge pump shotgun, and a civilian AR-15A2. Gabby raised an eyebrow. I like to shoot, he shrugged in response. What does your wife think? That we don't go to the range together enough, he answered while they climbed into his vehicle. Keiko's a damn good shot herself, but I usually score higher than her when we compete. She gets to take out her frustrations on the mat at the dojo so it works out. Dojo? Keiko's a fourth Dan black belt in karate and working toward her fifth. I'm a second Dan who's lazily inching toward his third. We teach part-time at a dojo in Clinton twice a week and spar together in our gym at home. What does she do? 
teaches English at the high school outside the hospital road gate. Plans are already in the works to extend our fence around the plot Shirley's police station and the regional high school are on, since that's technically army property. Jeff raised an eyebrow. That's going to create quite the traffic jam if there will be ID checks during drop-off. We'll probably only check the IDs of people who want to park their cars, staff like your wife or students who drive themselves, and restrict others to dropping off only. We're still toying with ideas. Actually, the place that will see the most change is the new hospital. How so? I'm going to suggest a remote drop-off and parking area for civilian vehicles. It'll be a challenge to balance access for veterans and army civilians who live off post arriving by ambulance with security for the base. There will probably be an internal checkpoint while people make their way in from those parking areas. Access to the ER for civilian ambulances will be another challenge. You and your staff have already put in a great deal of thought on this. Gabby shrugged. That's why they pay us the big bucks. The pair continued to chat while Jeff drove them around the base's perimeter. Gabby nodded in satisfaction when she noticed her troops taking their jobs seriously. They were trained well and enjoyed good leadership from her subordinates. Do you mind a few trips up and down Route 2 while I look at the fence line from the highway? Not at all. From where to where? Route 110 out to Shirley Road and back a few times? Sure. Do we need to drop your weapon off again? No, I received special dispensation from Massachusetts yesterday as the provost marshal so I can check the areas adjacent to the base. The usual posse comitatus restrictions apply unless someone or something is directly threatening the base. Jeff rode the breakdown lane with his four-way hazard lights on while Gabby made notes. She said she was all set after their third round trip. She offered to buy him lunch on post since wearing her weapon in a civilian restaurant would be frowned upon. How are your employees reacting to the events of Tuesday, Jeff? Gabby asked before spearing some of her Caesar salad. They're pissed, he stated. One of our medics lost her younger brother on the Pennsylvania plane. Two of our supervisors and their families are stuck up in Gander, Newfoundland, until the FAA reopens the skies. Whoever these assholes were, they messed with two families, the U.S. and the DMD. Jeff took a bite of his burger. And you? What about their boss? If life were a movie, Jeff's eyes would have glowed an evil red while his face twisted into a snarl. All Gabby saw was the snarl. You know the Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii? You know how close to the surface the magma it spews is? That's how I feel, Gabby. I almost crushed my sig while I watched the attacks on Tuesday. I wanted to kill someone when I learned about my employee's brother. Wednesday morning I learned that my best friend from high school lost his brother when the South Tower fell. I wanted to glass the entire Middle East with a swarm of nukes at that point. There's a river of loathing flowing through me right now, it's building, and I hate that. Jeff took a deep breath and pushed the anger away. What about your people? The same. None of the people who work directly for me were affected, but there are a few in my other units who were. We've already sent them over to Hanscom so they can catch military flights back home to be with their families. I wonder how much longer it will be before we hear about warheads dropping on foreheads. My personal guess would be not long. Unfortunately, I'm sure it also won't be long before we have troops on the ground. This won't be a quick intervention. Not hardly. They finished lunch in silence. Just before lunch the following Monday, Jeff tried calling the CEO of Neptune's Forge once again. Neptune's Forge, the Glendale, Arizona-based company, which developed a water-fueled home fusion power plant during the late 1990s, derived their technology from the 1920s water purification technology, which saved Jeff's home valley from becoming the site of a 40-square-mile, 400-billion-gallon reservoir. Dr. Sacha Cohen, the company's CEO, had been one of Marissa Knox's first math students in 1972, in addition to being the inventor of the company's technology. Sasha Cohen, came the brusque answer from the other end of the phone. You're a very difficult woman to get a hold of. I've been known to play hard to get, yes. Jeff could hear some of the stress leave Sasha's voice when she replied. How are you doing out there? We were lucky on Tuesday. Nobody lost any family, though some of our friends outside the company did. 
You're secure, though. My new security chief is mad enough to, I don't know, pick one. Chew nails, breathe fire, something like that. He started on the 10th, a retired Marine Master Gunnery Sergeant. He keeps talking about mounting a Maduce at the gate. I haven't asked what that is yet. That's an M2. It's a 50 caliber heavy machine gun, Satcha. Incredible stopping power with that half-inch wide rounds. Scientists modeled the X-1, the first airplane to break the sound barrier. After that round, since they knew it went supersonic when fired. Figures you'd know that, you history geek. As opposed to the actual geek, the one with a PhD I'm talking to. Yeah. Jeff heard the stress creeping back in. What's going on, Sasha? She blew out a breath. The crackpots have really stepped it up since the attacks out there. The threats are becoming nastier, more vitriolic. I don't necessarily agree with all the arguments the Second Amendment folks make, but I'm at the point where I'm going to explicitly announce our employees may bring weapons onto plant grounds. I've already discussed armed security with Nate Hansen, our new security director. That's a big step, Sasha. Our people are our most important resource, Jeff. You and I had that discussion when you came out here last year. I believe Nate called the security gate from the employee lot a choke point which would leave our people sitting ducks. We're probably going to expand our plant in a few months, and we'll have to expand that parking lot at the same time. Those two things, along with the security upgrades, are going to cut into your profit sharing this year. So I'll only see four million in dividends this year, not five, Jeff joked. Sasha, I haven't finished my MBA, but I understand it takes money to make money sometimes. There are more zeros listed in my bank accounts than I ever would have dreamed. Thanks to you. I'd rather see you safe, first. I am so glad you're our top investor, Jeff. Sasha sighed. I'm glad it's not all about the bottom line with you. Whoa, 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 lady. I'm gonna be pissed if my next dividend check has less than a seven-digit number on it. I hope you're not taking those jokes on the stand-up circuit or anything. Jeff found himself clenching and unclenching his fists more and more during the following week and a half. The muscles of his forearms began to spasm from the strain. He was sure he would crack a molar if he ground his teeth any harder. His jaw started aching after biting back angry statements during the two weeks following the attack. Part of Jeff wanted to unload on somebody, anybody. Keiko's support was one of the precious few things keeping him on an even keel though he repaid her with biting comments over the past few days. Jeff and Keiko were in Williamstown, Massachusetts on the 22nd for Tom Jarrett's memorial service. The Jarrett's, while hoping for some sort of miracle, were realists. The crush of 21 floors of concrete and steel smashing down on top of you, followed by the impact of falling 80 whatever stories, didn't seem survivable. Tom's father, Bill, and brother Jack were stone-faced during the service and the receiving line that followed. The women of the family cried openly, watching the Jarrett family's grief threaten to make Jeff's rage boil over again. Yep. One good thing about the service, if it could be called good, was the support the Jarretts received from the Tompkins community. The men who played soccer and baseball with Tom still living within driving distance of Williamstown turned out. This year's soccer team made the trip too, of Jeff and Jack's group of friends from high school only Allison Newberry, one of Jeff's former girlfriends, and her family hadn't been able to come to the service. She was a senior astrophysicist at the Mauna Kai Observatory in Hawaii, and the airlines were still trying to straighten their flight schedules out. It is good to see so many people here for Jack's family, Jeffrey, Keiko whispered to him in Japanese, though I wish it had not been necessary. You're right on both counts, Keiko, Jeff replied in the same language. He and Keiko were teaching their children to speak Japanese as well. Ashley and Kira need to know their father was well-respected and is well-remembered. I cannot fathom my father not having been present for all of the important milestones in my life, she said with a shudder. Jeff didn't want to think of Sabrina being in a similar position either. Did I hear Lisa and the girls will move to Williamstown? It's still a toss-up between Williamstown and Prescott, from what I understand. With Kathy due to deliver in a month or so, my money's on Williamstown. Kathy and Jack have the space, but I think Lise will opt to have Tom's parents close to the girls since her parents passed a few years back. She wants to start over, away from New York, 
in any event. And you, husband? How are you? You still seem tense. I am, Keiko, he sighed. The world wasn't perfect before the 11th, but it was at least predictable in a sense. Now, now it's apparent there are too many avenues of approach for threats to use. The Soviets are a known, identifiable enemy, or they were. Vavilov's speech last week clouded that too. This new threat is too nebulous, though bombing the shit out of Afghanistan seems like a good start to me. And the latest theory on why we were attacked? Pisses me off even more. Fine, they don't like us over there, but when we develop a way to extricate ourselves from our dependence on foreign oil, they get upset too. Keiko excused herself so she could freshen up. Jeff told her he'd be outside. He nodded to the others on the patio but kept walking, trying to find a quiet spot for himself. He ducked around a small tree, which blocked part of the patio, and found an area. Lisa Jarrett looked up when he stepped into the semi-private space. I'm sorry, Lisa. I didn't realize you had already claimed this spot. Jeff turned to leave and give her back her privacy. No, Jeff, she sniffed. It's okay. I just needed a moment. Jeff stopped, shifting his weight from foot to foot, uncertain of whether to stay or go. Here, sit. Jeff sat in the offered chair but said nothing while they both gazed out over the Berkshires separating Massachusetts from New York State. We love coming here to visit Bill and Jessica, almost as much as we love visiting Kathy and Jack and Prescott, Lee sighed while wiping the tears from her eyes. We were about to move to the Prescott area before Tom heard from Nick. He wanted to give New York one more chance. Jeff nodded, but held his tongue to let Lisa talk at her own pace. Tom and I met when he cut his hand moving into his apartment. He came into the New York ER where I was working at the time and it was love at first sight. I always believed in it, but didn't think I'd ever experience it. Jeff nodded again. Keiko and I are the same way. We've loved each other since we met in 1989. Lisa nodded in return. I grew up in Westchester. When we learned I was pregnant with Ashley, we decided we wanted to move out of the city and back to Westchester. We both were willing to accept the commute to give our daughters the chance to have space to run around. Mom and Dad still lived in Valhalla and watched the girls for us until their car accident. I left my job in the city to care for them until they passed. Once they did, I started working at the hospital in Valhalla to be near the girls' school during the day, and so we could keep them in the same school district. Tom was growing tired of the commute by the time Nick contacted him this summer. He wanted to give the city one more shot, especially for the chance to work with a friend from Tompkins. Lisa smiled at Jeff. Oh, the stories he used to tell me about all you guys. The first time I met you and Keiko at Jack's place, Tom went on and on about you for hours after you left. He thought you walked on water after you befriended Jack, immediately your freshman year. Add in how you bagged the hottest girl in school your sophomore year, kept her happy and didn't turn into a jerk, and I started to think you were the second coming. Jeff shook his head, smiling while looking at the bricks under his feet. I'm not perfect as Keiko will happily tell you, Lisa, especially after the past two weeks. I'm sure Tom told you how I'd been treated in middle school. I just made sure I didn't act that way in high school, nor did I allow others to treat people like that. Still, Jeff, Tompkins and that area have become magical places in my mind over the past two years. Did you know Tom and I would visit the school whenever we were in Prescott? He had such good memories of that time and Tompkins always felt so welcoming when we were there. I'll be looking to sell mom and dad's house in Valhalla and move to Prescott with the girls. Jeff raised an eyebrow. They'll be Tompkins students by the beginning of October. They tell me they'll miss their friends, but our house has too many painful memories which outweigh the good ones for them now. They still expect to see grandma and grandpa when they come home from school, and now they expect their daddy to be there too. The girls will move in with Kathy and Jack for now. I'll find a house nearby and move as soon as I can. Jack tells me he's got some pull at a hospital near them also. Jeff smiled sadly at his friend's sister-in-law. It's okay, Keiko, Lisa said, beckoning Keiko from behind the small tree. You're not interrupting anything. Jeff rose to hug his wife. How long have you been standing there? Since you two were talking about love at first sight. 
She smiled at him before giving him a soft kiss. She promptly stole his seat. Lisa, you will have whatever help you need from us. Hours later, Keiko dozed in the passenger seat while Jeff drove them home to Lancaster. He took the time to replay the past two weeks over in his mind, trying to sort through his feelings. He blew out a long breath when he reached a decision about something growing in the back of his mind since that awful day. Two nights later, Jeff helped Keiko put the kids to bed at 7.30 before grabbing a beer from their fridge. He now sat on his back patio enjoying the early fall weather. That beer currently sweated condensation onto the leg of his shorts. He'd been so lost in thought he hadn't moved the bottle in close to 10 minutes. A familiar fragrance reached his nose when Keiko wrapped him in a hug from behind. He put his free hand on her arms and squeezed in response. She came around the chair and sat in his lap after putting his beer on the table. My husband, she whispered in Japanese, what is the matter? He didn't respond but gazed off to the west in the dying sunset. Jeffrey, please, you are troubled. What is wrong, my beloved? Jeff looked at his wife with pain visible behind his attempt to smile. You know I love you and the kids, right, Keiko? What? Of course, Jeffrey, there is no doubt in my mind. She cupped his face in her hands. Please, tell me what is wrong. Jeff looked away again. Keiko stroked his cheek. Whatever it is, Jeffrey, we will get through it. Since the attacks, there's been a rage burning inside me, Keiko. I know you saw it that morning. It gets worse every time I learn that someone I know lost someone in those attacks. By the time I learned about Tom and Nick, it blinded me when it spiked. You and the kids have been getting the brunt of what I can't control, and I'm sorry. Thankfully, it's starting to burn itself out. There's been another feeling building inside me too, one that's not fading. It's a feeling I haven't felt since high school, and it's what eventually led me to you. Jeff caressed Keiko's cheek. It also led me into the Army Recruiting Center in Ayer today. Keiko's eyes widened in shock and surprise, then softened in sorrow and resignation. This will defend, she whispered. Jeff nodded. She smiled bravely and put her hand back on his cheek. I know those are more than just words on the army flag to you, Jeffrey. I believe part of me has been expecting this, even if I did not consciously know I was. You feel this is what you need to do. The last sentence was a statement, not a question. Keiko knew her husband. 25 of September, 2001. Broadway, Malden, Massachusetts. The next morning, Jeff waited for both the general manager and the owner of the Brophy Ambulance Group to arrive at the company's office in Malden. Hey, Jeff, Sean Brophy exclaimed while shaking his friend's hand. Sean, the general manager, held a long-standing reputation for arriving early and working until five in the afternoon. Sean's father and Brophy's owner, Seamus, shook Jeff's hand after his son. Sorry to drag you out of bed this early, Seamus. For you? Any time, Jeff, plus you said it was important. Step into my son's office. Seamus waved Jeff into the familiar space. Jeff worked with Sean for close to two years during the mid-1990s as one of the younger man's first partners in EMS. Jeff figured out that his friend was, in fact, the owner's son, but hadn't told a soul. That was just one considerate act that earned him a friend for life in Sean. Each was best man at the other's wedding. Seamus, also a staunch supporter of Jeff's, wheeled his desk chair into Sean's office. He closed the door, then he sat. They indulged in 10 minutes of small talk before coming to the point. So, Jeff, what can we do for you? Sean asked before sipping from his mug of coffee. Jeff took a deep breath and blew it back out. I need to ask for a leave of absence, Sean. Seamus sat up straight. Is everything okay, Jeff? Depends on your point of view, Seamus. The attacks two weeks ago have been bothering me, especially after having to go to a friend's memorial service this weekend. I'm sorry, Jeff, we didn't know, Sean said. Were you close with this person? I'm His brother and I were best friends during high school. Sean, you've met my friend Jack. His big brother Tom was killed in the attack on New York. I hadn't heard anything, Jeff. I've been trying not to let his death affect me at work 
but I've been snapping at Keiko and the kids at home. It's reached the point where I need to do something. I've finally figured out what that something is. Sean and Seamus looked at each other. What's that, Jeff? Seamus asked. I'm re-enlisting, Jeff answered. The ensuing silence stretched. Sean recovered first. What? Why? It's something I need to do, Sean. I have to go back. Why, Jeff? You're 32, married, and have three kids. What about your family? Why would you want to risk your life like that? I, Jeffrey Andrew Knox, do solemnly swear that I will support. Seamus' memories of joining the Marines came rushing back, and he recited the oath of enlistment with Jeff and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me, God. What are you two blathering about? That was our oath of enlistment, Jeff replied. You took that oath almost 15 years ago, Jeff. When you were 18, you've done your bit for your country. Actually, I was 17 when I enlisted. Sean stood up abruptly, causing his chair to shoot backward and crash into the wall behind him. Who gives a shit? Jeff's friend raged. You're giving up everything! And for what? Something better than what's looming on the horizon. Jeff responded in a quiet voice which contrasted with Sean's. A world where people don't worry about airplanes flying into the buildings where they work. One where I don't worry about my sons and I being killed by fanatics before my wife and daughter are made into slaves. Or worse. I'm going all in, Sean. Sean glared at his former partner before storming out of his own office. The door's handle punched through the drywall and stuck there, despite the bumper put on the wall to prevent such an occurrence. Jeff watched in sorrow as his friend left. Seamus was angry at his son's outburst. Don't be too hard on him, Seamus. I'm sure I'll hear you're making a mistake quite a bit once I start telling people about my decision to go back in. It doesn't make it right, Jeff. Seamus, I know you'd have been at the recruiting station the day of the attacks if you thought the Marines would let you back in, and I'm sure there are many vets who'd have been there with you. Hell, at my age, the Army won't take me back if I don't pass a fitness and proficiency test over the weekend. Jeff shrugged. I may not actually leave, unless Sean fires me anyway. He'll do that over my dead body, Seamus growled. Seamus, let me try and talk to him first, Jeff soothed. Seamus nodded, still frowning. Jeff put his coffee mug on Sean's desk and left the office to find his friend. He walked out to the ambulance garage and made his way through it to the back of the building. There, he opened the fire door leading outside. Sean Brophy stood with his back to his company's headquarters building and looked out over the baseball field it abutted. The grounds crew from Malden Catholic High School was already out grooming the field, which doubled as a practice field for football, though the school wouldn't be in session for another hour. Sean tried to calm his chaotic thoughts while he watched them work. A few minutes later, Sean felt someone standing next to him. He knew who it was. I think you're making a mistake, he said. I know, was all Jeff said in reply. Knowing you, you're gonna say something pithy or spout some patriotic quote now. The Tree of Liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Sean sighed and turned to his friend. Try and make it the blood of tyrants and not yours, you asshole. I'm sure Keiko would prefer it that way also, Jeff replied while looking out at the baseball diamond. Does she think you're making a mistake too? No, doesn't mean Keiko's thrilled with my choice though. She understands it. It'll be interesting to see how my folks take the news. You know how my mother reacted when I told her I was joining the army after high school. Marisa Knox had reacted poorly in 1987, by her own admission. She didn't speak to Jeff for seven months at the end of his senior year. She didn't even say goodbye to him the morning he left for basic training. Are Keiko and the kids going with you wherever you're going? No, Jeff sighed. I'll bounce around if I get the training I'm asking for. There's no provision for family housing during my training rotations. We'd have to buy or rent new places to live off post. The kids would be in a couple different school districts in different states, and we don't want that. 
Keiko would have to find new jobs as well. I know they'd have plenty of support from other army families, but as much as I'll miss them, I'd rather they stay here. They'll be in familiar territory here and have the support of both sides of the family. Jeff, I'm sorry for the way I acted, but damn it, you're my best friend. The best friend I've ever had. Sean hung his head with a look of hopelessness on his face. Jeff threw an arm around his friend's shoulders. And you've been my best friend since you got here from North Carolina, Sean. We've shared some good times together and some crazy ones. Keiko's planning a re-enlistment slash going away party for me in a couple of weeks. We'd love to have you and the rest of your family come. Let Dad and I know when and all of us will be there. That weekend, soldiers from Fort Devens did their best to show Jeff he needed to go home, or back to basic training at the very least. Jeff's military entry and processing station counselor set up his performance evaluation with the 18th Infantry Regiment at Fort Devens. When the 10th Special Forces Group heard about the testing after being tasked with his airborne re-eval, they offered to run the whole thing. They tried to harass the shit out of him. That attempted harassment lasted four hours. Jeff absolutely smoked the PT test Saturday morning before shooting expert with almost every weapon they tested him on. By lunchtime, the Green Berets attempted harassment changed to grudging acceptance. By the end of the weekend, they tried to convince Jeff to test for selection and join the special forces. He aced or nearly aced every evaluation and hadn't complained once. I have to say, Jeff, these APFT scores are impressive, remarked Staff Sergeant Ignacio Nunez, Jeff's counselor at the Boston MEPS. For a man my age, you mean, Jeff replied with a smile. For anybody, you didn't just max out on your age range's scores, you maxed out the scores in the 27 to 31 age range. The Army Physical Fitness Test is a series of three events, push-ups within two minutes, sit-ups within two minutes, and a timed two-mile run. Scores for each event are based on performance in that event and the soldier's age. A maximum of 100 points can be earned in each event. Jeff not only did well for his age group, scoring the maximum on the 32 to 36 year old soldiers scoring table, but he maxed out on the toughest age range on the table. I keep myself in good shape, Sergeant, Jeff shrugged, and I'm glad to see I remembered so much from my first enlistment. You certainly won't have to go back to basic, that's for sure, not with how you did over the weekend. If you're still looking to be a medic, we can send you right to Fort Sam. Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas, is home to the Army's medical department and the training site for his desired military occupation specialty, the field medic. SSG Nunez grinned. PERSCOM approved your MOS change without reduction in rank two. PERSCOM Army Personnel Command ruled that Jeff could switch from his original infantryman MOS to field medic. He wouldn't have to take a step back in rank either. He'd keep his previous E5 sergeant's rank. You said that I was risking loss of rank, Sergeant, but I'm glad it worked out. So we can move forward with the training I requested? You'll have to be in San Antonio in three weeks, but yes. According to Tradoc and Amy Ed, you can skip the EMT upgrade portion of the training if you want. Tradoc is the Army's Training and Doctrine Command. I'll be there. A review wouldn't hurt. What about the other piece of what I was hoping for with this re-enlistment? Nunez pulled a stack of papers bound with a heavy binder clip out of his desk and handed them to Jeff. Whether or not you'll qualify for that is up to the cadre at AIT. Fill out what you can in that stack and submit it when you report in. That way they'll know what you're aiming for. Nunez stood after turning off his desk lamp. Let's get you a voucher you can use at clothing sales at Devon's so you can draw your basic uniform issue. Fort Sam can issue you the rest of your things, but you'll need the uniforms before you report in. As you saw this weekend, we phased out the woodland camo and all leather boots. Jeff gave Sean Brophy written notification of his intent to enlist the first week of October. In return, he received a letter on Brophy letterhead acknowledging the notification. It stated Brophy would hold his position as DMD's operations manager for him until October 31st, 2006. Despite their misgivings, Jeff's friends and family gathered at the Knox family home in Lancaster on the Sunday of Columbus Day weekend. Many of those there felt that Jeff was crazy, that he was taking too big a risk by rejoining the army, 
But they didn't go so far as to tell him that. A small minority had. Hours into his send-off party, Jeff sat in a chair behind a corner of his house, out of sight of the guests. He gazed off to the west, watching the setting sun, while he picked the label off the beer bottle in his hands. He was glad so many of his friends made the drive to Lancaster, but now there was a lingering distance in his relationships with most of them. Jeff almost jumped out of his skin when he felt a hand on his shoulder. Sorry, Jeff, we didn't mean to startle you. Alice and Tom Cavanaugh looked at him with obvious concern on their faces. Tom held two more chairs in his hands while he stood behind his wife. Jeff popped out of his chair to help Tom place the others next to his. He waited for Alice to be seated before he sat. Jeff considered Alice and Tom to be another set of grandparents. Their granddaughter, Heather Pelly, was one of his oldest and closest friends. They considered themselves brother and sister, or had until his announcement. Are you okay, Jeff? Alice asked. Jeff shrugged in reply, picking at his beer bottle again. What is it? When Pearl Harbor was attacked back when you were my age, Tom, there was no question of enlisting, right? By the time I was your age, Jeff, Korea had been over for four years and Jane was nine. Tom reminded him, Jane being his daughter and Heather's mother. To answer your question, however, that would be a no. There was no question of if, but one of when. My parents made me wait until I turned 18 in 1943 to enlist. You're a history major. You know guys committed suicide if they got classified 4F and couldn't serve. Are people questioning your decision, Jeff? Alice asked. You might say that. You have to admit that a 32-year-old husband and father of three re-enlisting is bound to raise some eyebrows. I suppose, Jeff mumbled. But you still feel it's something you need to do, right? Tom asked. Jeff nodded. Jeff, Alice said while pulling her chair closer to him. She held both of his hands after taking the bottle from them. You've told us about your grandfather McLaren, your mother's birth father. Like him, we had a two-year-old girl at home when a war started, Korea in our case. Tom made it home safely from World War II, but he rejoined the army when North Korea invaded the South in 1950. We barely had four years together, but I understood he had to go. I understood the same thing 20 years later, when he was still in the army and got sent to Vietnam. I'm sure Keiko understands too. She does, Alice. She's the only one of our circle other than you, Tom, and my company's owner, who didn't question my decision. Jane and Heather questioned you? Alice asked, incredulous. Jeff's silence was answer enough. Jane was a 20-plus year Air Force veteran. She should understand. TC, too. TC, Thomas Clayton Pelly III, was Heather's husband. Jeff served with TC after high school. Almost everyone, Alice. Alice sat back and looked at her husband. They haven't said anything today, but it's there. Jeff sighed. They're here though, Alice. They may not agree with my decision, but they're here to support Keiko and me. Sean Brophy definitely doesn't agree personally, but he's agreed in writing to hold my job for five years per USERA. USERA? Alice asked. What's that? The Uniformed Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act of 1994, or USERRA Act, Alice, an updated version of the Veterans Reemployment Rights Act. It's a federal law which will allow me to step right back into my position at DMD when I come back. Just like your friends will let you step right back into their lives when you come back, Jeff, Alice reminded him. Jeff hoped so. The following Thursday night, Keiko lay in bed while wrapped in Jeff's arms. His duffel bag sat in the back of his VW Passat, packed and ready for his departure in the morning. The trip to San Antonio would take three days. Mayumi and Hiro would come over to have breakfast and say goodbye. I love you, my husband, Keiko whispered in Japanese. Jeff felt her tears falling on his bare chest despite the sweat from their lovemaking. And I you, my Keiko-chan, please come back to us. She sobbed. He hugged her tighter. I will, Keiko. You remember I'll probably get some time off after AIT, right? I'll be back soon. You know what I mean, Jeffrey, she sniffled. I do, Keiko, I do. I promise I will do everything I can to come back to you and the kids. 
That is all I can ask, Jeffrey. Beep. Jeff groped blindly in the dark for his watch and silenced the alarm which called him from his slumber. It was 4.30 in the morning. 0.430, he corrected himself. He cursed under his breath before swinging his feet off the bed he collapsed into the night before. A twin bed without his wife. My friends were right, he thought while he turned on the lights in his visiting enlisted quarters room at Fort Sam Houston. I've got to be out of my mind. He had a fun-filled morning planned, PT and breakfast before cleaning up and reporting to his AIT unit, the 102nd Medical Battalion, when the office opened at 7 o'clock. Oh, 700, Jeff, he muttered. Geez, get with the program. He climbed into his new Army physical fitness uniform, grabbed his new military ID, temporary meal card, room keys, and went to do his PT. Once at the track, Jeff punished himself by doing push-up after push-up until his muscles gave out. Then he did the same with sit-ups. By the time he started his run, he could smell the sweat soaking through the PT uniform, mixing with the new clothes smell of the uniform itself. He'd have to find the fitness center nearest his barracks to keep up with his weight workouts. 24 laps of alternating jogging and sprints wrung even more sweat from Jeff's body and made him glad he bothered with the sweatsuit part of the uniform. On a calm morning, the current mid-50s temps would have been welcome for running. But with today's 10-mile-an-hour north wind, they weren't. Jeff made his way back to the VQ after a simple, filling breakfast of sausage and biscuits, home fries, juice, and coffee. Lots of coffee. After his shower, satisfied he prepared himself and his uniform the right way, he grabbed his duffel bag and left the VQ. He stepped into the offices of Charlie Company, 132 Medical Battalion, at Zorro 705. Can I help you, Sergeant? A staff sergeant asked. Yes, Sergeant, I'm reporting in for the 91 Bravo AIT. Jeff held out his orders. Knox, Jeffrey A. Jeff wondered to himself if the MOS designation for field medics would change again before his enlistment was up. It was 91 Alpha back in the early 90s. The sergeant, Staff Sergeant Franklin, according to his uniform, looked over the sheaf of papers and checked a list on his desk. Welcome to Charlie Company Knox. You'll meet the company commander as well as your cycle's drill sergeant tomorrow. They're in a meeting right now. Franklin glanced over Jeff's Class A uniform. Changing your MOS, I see. Jeff nodded. How long you been in? This time, I retook my enlistment oath at the beginning of the month. I joined up after high school the first time, but that was 87 to 91. I'd been out for over a decade until last month's attacks. What have you been doing in the meantime? Ambulance work, Sergeant. I've been an EMT since 91 and a paramedic since 95. You're already an EMT? Franklin asked with a blink. That'll probably give you a leg up on the other soldiers in your cycle. You going to skip the upgrade class? No, Sergeant. AAFEM says they'll allow me to count the class toward my paramedic recertification. To earn the credits, I have to get signed off on my practical skills and pass the written during the upgrade. Plus, I understand I'd have to switch to a different cycle if I skip it, and I'd rather not do that. A valid point. So you decided to come back for more? I liked it, I loved it, I wanted more of it, Jeff answered, misquoting a line from a familiar cadence. Right, Franklin snorted. Excuse me while I call bullshit. Still, we're glad to have you, Knox. Here's your arrival packet. That's got your room key and your meal card for while you're at Fort Sam, as well as info on the base and the course. Do you bring a car? Yes, Sergeant. Do you need the keys? Yes, until your class is cleared to have use of your POVs, You'll need to park it in the designated lot. Remember to grab anything you might need out of it before you hand the keys over. I made sure I took everything I might need out of it when I checked into the VE last night, so all of that's already in my duffel. My MEPS counselor told me to also give you this when I reported in, Sergeant. Jeff handed over another sheaf of paper. Franklin's eyebrows rose when he saw what the stack was. You're gunning for special operations medic? Are you going SF? Maybe if I'd stayed in after the Gulf, I might have thought about special forces, but not now. No, Ranger Medic is what I'm shooting for. 
You're going to be bouncing around the southeast for the better part of a year before you get to the regiment. That's the price you pay if you want to play the game, Sergeant. Who, uh, I'll get out of your hair now. Even if I had any left for you to be in, you still wouldn't be in it, Franklin laughed. The day is yours, Knox. Much of your class is coming from Fort Jackson, and there was a problem with their plane that's putting them about three hours behind schedule. The plane was also supposed to stop at Fort Sill on the way, so the majority of your class won't be here until much later today. The captains decided to give anyone who reports today a free pass since we can make up the lost time this week. Get your barracks room squared away today, and we'll handle all of the other admin stuff tomorrow. Reveille is at 0430 tomorrow, PT at 0500. Fall in with the rest of us outside this building. Roger that, Sergeant. Making sure his room conformed to standards took Jeff a half hour, after which he tried to find things to keep himself occupied. He tried taking a nap, but after 30 minutes of restlessness, he wound up changing back into his BDUs and heading to the company office. There he volunteered himself for anything SSG Franklin or the admin staff needed help with. You're setting a dangerous precedent by volunteering, Knox. You know that, right? I know, Sergeant, but I'm going stir-crazy over in the barracks. I'm not taking any college classes while I'm training. I didn't feel like reading any of the few books I brought, and I won't have my hands on any course material until tomorrow, so I figured, what the hell? I can get you some AIT-related materials if you're really interested, but I'm guessing what I can release to you will be stuff you already know. I could get you the expert field medical badge standards, so you can study them, but that might be jumping the gun. Yeah, too much too soon. The standards likely wouldn't be much use to me until I see the medic-related skills done the way the army wants them done. I'm sure I've got enough bad civilian habits to forget first, as it is. That's something you'll have to watch for, true, anyway. Why don't you see if Mrs. Hernandez over there needs help with anything first? Check back in with me if not. The bulk of the other students in his AIT cycle arrived after lunchtime. With Jeff's help, the office processed the new arrivals before the close of business that afternoon. SSG Franklin took him to the NCO club for dinner to say thank you. You sure about this, Sergeant? Jeff asked while walking to the front door. No offense, but I don't really want to be known as the teacher's pet. You're in luck then. I don't teach, I run the office. None of your instructors helped check people in today because they were getting ready for your cycle to start. We won't have much, if any, contact with each other during your cycle. You didn't have to come back to the office, Jeff, but you did. You could have slept all day for all we cared, but you chose to come in and ask if you could help. Jeff shrugged. I've never really been the guy who sits around when there's work to be done. There you go. Jeff returned to his barracks after dinner to find his door open. A young black man sat at the desk on the previously unoccupied side of the room. He unfolded himself from the desk chair when Jeff entered. Hey, Jeff greeted the man in a friendly tone while extending his hand. I'm Jeff Knox. Terrence Davis. Davis matched Jeff's height of six foot two but weighed about 180 pounds. The young man's grip hinted at a wiry strength. Good to meet you, Terrence. Is that what you prefer to be called? Terrence? Yes, please. Terrence it is. Jeff nodded while he unbuttoned his BDU blouse, which drew Terrence's eyes to it. Those eyes widened when they saw Jeff's rank, his CIB, and his jump wings. Jeff glanced down. Half a lifetime ago, Terrence. I'm a student here, just like you. Nothing more. Jeff saw Terence relax and nod. Jeff's easygoing manner put the younger man at ease. Where are you from? All over, Terence snorted. Dad's a Marine currently stationed at Camp Pendleton. I graduated high school in Oceanside, California. How long's he been in? 24 years. He's got one more year as the Sergeant Major for 2D Battalion, 5th Marines. It sounds like he'll sign up for another enlistment after that if Mom can't convince him otherwise. What made you choose the Army and not the Marines? Jeff asked, pulling up his own chair and waving Terrence back to his. Open avoidance. I wanted to make my own way and not feel like I was skating through on Dad's coattails. How do you take that? Not well at first, but we sat down and talked it out a week or so after I told him about my decision. Given you're here at Medic AIT, 
Do you think the fact you'd have had to join the Navy to be a corpsman helped him see your point of view? Terence laughed. The guys that earn their FMF, their Fleet Marine Force qualification, and serve in the field with the Marines, they're pretty highly thought of by the Marines they take care of. The Marines are pretty protective of their docks. They tend to overlook the fact their dock is a squid. So you didn't use that in your argument? No, but Dad used their reputation in his. Luckily, he accepted the I want to walk my own path thing. Two paths diverged in a yellow wood. Frost? Frost. 90% of the seniors in the two classes before me in high school used the last few lines of The Road Less Traveled as their yearbook quote. School administration asked my class not to use it. What did you use when your turn came then? A line by Dylan Thomas, one which is strangely appropriate given recent events. I'm not sure if I recognize the name. Maybe not the name, but I'm sure you've probably heard the poem I used at some point. Jeff quoted the passage. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. At the time, I meant for people to fight against the loss of friendships after graduation. Now. For me, it meant I had to re-enlist and rage against those looking to extinguish the light that I feel this country represents. My oath from 1987 still holds as true for me, as I'm sure your father's does for him. Through October 2001, Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio, Texas. I borrowed a couple beers at dinner, Terrence. Please excuse me while I step down the hall and return them. The sound of Terrence's laughter followed Jeff to the latrine. While returning to their room, he heard Terrence bark, Hey! Put that down, Zambrano. Turning into the room, Jeff found an unknown man there holding the picture of Jeff's family from his desk. Who's the slope, Terry? That other man asked Jeff's roommate. First impressions are difficult to overcome. The mystery man now faced a hard time getting on Jeff's good side, especially after opening his mouth again. I bet she sucks a mean. The mystery man didn't get the opportunity to finish his statement. Jeff snatched the photo out of his hand and startled him. He hadn't seen or heard Jeff come in. Terrence, you gonna introduce me to this asshole? Jeff glared down at the man who'd been going through his stuff. At five foot eight, the other man craned his neck up to look at Jeff's six foot two frame. Frank Zambrano, Terrence answered. His tone of voice made it clear he didn't consider Frank Zambrano a friend. Get out of my room, Francis. Don't ever touch my shit again. Better yet, don't come back again. Jeff made no move to get out of Zambrano's way. The other man glared back. Neither moved for nearly a full minute. Zambrano blinked first. He snorted and left the room. Jeff kicked the door closed. Sorry, Jeff, he came in uninvited and I didn't think he'd start pawing through your stuff. Jeff waved off the apology. You called him on it, Terrence, that's what matters. You just meet him too? No, he was in my basic training cycle at Fort Sill. Lucky you. Yeah, just my luck he followed me here too. That's one off the list, Jeff muttered while placing the family photo back on his desk. What list? Terence asked. The list of personalities you find in a barracks. Now that I think about it, I'm not sure if that guy is the barracks asshole or the barracks bully. Yes. Jeff raised an eyebrow. Terence explained. You asked if he was the barracks bully or asshole. The answer is yes. He seems to have the ability to be either or both when he wants to be. Terence shook his head. Enough about the asshole. How long have you been in? Four years, but like I said, that was over a decade ago, Terence. For the past ten years, I've been an EMT and paramedic back in Massachusetts. Are you an American Association for EMS Paramedic? Yes. If you're an AFEMS paramedic, why didn't they let you skip part of the training? They gave me the option, but I decided against it. Ahmed's still revising the AIT schedule to account for AFEMS certification. Up until less than a year ago, AFEMS certification wasn't on their radar. If I skip, they reassign me to a different cycle. Eventually, they say the EMT class will be first, so they can just start you when the Army-specific stuff starts. You're going to be bored as hell during that part of the class. I'll still need to pay attention, Terence, since AFEMS has agreed to count AIT towards my recertification in two years. 
I'll need to pass that portion to get the credits. How are you, my husband? Keiko asked. Are you settled in there? I am, yes, Keiko. How are the kids? The children still do not quite understand your departure, though Alexander has a better grasp on the circumstances behind it than the younger two. I'm not sure I have a firm grasp on why I left either, he thought. Yeah. Concepts such as terrorism, religious hate, and collective fear are not something I'd expect kids under five to understand. I'm not sure I understand them all that well myself. How are you, Keiko? I already miss you, my beloved, she sighed. I have grown quite used to your presence beside me at night over the last seven years. Your absence is palpable. Jeff said nothing for several seconds. I do not say that to upset you, Jeffrey. It is what it is. As you are fond of saying, what you are doing is important. Please make sure, however, you are one of the rangers you help to return home safely. I'm going to do my best on that score, don't worry. What's going on with that Patriot Act stuff we heard about before I shipped out? Some in Congress have finally slowed the adoption of the bill. It appears it was not even printed for review before a certain segment of Congress attempted to have it voted on. Many admitted they had not read it before being ready to vote on it either. It is currently stuck in committee. I'm glad they weren't able to ram it through. That's a bit scary. It is, Jeffrey, particularly when you read some of the proposed measures included in the act. Indefinite detention of immigrants without a trial. Designation of any group as a terrorist organization without cause. Passing of domestic information to the Central Intelligence Agency in violation of their mandate to refrain from spying within the United States. The list is seemingly endless and endlessly terrifying in its scope. Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Once lost, these civil liberties will be gone forever. The Founding Fathers understood that, particularly Ben Franklin. The pendulum is starting to swing the other way now that the shock of the attacks is beginning to lessen. Jeff offered another quote, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Last night, the Soviet General Secretary offered to allow overfly rights to warplanes from the United States during operations against the Taliban, Keiko mentioned. He says it is better if the Soviet Union does not re-enter Afghanistan, given their past history there. I saw that. He also offered any logistical support the Soviet Union could provide, including hosting American planes at their bases in that area. He's right about them not going back in, though. I doubt any in this country would support returning troops to Vietnam for any reason. This is already going to be a messy fight. No sense adding to the issues surrounding it. With the exception of Jeff, Class 0202's ranks contained people who volunteered for the military before September 11th. All of the youngsters, as Jeff called them, were stunned by how fast the course of their careers changed. Many were once angry like Jeff once was, though that anger had cooled with time and was now replaced by firm resolve. Others were flat out scared by what might lie ahead for them. Jeff tried to catch those soldiers alone and help them talk it out on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. One of their classmates, Zambrano naturally, decided to channel his emotions into harassing Jeff. Jeff did the sensible thing and ignored him. That only made Zambrano try harder, of course. He took every opportunity to make a snide comment or insult Jeff when he thought the drill sergeants couldn't hear. Thursday afternoon, after the class drew their field equipment from Fort Sam's central issuing facility, Jeff approached the lead drill sergeant for their cycle. Excuse me, drill sergeant, Jeff asked from the doorway to the man's office. Yes, Knox? Of all the soldiers in the cycle, Jeff Knox was the least needy one and the last one Dale Chin ever expected to see in his office after only three days. Chin waved Jeff in. At ease, Knox. What's up? I'm sure you've noticed the treatment I've received from one of my fellow soldier medics this week, drill surgeon. Chin nodded with a dark look. May I ask you to let me handle it tomorrow morning? Chin's eyes narrowed. That soldier's not going to have an accident in the latrine, is he, Knox? Negative, drill sergeant. I was thinking more along the lines of a peer-led demonstration during the APFT in the morning, drill sergeant. Dale Chin smiled a sly smile at Jeff. You're gonna smoke that guy, aren't you, Knox? 
I'm gonna try my damnedest, Drill Sergeant. He's what, half your age? Almost Drill Sergeant, yes. Okay, I'll speak to the other cadre and give them the heads up. If tomorrow doesn't take care of it, we will... Later. Understood? Loud and clear, Drill Sergeant. Dismissed. The Euro 430 came early despite the 2100 lights out call the night before. Jeff and Terrence fell in with the rest of the company wearing their PT gear and marched to the nearby fitness track. By Euro 5 on 15, the company divided into small groups for their first Army physical fitness test at AIT. Zambrano wasn't in Jeff's group, but that didn't stop him from continuing to make comments from the line next to Jeff's. Jeff continued to ignore Zambrano. The younger man kept it up even as the two got into the front leaning rest position for the push-up portion of the PT test. Jeff rolled his eyes at Zambrano's evaluator before concentrating on the grass in front of him. Go, came the command from the company first sergeant. Part of Jeff's brain registered the count of his push-ups increasing with each repetition while he continued to knock them out. Part of it noted that Zambrano's count remained at 19 for three repetitions before increasing again. This meant Zambrano wasn't meeting the standard for the exercise, and those repetitions didn't count. Jeff grinned and kept pushing. After two minutes, Jeff's count was 102 to Zambrano's 55. The results were almost the same for the sit-ups, 108 to 63. Zambrano's taunts dropped off after hearing how the old geezer did. Still, he believed he'd best Jeff during the two-mile run. Jeff lined up far to the outside of the track when their turn for the run came around. Zambrano snorted, thinking Jeff would have to run much further on the outside rather than along the inside rail. One of the cycle's young women joined Jeff at the far end of the starting line. They nodded to each other before the command to start. Before the first turn, Jeff led the pack and settled into a pace just off that of his sprints. Only the toes of his shoes came into contact with the track's surface while his long strides ate up the quarter-mile oval. He flew down the inside lane, passing the slower runners of his group by the end of his fourth lap. Jeff didn't spare a glance or a breath for Zambrano when he passed him. During his sixth lap, Jeff felt someone shadowing him. Sparing a glance over his shoulder, he saw the young lady he nodded at earlier matching his pace. That was no mean feat, since he was almost a foot taller than she was. Jeff saw the other groups begin to line the edge of the track, hoping to catch a glimpse of the developing race. The rest of their cycle began cheering them when they entered their final lap. Jeff knew he'd be tested by the woman pacing him by the end of that final 440 yards. She began her kick on the final backstretch, trying to pass him. She pulled even with Jeff and forced him to try and increase his pace as they entered the final turn. Jeff drew on what reserves he still had and searched for his normal sprint's rhythm. The unlikely pair crossed the finish line at the same time. Jeff wobbled to the outside of the track to begin a cool-down walk. He turned back to the starting line at the first turn and approached the woman who'd given him so much trouble. The dark-haired teen gulped lungfuls of air while holding her hands above her head. Jeff smiled and held out his hand. That was a hell of a run, he said. Thanks, she grinned back. Mishka Gupta. Jeff Knox. Track star? 3,000 meters, Gupta answered with a nod. Shit, a ringer! Mishka smiled. I'd have had you if my strides were as long as yours. Damn right you would have. What did we just run, six minute miles? Just off that, I think I heard 12.30 when we crossed the line. She gave him a sidelong glance while they walked back to the scorers at the finish. I've been hearing Zambrano give you the business all week, calling you old geezer. Do you mind if I ask how old you are? I turned 32 in August. You just crushed that run. How did you do on the push-ups and sit-ups? Maxed out on both. A 300? Shit. The push-ups are always my weakest event. I usually top out at 30 to 35, which is 78 to 88 points for me. I haven't managed to crack 290 yet. Staff Sergeant Chin conferred with Jeff's evaluator, Sergeant Donna Markoff, as the two runners approached. I think you took care of the problem, Knox. We'll have to see drill, Sergeant. He really doesn't concern me any longer. I'm aiming for my Whiskey One ASI, so that's all I care about right now.
A Whiskey One additional skill identifier would earn Jeff the chance to become a ranger medic. You no longer mind because he no longer matters? Something like that. Jeff sat at the desk in his barracks room over the weekend, studying the standards for common medic tasks. Terence was out doing extra running to augment their regular PT sessions. Music from Jeff's iPod played softly over the small speaker on the desk. His foot tapped out the song's rhythm of its own accord while he read. Terence stepped into the room with his t-shirt soaked in sweat. He closed the door behind him before noticing the music. He stood at the door trying to place the song. What's that song, Jeff? Jeff looked up. Wood? By Alice in Chains. Who? Alice in Chains. They started out as a grunge band in the mid to late 80s, but they've been drifting away from that. They've been sort of quiet over recent years due to their lead singer's drug issues. Jeff, I turned 18 before my graduation in June. I wasn't born until the early 80s. I think we've already established I'm old, Terrence. And you're still the PT stud of the class, despite your age. Jeff shrugged. If I make it to Ranger Indoc, the Special Operations Combat Medic Course and Ranger School, I'll just be a face in the crowd at those places. Yeah, okay, old-timer, Terrence chuckled, grabbing his shower stuff. He cocked his head. Do you have that song on repeat? Yeah, there's this one part of the song I really identify with right now. So I made a big mistake. Try to see it once my way. You're talking about your re-enlistment, aren't you? His roommate asked, drawing a nod from Jeff. But you don't see re-enlisting as a mistake, despite what your friends have said, do you? No, Jeff said, a sad smile on his face. He turned back to his studying. The cadre introduced the skills of an army medic in the time-honored fashion of crawl, walk, run, also referred to as hear one, see one, do one. For the majority of the class, the information was new. For Jeff, it was about half and half. The medical side he'd seen many times before, but mixing it with the tactical environment was new. Tactical EMS was an idea that was just beginning to interest him in the civilian world before his departure from it. Also new was the idea he may need to care for up to four patients at once in the back of a Humvee ambulance, twice as many potential patients then as a civilian. Many of Jeff's fellow students approached him for clarification on class topics. Once they learned he was a civilian paramedic, he was able to explain things while also explaining that where they needed to be able to evaluate and treat a casualty in a tactical environment was new for him. His classmates also wanted to hear his war stories of civilian EMS. Jeff cautioned them that pediatric casualties would be the hardest ones to face. When the others reminded him there weren't many pediatric soldiers in the army, his friendly demeanor evaporated. Ah, so none of you think you're going to deploy after the attacks in September? Jeff asked with an edge to his voice. Well, some of us will, sure, replied Alti Nicholson, a 19-year-old farm boy from western Minnesota. And you don't think there will be kids caught in the middle of the fighting, Al? The others sat back when they saw a look settle over Jeff's features. The friendly, outgoing man they'd come to know since the start of AIT vanished in an instant, replaced by one who looked drawn and tortured. The visitors left his room as fast as they could. Terence stared at his roommate while the others left. Jeff looked much older than the 32. Terence knew him to be. When? Terence asked once they were alone in their room. Two summers ago, Jeff replied in a hollow voice. It was the call that pushed me off the road and into the office. I needed counseling afterward and I was doing okay with it until now. He scrubbed at his face. Shit, it just hit me like a damn hammer while we sat here. Jeff looked at the young man across the room. The part that unnerved me the most at the time, Terence, was that my kids were the same age as the two we transported that day. Those two little girls were severely beaten by their mother's boyfriend while she was at work. Jeff looked down the hands which he'd begun to wring during his explanation. Their mom worked at a coffee shop our company's ambulances frequented. She was a favorite of the customers for her upbeat and friendly personality. Did the girls make out okay? Jeff didn't respond at first, staring at the wall without seeing it. Terence waited him out. The younger sister, Ruby, did. She started preschool this year at the same place where my kids go, though she's in a different group. 
And the older sister? Terence asked a minute later. Jeff sighed. Liliana Josette Sepulveda was pronounced dead at 2.07 p.m. on 15th of July 2000, minutes after my partner and I got her to a hospital in Boston. She was laid to rest a week later in Medford, Massachusetts. She was three, Terence, the same age as my two sons at the time my daughter is Ruby's age. That's the demon that's chasing you, isn't it? One of them. I'm on reasonably good terms with this particular one now, so it should retreat now that I've acknowledged it tonight. Jeff turned back to his desk and closed the books on it. There was no way he'd get any more studying done that night. The AFM's EMT upgrade portion of Jeff's AIT class began the week before Christmas 2001 and would stretch for four weeks until January 18, 2002. He and the rest of his class would have the week of Christmas off, then return. Not ideal from a teaching standpoint, but from a personal one it was. Jeff would take a chartered jet home from San Antonio's Stinson Municipal Airport the morning of the 22nd. He'd return on the 30th. Staff Sergeant Chin pulled Jeff aside after the end of PT before the first day of class. Knox, you know we're starting that EMT upgrade class this morning, right? Yes, Drill Sergeant. The instructor AFM sent is not the same person we've had here before for the last two classes. It's someone new and we in the cadre aren't familiar with this person. Don't let them constantly call on you. Let your classmates answer the questions. Some of them need the help and the spotlight turned on them before they fail out. Jeff's eyes widened. I don't know why I'm surprised, Drill Sergeant, but there's a bell curve and every class isn't there. That there is, Knox, and I'm sure you can guess where you fall on that curve. Jeff and his fellow students were always being evaluated. In the middle, Drill Sergeant? Dilchin's eyes narrowed. Don't piss down my back and tell me it's raining, Knox, he said with a chuckle. You know where you rank in this class. Go get your nasty ass cleaned up. You have 25 minutes to get ready for chow. Roger, drill sergeant. The biscuits and gravy Jeff selected for breakfast wouldn't help him stay awake, but they tasted so damn good. They and the grits he chose would mean an extra few laps on the track tonight. Given that he scored another 300 on the most recent PT test, he wasn't too worried about a few extra calories. He almost convinced himself the two fruit cups he ate offset the other items, too. By 0800 Class 0202, filed into a classroom their cycle hadn't been in before, during AIT. The room's walls boasted AFEM's training posters, instead of the Army ones they were used to after two months of training. Jeff and Terence talked in low voices while seated at the back row of tables, waiting for the instruction block to begin. Attention! SSG Chin's voice cut through the chatter and everyone shot to their feet. Jeff saw Captain Caroline Mag here stride to the front of the room out of the corner of his eye. Take seats, she called. At five foot one, Captain Mag's diminutive stature wouldn't normally evoke a sense of obedience if one passed her on the street. Anyone who spent any time around her, however, was soon struck by her command presence. While she told them to call her Captain Mac because it was easier, while be unto the soldier who misinterpreted that latitude. Her drill sergeants would be all over that soldier before the captain could even raise an eyebrow. The EFMB on her uniform told folks she knew how to do the job. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Today you will be starting one of the newest modules in the field medic AIT course the American Association for Emergency Medical Services Medic to EMT Bridge Program. This course is designed to give Army field medics the opportunity to obtain civilian EMT certification. For the past two classes, this module was being evaluated to see how it fit with our training here. Students were not required to pass the EMT upgrade while it was being tested. As you were told when this cycle began in October, that is no longer the case. If you do not pass the skill and written tests at the end of the module, you will not move on with your class unless and until you pass a retest. If you do not pass after retaking the test, you will be recycled into another class, allowed to retake the module and be given two more attempts to pass. If you do not pass after retaking the module, you will be reclassified into another MOS. I urge you to pay attention if you've made it this far, you're meeting the standard, but this module is pass-fail. If you find yourself falling behind, talk to the instructor, the drill instructors, or your fellow soldier medics, Staff Sergeant Chin, 
on your feet. SSG Chin took Captain Mac's place at the front of the class after she left the room. Take seats. People, I want to introduce your primary instructor for the next module. She may not be in the army, but do not disrespect her, or you will be pushing Fort Sam down to sea level. Am I clear? Yes, Drill Sergeant. Good. This is our first time meeting this instructor, but she comes highly recommended from AFEMS. I'd like to introduce Ms. Jacqueline Simmons. She volunteered to come here and teach when our regular instructor had to cancel. She's been a paramedic for close to 35 years and worked in the Metro Boston area for most of that. She also used to coordinate one of that area's most successful paramedic programs. If you have a question, ask. She's probably forgotten more than you'll ever know. Miss Simmons? Jeff looked at the tabletop in front of him and hid his smile. Jackie Simmons was his program's coordinator when he started paramedic school in 1994. He'd been in one of the last few classes of its successful 20-year existence. Jackie looked almost exactly how Jeff remembered her, with the addition of only a few lines on her face, though her once bright blonde hair was now silver and contrasted with her tanned skin. The first half of the class was more about the structure of the module than teaching. Jackie covered basic civilian EMT skills and equipment after lunch. Loads, lifts, and carries the Army didn't use, stair chairs and stretchers. Just before 1700, she ended the class and turned it back over to SSG Chin. He called them to their feet and dismissed them from there. Jackie Simmons collected her things and began putting them into her bag. A voice called to her while she was bent over. Excuse me, Ms. Simmons? Yes, soldier? She answered in a distracted voice. We're a long way from Wilmington, aren't we, Jackie? Jackie whipped around so fast, she made herself dizzy. When her vision cleared, she saw there was a young soldier standing there smiling at her. Her eyes flitted over the front of his uniform, trying to figure out who he was. Knox? She asked. Jeff Knox, I remember you. Which class were you in again? I was in the medic class that tested in August of 1995. I was very sorry to hear about your father, Jackie. Jackie's father suffered a massive stroke in late July of 1996. He lingered for well over a year while she cared for him in his own home. She refused to put her father in an elderly storage facility as she called nursing homes. She all but disappeared from the paramedic program she ran for so long after his stroke. The September 1996 class was the final incoming class of the program. The program staggered along until the following summer when that class tested. Jackie's dad hung on until January of 1998. Many said he lived so long because his daughter was the one caring for him. People believed he would have died right after his stroke if he'd been placed in a home. Jackie was the only child of the marriage, so her parents' entire estate fell to her. She took the money left to her and traveled for three years. Returning home in the spring of 2001, she wanted a change of scenery, so she settled in southern Ohio close to the AFEMS headquarters. By May, she was working for them. Jackie found she enjoyed teaching more now that she wasn't in charge of a business. She went where she was asked, taught what she was asked, and got paid. Thanks, Jeff, and thank you for the card your family sent then. What are you doing here? I remember you working at Brophy back during medic school. Technically, I still am, though I'm on a leave of absence. They're holding my position open under the USERA law. I re-enlisted in early October. So, you've been with Brophy EMS for about eight years? Well, my seniority dates to then, yes, though that doesn't matter given my position with them now. Are you a supervisor? You could say that, he answered with a wry grin. I'm the operations manager for their new Shirley division. Ops manager? Wow, that's a pretty quick rise, Jeff. When did they open out there? Last September. We're running four non-transport trucks there at the moment, one of which covers Fort Devons. We have eight towns under contract in addition to the base. The base, too? With you working in that area, you must know the company that developed this class? Sure, it was mine. Devons Medical Defense. Sean Brophy is the one who came up with the entire idea. Sean Brophy developed the class. I should have had him working for me before Dad died. The curriculum is really well put together. Well, the concept was his, but my training officer is the person responsible for the class itself. Jeff smiled. <laughs> and that person used to work for you. Who? Tara Bergeron. Really, 
Tara works for you now. Yep. As soon as I saw her application, she was at the top of my list. The job was hers to lose. Why does it not surprise me to find you chatting with Ms. Simmons like an old friend, Knox? Came SSG Chin's voice. Jeff whirled and snapped to parade rest. Knock it off, will you? Dale Chin groused while waving his hand at Jeff. Jeff relaxed to at ease. Ms. Simmons was the program coordinator and lead instructor where I went to paramedic school drill sergeant. Well, get out of here and get cleaned up then. You and Ms. Simmons can catch up over dinner if you want. Jeff Knox stepped off his chartered flight and onto the tarmac in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, just after 11 in the morning that Saturday. He would celebrate Christmas with his family in three days. Jeff hoped for some snow cover but was disappointed. All he saw were frozen ruts in frozen grass, where a vehicle compressed once muddy soil on some forgotten warm day. His disappointment disappeared when he caught sight of his children in the terminal windows. They could be heard shouting for joy while they bounced up and down. The volume of their shouts increased upon opening the door. Keiko and both sets of grandparents stood behind them smiling. Daddy! Yelled Sabrina before she and her brothers tried to tackle him. Hey, I missed you guys, he said while kneeling to give them a giant hug. I forgot to pack a coat when I left, so I'm going to need to snuggle with you to keep warm. It's cold up here. The kids hugged him tighter. I do not need to be in a car seat, Jeffrey, Keiko said in a throaty voice filled with emotion. Perhaps you would care to snuggle with me on the way home? Jeff's father threatened to use a fire extinguisher to cool off his son's reunion with his wife. Your mother and I are getting old, Jeff. Our hearts can't handle that kind of display. Marisa swatted Joe's arm while Hiro and Mayumi laughed at them. Jeff's week of leave was tightly scheduled. With only seven days back in Massachusetts, his family made sure he got to see as many of his friends and other family as possible. Though Christmas Eve and Christmas Day cut that time to five days of visiting. He missed his family's annual Christmas party at his cousin's house the weekend before, which saddened him. He needed to take care of so many things prior to his departure in October. Jeff hadn't been able to get back out to the Enfield area to see his grandmother or most of the rest of his mom's side of the family. He used his Sunday back home for that purpose. Before he and his family left the Swift River Valley for Lancaster on the 24th, they visited a familiar house in Prescott. Jeff and Jack Jarrett shared a long hug when the Knoxes stepped into the Jarrett's entryway. Jack led the young family into his living room. Thomas Addison. Jarrett II slept in his mother's arms, swaddled tight in a cotton flannel blanket. Kathy beamed at her old friend while she greeted him and his family. Mom and Dad will be by in an hour or so, Jeff commented. It'll be good to see your parents again, Jeff, even if we see them just about every weekend at the lunch car, Kathy replied. Jack sat on the back deck in the winter sun looking out over the valley view again two hours later. In addition to the decorated tree and lit menorah in the living room, the Jarrett's also placed a tree on the deck, wrapped in outdoor lights. Jeff sat with Jack but stared at the tree instead of the vista. You okay, Jeff? Yeah, I guess, Jack, he sighed. What is it? Up until now, I've been holding the weight of what I've chosen at arm's length. Coming home, visiting family, sitting here. It hit me this week. This could be one of my last Christmases kind of sobering. Do you really think that? I have to consider it, Jack. I knew what it might mean when I raised my right hand again in October. You haven't said this to Keiko, have you? She's a strong woman, Jack, but I don't know if I want to drop this on her. I'm headed to our lawyer's office Thursday to make sure my will is up to date and airtight. Our investment with Neptune's Forge alone will make sure my family is taken care of. Not to get too maudlin, but I'll make sure they're okay if it comes to it. I know you will. Thanks, Jack. The greatest show on turf will crush your patriots, Knox. My team's gonna win this game. It would figure Zambrano's a Rams fan. Jeff sighed to himself while rolling his eyes to Terrence. Today was Super Bowl Sunday. The New England Patriots would play the St. Louis Rams in Super Bowl Legacy 6 in a half hour. Charlie Company was midway through their end of AIT field training exercise at Camp Bullis, northwest of San Antonio. The four-week FTX allowed the AIT cadre an opportunity to evaluate the soldier medics on the entirety of their training, both individually and in small units. 
Given the importance of NFL football in the U.S., the cadre gave the cycle the day off, which was their first in two weeks. A projection screen TV from the ground floor lounge in Charlie Company's normal barracks occupied one end of their narrow field dining facility. The Patriots were the clear underdog in the game with the Rams favored by two touchdowns. While the commentators tried to be impartial during the pregame shows, the implication they all believed the Patriots were about to be steamrolled was clear. Despite two weeks of Zambrano's boasting, bragging, and inability to shut up far in excess of his norm, Jeff remained silent after the conference championship games. Jeff was thankful, however, that he had so little interaction with Francis since embarrassing him at the first PT test. Where are you from, Gunnox? Someone asked in a whisper. Jeff glanced to his left and saw SSG Zeke Gulbiki seated on the bench next to him. SSG Gulbiki was a recently promoted drill sergeant from another company also at Bullies. His company would start the field portion of their FTX in the morning. Enfield Mass originally drill surgeant. It's out west, near Springfield. My family and I now live in central Massachusetts near Fort Devens. Gulbiki nodded. I'm from Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Dad used to take my brothers and me to games at what was then Schaefer Stadium. My family's been season ticket holders since the team moved to Foxborough. I hope to hell they do better today than in their other two Super Bowls. You and me both. The Rams drew first blood with a field goal halfway through the first quarter, while Zambrano crowed loud and long over those three points. Terrence, and who didn't have a favorite team in the game, commented, The Pats are shutting the Rams down. If they can keep it up, they could steal this game. The Patriots held a surprising 14-3 lead at halftime. Zambrano appeared ill, though no one asked what was wrong. Jeff almost suggested bleeding and leeches as a remedy, but managed to restrain himself. He also let SSG Gulbicki be the exuberant Pats fan while he watched Francis Stew. In line for the halftime buffet, Jeff muttered, So far, so good. Let's hope they can keep it up. You don't think they will, Jeff? Asked Zeke Gulbicki while they gathered their food. Bucky fucking Dent? Up two runs with two outs in the bottom of the ninth inning of game six while leading the series three to two? You're not waiting for the other shoe to drop, Sarge? Jeff asked in reply referencing heartbreaking Red Sox collapses in 1978 and 1986. I'm hoping these guys prove me wrong, but it's hard for this Boston fan to break the habit of expecting something to go wrong. Zeke Gulbicki laughed in agreement. The Pats widened their lead to 14 points with a field goal of their own in the third quarter. The course of the game did the 180 Jeff expected on the next Rams possession when they scored a touchdown. Patriots fans thought their team jumped out to a 20-point lead at the end of the third quarter, but the refs called back the fumble recovery and 97-yard return due to defensive holding. The Rams scored on the very next play. See what I mean, Sarge? Jeff asked. No one likes a know-it-all. Zambrano started dancing around when the Rams tied the score with only 130 left in the game. There we go, there we go, he crowed while pointing at Jeff. We'll win this game in overtime. You've been dealing with that guy since your cycle started? Zeke asked under his breath. Well, not really. Up until now, we've been avoiding each other. Doesn't seem like the kind who would leave you alone. How'd you manage it? This old geezer maxed out on our first PT test while Junior over there barely broke 220. You're what, my age, 32? Jeff nodded. Last August. He looked back at the screen. What did Madden just say, Terrence? He thinks the Patriots should play for overtime. Well, I think he should kiss my fucking rosy red ass, but nobody's asking me my opinion. Play for overtime? Please, you play the game to win. I agree, Zeke added. Go big or go home. Jeff and his buddies watched the Patriots run the two-minute drill to perfection as they marched down the field. The Rams fans in the room looked more nervous with each successful play. Zambrano looked downright frantic. Tom Brady, the Patriots rookie quarterback, spiked the ball at the Rams' 30-yard line to stop the clock with seven seconds left in the game. The New England field goal unit ran onto the field. This guy's been automatic all season, Jeff commented about kicker Adam Vinatieri. Totally en fuego. Unless the kick's blocked, we've got this. 
Jeff's leg bounced up and down in nervous anticipation while the pats lined up. Everyone in the room leaned forward on the edge of their seat during the final play. Snap made, ball down, kick away, and Zeke Gulbicki and Jeff bounced out of their seats, screaming their fool heads off when the ball sailed through the uprights as time expired. The Patriots were Super Bowl champions. Weeks later, Jeff would hear the hometown radio broadcast of the final play. Longtime area sports reporter Gil Santos channeled his inner Al Michaels with his exuberant call of, it's good, it's good. Lost in the celebration of the soldiers rooting for the Patriots was Zambrano's temper tantrum at the end of the game. Jeff didn't see it, but he did see the result. Nacho cheese and red bug juice flowing down the projection TV's screen. Zambrano pumped out push-ups with SSG Chin standing over him. What are you gonna do now, Zambrano? What are you gonna do? SGT Kimball, the lane grader, barked. Class Eero 202 was still on their final capstone field training exercise. Zambrano looked around while on one knee, trying to comprehend the tactical situation around him. Artillery simulators whistled and exploded forward of the student platoon's position, landing closer with every second the unit remained motionless. The cadre designed the tactical situation to be the first stress event of running a casualty extraction exercise, something interesting to test reactions on the way to the objective. After the training they received in basic and two weeks of similar scenarios on this FTX, the young platoon leader shouldn't have locked up like this. Gupta, SGT Kimball yelled to the assistant platoon leader after another 15 seconds of Zambrano's confusion. The platoon leader's dead. You're in charge now. What are you going to do? Bound right 100 meters, Mishka barked without hesitation. The platoon complied before the echo died. Once out of the artillery target area, Mishka Gupta briefed her squad leaders on what she wanted and got them moving again within seconds. The platoon reached their objective 10 minutes later and without further incident. The objective, a mock village, was deserted except for two casualties. Mishka set security, directed two of her medics to begin treatment and prepared to evacuate the casualties. A half hour later, the platoon sat in the after action review area at the end of the scenario's lane. They ate a quick lunch of MREs while SGT Kimball spoke to the OP4 soldiers. She turned back to the student soldier medics once the OP4 finished their initial brief. Nate Glasson, what did you see? The AAR took a contentious 20 minutes. The final consensus was the patrol wouldn't have accomplished what it did if Zambrano continued as squad leader. Zambrano argued loud and long that the rest of the platoon played favorites. He claimed they liked Mishka Gupta more than him. While this was true, it was also true that she was a better medic and leader than he. You just made the list, lady, Jeff muttered to Mishka while they marched back to the black area. List? I see your education is lacking. Not outdated is what I'd say instead, Terence muttered from behind him. Stripes is a culturally important movie. You two have probably never seen Caddyshack either. Jeff saw blank looks on both faces. Damn kids. You wanted to see me drill, Sergeant? Come on in, Knox. Dale Chin waved him to a chair. Have a seat. Nice job on the FTX. Your lane graders had good things to say about your performance. Not that it's a surprise that you did so well. Thank you, Drill Sergeant. I also wanted to let you know that your request for Special Operations Combat Medic Training has been approved, pending your successful completion of the Ranger Indoctrination Program. Thank you again. Yeah. You're probably looking at Soldier of the Cycle too, you know. Jeff blinked. Um, about that, Drill Sergeant? I'm not sure that would be fair to the other Soldier Medics. Why not? You've certainly earned it. Best PT scores of the cycle, best classroom scores of the cycle, best marksmanship, best skills evaluation. Are you seeing a pattern here? Drill Sergeant, I've been an EMT for more than 10 years. I've shot an M16 or M4 for over 15 years. I've worked out like a fiend since the time most of these kids were born. I don't think the others should be judged in comparison with me. I believe I should be excluded for the reasons I've listed. I'll have to consider your request, Knox, SSG Chin said while regarding his top student. In the meantime, 
Make sure your uniform is squared away for graduation Sunday. Don't forget, you'll no longer be 11 Bravo by then. You'll need to take off the infantry's blue cord and discs. Understood, Drill Sergeant. Dismissed. Jeff walked back into his room and found Terence checking his own Class A's. You just missed Zambrano, Terence commented. No, I didn't miss him at all, Jeff replied, which drew a laugh from his roommate. He was in here complaining about people not helping him while he's been at AIT. You can catch more flies with honey than vinegar. You'd think someone would have already told him that. You'd think. When are your folks getting here? Friday night. How about your family? Saturday afternoon. Cutting it a little close. Keiko's not on vacation until next week, the week of President's Day, so they won't leave home until Saturday morning. Our parents are coming down with her and the kids. I almost forgot to ask, what did the drill sergeant want? He wanted to tell me I'm headed to Benning next. So you got your RIP and SOCM slots? Well, the latter is dependent on the former. Ma'am, Sergeant Knox reports. At ease, Knox, Captain Mag Widhir said. Thank you, ma'am. Jeff shifted to a relaxed standing position. Sergeant Chin told me something interesting this morning, Sergeant Knox, she continued, gesturing over her left shoulder at Jeff's senior drill sergeant, who stood behind her. Yes, ma'am? Jeff knew what she'd been told, but he played along. He said you're a shoe-in for Soldier of the Cycle. I don't find that surprising having seen your records, but what I do find surprising is your request not to be considered for the award. You made such a request, did you not? Yes, ma'am, I did. May I ask why? Ma'am, if you've read my records, you've seen accounts of my performance at Basic, AIT, and Airborne School in 1987. I've had my turn. You've also likely heard that I've been an EMT or paramedic since late 1991, over 10 years now. I hold instructor credentials in the certifications paramedics are required to maintain in Massachusetts, and some optional ones. CPR, ACLS, PALS, PHTLS. I've been shooting half my life, and working out the way I do for two-thirds of my life. Respectfully, ma'am, I feel my fellow soldiers should be judged on an even playing field by eliminating me from it. Captain Mack stared at Jeff for a long full minute while tapping her pen on her desk blotter. The look on her face was unreadable. Sergeant Chin? She called in a soft voice, not taking her eyes off the soldier in front of her. Ma'am. Sergeant Knox is not to be considered for soldier of the cycle. Yes, ma'am. Knox, if any of your classmates find out about this discussion, you'll road march to your next post. Am I clear? Yes, ma'am. Crystal clear, ma'am. Terence was out Friday night having dinner with his parents, who flew in from California for graduation. Keiko, the kids, and both sets of grandparents would arrive around 1400 the next day, while Jeff and his class practiced for Sunday's ceremony. With any luck, both families would meet after that. Jeff checked the awards placement on his Class A blouse using a small metal ruler. He cast a critical eye over the seams and patches, looking for loose threads. The only items to catch his eye were the enlisted medical branch insignia on his left lapel replacing his infantry crossed rifles and the missing infantry blue cord and discs. He sensed a slight wrongness while he looked at the uniform due to that, but the feeling would fade in time. You bastard, Zambrano snarled from Jeff's doorway. Huh? I don't know about your parents, Zambrano, but mine are married, Jeff replied without turning. He was baiting Zambrano and he knew it. I should have had that Sokiam slot. In what fucking universe? He snorted while turning to face the door. You wouldn't make it through the first PT session. Frank Zambrano then did something stupid. He clenched his fists and advanced on Jeff. This'll be interesting. Jeff thought as he squared himself up to face Zambrano. The barracks rooms assigned to Charlie Company were small, about 20 feet by 15. Beds, closets, and desks further reduced that space. Jeff slapped Zambrano's punch aside and shoved him back out into the hallway. Zambrano braced himself to rush in again. He took one step before he jerked to a stop when someone grabbed him by the collar. And just what the holy hell do you think you're doing, Zambrano? Growled Dale Chin. You just bought yourself time in the stockade. Chin dragged Zambrano back into the hall. If trying to assault Jeff was stupid, taking a swing at the drill sergeant was insane. SSG Chin 
pinned Zambrano's arms behind his back and slammed him to the floor. Alti Nicholson and Ralph Pavlovich responded to the shouting. The two largest soldiers in the barracks, they helped SSG Chin frog march a still cursing and struggling Zambrano from the building. Jeff watched them leave. Winner, winner, big chicken dinner, came Terence's voice from behind Jeff. Actually, the penalty for assault on a superior NCO is a dishonorable discharge, not a bad conduct discharge, Jeff replied, correcting his roommate's theory on how Zambrano would now leave the army. Conviction would also come with forfeiture of all pay and allowances, and three years confinement, regardless of whether or not Zambrano connected with his swing. That's UCMJ Article 91. Why am I not surprised you know that? You seem to know everything else. Oh, there are plenty of things I don't know, Terence. Jeff laughed. They covered that in Biancock, which is why I know it. Jeff and Terence sat on their bunks. I was content to ignore him, but he wouldn't go that route. I'll admit I rubbed his nose in it during our first PT test, but he could have chosen to let it go after that. He didn't. As my mother is fond of saying, you are free to make your own choices. You are not free, however, from the consequences of your choices. That made me stop and think more than once as a kid. Don't forget is taking a swing at you, Sergeant Knox, SSG Chin said while walking back into their room. He waved Terence and Jeff back to their seats when they tried to rise. That's worth another year of confinement. I'm sure his lawyer will get the charge dismissed or reduced as part of a plea agreement, Drill Sergeant. Maybe so, but either way, he won't be here for graduation. Jeff walked to the bleachers where everyone's families had watched graduation moments before. With three small children, he and Keiko agreed it would be best for him to try and find them afterward. Once everyone else streamed off the metal structure to find their loved ones, finding his family wasn't difficult. Daddy, Alex, Ryan, and Sabrina shouted. Jeff managed to cradle all three in his arms to give them a big hug, and that done, he set them back down so he could kiss Keiko. Do you two need oxygen? Hiro asked when they broke their kiss. Keiko's mother swatted him. You're too American now, he protested. Where's my quiet little Japanese wife? Waiting for you to fall asleep, Mayumi responded with a smile. Why? Hiro asked. Mayumi kept smiling. Better sleep with one eye open, Hiro. Joe Knox suggested in a stage whisper. Won't do me any good. She's already peeved. Keiko and Jeff chuckled at their father's antics and the looks their mothers gave them. The kids gave their father a blow-by-blow -blow account of the flight down from Massachusetts. Were Dean and Steve your pilots again this time? Jeff asked. No, Jeffrey. They left the charter company at the end of last year. Our pilots were both new to the company. They let us into the pit, Daddy, Sabrina declared. There were all these switches and buttons. The cockpit, I'm guessing. They're a little young to be in a mosh pit. Yes, husband, Keiko chuckled. Is this your family, Jeff? Someone behind Jeff asked. He recognized the voice. Jeff spun around and went to parade rest. Yes, drill sergeant. At ease. You can cut that out now, Jeff. I'm not your drill sergeant because you're no longer my student and you're a sergeant yourself. Call me Dale. Jeff nodded and introduced everyone. It's true then. You're officially nuts if you left these folks to work for Uncle Sugar again. These folks questioned my sanity for years even before that, Dale. The ladies in his family pursed their lips and crossed their arms. You have that right, Jeffrey, Keiko said. Before anyone else could pile on, Terence Davis approached with two people who were clearly his parents. His father stood about 6'4 and wore a Marine Corps Service Alpha uniform with Sergeant Major stripes. Jeff guessed Terence's mother stood 5'9 without her heels and an easy 5'11 wearing them. At ease, Jeff called. Both he and Dale went to parade rest until Sergeant Major Davis told them to relax. He extended his large hand to them and then to Jeff's family. Alex, Ryan, and Sabrina stared up at the towering giant with wide eyes until he kneeled down and smiled at them. Hi, I'm Mr. Davis. You must be pretty proud of your dad, huh? The three nodded, still wide-eyed. You should be. He's been a big help to my son Terence. And to most of the rest of our company, Sergeant Major, someone new said. Mishka Gupta, Alti Nicholson, 
and the majority of the cycle's soldiers and their families walked up to the bleachers. You must be Keiko, Mishka said. She held out her hand to Jeff's wife. Your husband was a great help to all of us during our cycle. Mishka painfully pinched the back of Jeff's arm and dragged him away from the group while the others chatted with Jeff's family. Ow! Jeff whined before his friend stopped 20 paces away from the group. Just what the hell did you think you were doing? What are you talking about? You know damn well what I'm talking about, Jeff. There's no way I beat you out for Soldier of the Cycle. I may have been close, but that's about it. Mish, relax, it's no big deal. God damn it, Jeff, it's a huge deal. You're the soldier they should have honored. Mish, he sighed. Look, the long and the short of it is, I've had my turn. I was soldier of the cycle at my basic, at Infantry AIT, and again at Airborne School back in 1987. Do I really need it a fourth time? No, not here at least. I'll take honor grad at RIP and SOCM if I get that far, sure. But here, that award will help you get a start on your career, more than it'll help restart mine. Mishka's eyes narrowed. Fine. She sighed after a moment's pause. I still don't like it, even if I do see what you're saying. Just don't let Captain Mack catch wind of your suspicions, Mish. I don't feel like walking to Benning. Five days later, Jeff's Passat wagon powered up the on-ramp to Interstate 65 North in Chickasaw, Alabama. He and his passenger had just grabbed dinner from a fast food restaurant so they could keep driving. They did the same at lunch. They left San Antonio early that morning and they would reach Columbus, Georgia in another four hours or so. Are you sure you didn't want me to drive some more, Jeff? Donald O'Brien asked. No, Donald, I'm good, thanks. It's only another four or five hours till we hit Columbus. I'm used to a lot of time behind the wheel. Donald was a tough, wiry Irish lad from outside Chicago. He was also the only other medic from their cycle to earn a provisional SOCM slot. Airborne school and RIP would come first for him. Jeff hadn't gotten to know Donald much until late in AIT, because Donald had been stuck with Frank Zambrano as a roommate. Jeff spent the first eight hours of their ride together getting acquainted. Donald was a product of the Illinois child welfare system. His parents and younger sister were killed in a car accident the summer before his freshman year of high school. He skipped a church outing and wasn't with his family when a semi crushed their car. None of the rest of his family ever contacted him, and none offered to take the Chicago orphan into their home. The state of Illinois moved Donald out of Chicago for foster placement. Bitter and angry at the world, Donald could have spiraled into a short, crime-filled life, even in the suburbs. Two years of concerted effort by Donald's new high school guidance counselor and a state child psychologist prevented that. The angry young man was able to let go of most of his grief with their help. He released it through exercise and school sports. Sincere effort during his last two years of school didn't earn the grades needed for college, and by the time the real Donald emerged, his classmates had already labeled him that weird kid. He kept his guard up and shut others out. He didn't loosen up until two months of basic past. You mind if I change up the music a little? Jeff asked. It's your car, remember? Donald laughed. Jeff chuckled and activated his iPod. Donald listened for a moment. This sounds familiar. Who is it? Flock of seagulls. Who? A flock of seagulls. A synth pop at new wave band from the early 80s. The album this song's from came out around the end of seventh grade. I was 12. And I probably wasn't even born yet. Donald laughed again. I think my parents used to listen to this song. That's probably why I recognize it. Rub it in, youngster. Funny thing is, I didn't really like the song when it first aired. My tastes only ran to rock back then. Then why do you have it on your iPod? Nostalgia more than anything, I suppose. By the time I came to like the song I was in high school, which was a much better place for me than middle school. I remember the friendships I had then when I hear the song. When did you lose touch with your friends? Jeff stared out the windshield while he ground his teeth. Donald saw Jeff's jaw muscles working, so he waited him out. All of my friends from high school and I are still in contact. My best non-army friend from after I graduated, however, hasn't spoken to me since I decided to re-enlist in October. Donald frowned. What? Really? Really. 
I met Heather during a trip home for Christmas in 88. We considered ourselves brother and sister until I re-enlisted. I don't know what she considers me now. Jeff sighed. Donald could tell it bothered him. I've been in contact with Heather's mom, her grandparents, and even her husband since we reported in. But I haven't heard from her. Hell, she and TC named their son after me, but now she won't talk to me when I call the house. Damn, Donald breathed. Yeah. I thought it was tough not having anyone to contact, but... Geez. Donald never made much of a connection with his foster parents. You heard Keiko tell you to stay in touch, right? If you don't let her know how you're doing. Well, let's just say you won't like it if you don't. Jeff managed a wry smile. She was serious? No offense, Jeff, but I thought your wife was just being polite. Jeff looked over at his young passenger. Keiko wouldn't say that if she didn't mean it. She likes you, Donald. My whole family likes you. That's why we had you hang around with us this week, rather than sitting out two weeks at Benning before airborne school. You guys paid for my hotel room this week, didn't you? Figured that out, huh? Jeff grinned. And as far as not having anyone to contact, don't you think that guidance counselor of yours would like to hear how you're doing? I know you've told me you wouldn't piss on your family if they were on fire, but if you ever go back to the Chicago area, don't you think Ms. Gillis would be disappointed not to see or hear from you? You're right, Donald answered with a thoughtful look. She would be disappointed. I'll write her a letter tomorrow. Write the letter and we'll relax for the one day we'll have off before we report in. You'll get nights and weekends off after the training day at Airborne School. Me? I think I'm in for a four-week-long smoke session at RIP. Second of March, 2002. Cole Range, Fort Benning, Georgia. Jeff's arms shook while straining to hold his 50-pound rucksack over his head. The assigned task wouldn't be difficult on a regular day. But this wasn't a regular day. The cadre at the Ranger indoctrination program had driven the candidates hard for the 20 hours they'd been awake so far. The three days since Jeff's class arrived at Cole Range were sharp departures from the first week of RIP. Those first days ended at 1700. The candidates slept in barracks. But if the cadre here stuck to the pattern he'd seen over the last few days, Jeff's class wouldn't get to sleep until sometime after midnight, and then only for two or three hours at a simulated patrol base. Ten candidates dropped out after the first day. The original class of 116 candidates dwindled rapidly, more so when time at Cole Range began. Soon, just 59 remained. Why don't you just quit, old man? There's a nice warm fire over there. We've got burgers and dogs waiting for you, too. Through the screaming pain and numbing exhaustion, Jeff recognized SGT Biggs' voice, one of the RIP cadre, as he stood behind Jeff, out of view. SGT Biggs wasn't the only member of the cadre trying to plant the kernel of doubt in his mind. They targeted everyone, in that there was no discrimination. The RIP cadre's job was to weed out those who couldn't push past their limits. They delighted in telling candidates there was no quota. In fact, there were times when no candidates graduated from, from an RIP class. Jeff knew that the entire course was a giant mind game. They were testing him and his classmates. There was no way he was going to quit, however, no matter how inviting Biggs's questions sounded or how good the food smelled. Even as in shape as Jeff kept himself, the combination of three endless days of physical exertion, of expending more calories than he took in, was starting to chip away at him. His internal struggle, just the presence of the question whether or not to quit troubled his mind. Although the voice urging him to quit was faint, it was there. It nagged at him. After 204 count flutter kicks, the cadre released the class for their evening meal of MREs. The burgers were for the cadre and a nap. Jeff woke at 0530 the next morning, mostly rested. How you holding up, old man? Jeff's current ranger buddy, SGT Todd McNee, asked. Buddy assignments shifted to keep the pairs in alphabetical order after voluntary withdrawals and cadre drops. McNee entered RIP to rejoin the Rangers. He was part of 2D Battalion from 1996-2000. He too re-enlisted after the 9-11 attacks, but he refused to sign his contract until he was guaranteed another shot at the regiment. 
He and Jeff were the only two candidates with prior military service and the only two sergeants in their class. As the SEALs like to say, Todd, the only easy day was yesterday. We can only suck it up and drive on until they let us sleep again, Jeff muttered while they shaved. The morning and afternoon passed in another blur of PT and hitting the wood line, repeated half-mile sprints to the woods and back. Rip was to be endured to reach his final goal, a tan beret and a scroll-shaped ranger unit patch. The men in charge at RIP were those who'd been there and done that. Jeff once smelled the smoke and saw the elephant too, but not as a ranger. When he passed RAP, he was sure he'd be in the best shape of his life. That night, the instructors put Jeff's class through a new evolution, nightland navigation. He did well at land nav earlier in the week, despite being a decade out of practice. His skills returned with a quick review. Everything else so far at RIP was done with a buddy, but students were sent out for nightland nav alone and ordered not to speak to anyone. Jeff suspected the instructors would somehow try to confuse and test them while they searched for their waypoints. At the command to start, he shut out the distractions and concentrated on his task. He was acutely aware that hunger and fatigue caused careless mistakes. Being able to perform while hungry and tired was a necessary skill in the Rangers. All that mattered to Jeff was finding the waypoints on his card. Voices called out to him while he searched the forest for points. He ignored them. Jeff was the fifth or sixth person to finish, which earned him almost a half hour of rest. Todd McNee finished right behind him. They watched another six soldiers pull themselves out of the class. Jeff figured they decided that RIP wasn't for them, or perhaps they felt they'd committed some honor violation. Some of the candidates prepped their rucksacks and other equipment Friday morning for an eight-mile road march. These men hadn't kept pace with the RIP cadre on the six-mile road march the previous week. Four men dropped out before the march. Todd and Jeff had kept pace. They enjoyed another morning of sprints and upper body-focused PT at Cole Range instead. While the road march group trudged through their evolution, the RIP cadre surprised Jeff's group with a lunch of flame-broiled burgers, chips, and soda to celebrate completing their week at Cole Range. Men, SGT Big said while they ate, You've earned this little shindig by being in the first group on the road march last week, and by making it through this week. You're halfway through RIP, but you've still got critical evaluations ahead of you over the next two weeks. Don't slack off. After lunch, police up your things and get ready to move back to the barracks. Use any slack time to check your equipment. When the road march group gets back and they're squared away, we'll head back. Jeff and Todd weren't class leaders or subordinate leaders that day, but they were always expected to set an example as NCOs. They made sure their gear was squared away, helped the rest of the winner's group check theirs, and helped with the road march group's gear when they returned. Forty-five men boarded the bus back to the barracks. Then three more dropped out. The final week of March found Jeff enjoying early spring weather in central Massachusetts, a delayed fifth birthday party for the boys doubled as a welcome home party. Jeff would be home for one week before reporting back to Fort Benning. The 3D Ranger Battalion would be his new unit after they returned from their current deployment, and he completed the Special Operations Combat Medic course at Fort Bragg. Jeff's Combat Medic course wasn't scheduled to start until July 1st. His friend Donnell waited for his RIP class to start on April Fool's Day. Assuming Donnell graduated, they'd travel to Fayetteville together. The six-month SOCM course would finish by the end of the year. They'd complete a compressed version of paramedic school, along with extra training, and would complete clinical rotations at a level one trauma center. When finished, they'd have a knowledge base equivalent to that of a nurse practitioner or physician's assistant. Jeff experienced another moment of deja vu, standing on a porch in Greenwich, Massachusetts, during the middle of his week home. He visited with his friends Kathy and Jack earlier that morning before driving to this house after lunch. He tapped the brass knocker to announce himself, as he'd done here so many times before. He smiled at the person who answered the door. Hi, Jeff, Jane Donnelly said, wrapping her daughter's longtime best friend in a hug. Jane was first among his friends, who told him he was crazy to rejoin the army when he had a young family to look after. She'd been among the first, however, to also call and apologize. Hi, Mom, 
Jeff joked before kissing her on the cheek. Jane hugged him harder. He and Heather considered themselves siblings at one point, so they had called both mothers mom for a while. Jane still thought of him as him, her adopted son. Thanks, Jeff, Jane sniffed, wiping a tear from her eye. He kept an arm around the shorter blonde woman while she led him into the living room. There, a white-haired copy of Jane rose from the couch to hug him. Every time he saw Alice Cavanaugh, Jeff thought Jane and Heather owed their good looks to her. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Alice. You haven't aged since the day I first met you. I should hope not. I'm still 29. Hey, barked the other occupant of the couch. You muscling in on my girl, Airborne? That's Ranger now, Colonel, Jeff replied, shaking hands with Tom Cavanaugh. Congratulations, Jeff, but no more of that Colonel nonsense, okay? You're not that scared 19-year-old kid I found standing in my office anymore. Jeff first met Jane and Heather Donnelly in December 1988, when the former piloted his plane home from North Carolina. They then gave him a ride from Westover Air Force Base in Chicopee to his family's annual Christmas party in Dana. The ladies enjoyed four hours at the party, then invited him to dinner at this very house the following week. Once here, Jeff learned that Tom Cavanaugh was an army vet, a former commander of the Parachute Infantry Regiment he served in at the time. Between Tom and Alice, they nearly scared the crap out of him that night. Roger that, Colonel. Tom wagged a finger in warning. They shared small talk until Alice asked the question Jeff expected. Jeff, still no word from Heather? He sighed and shook his head. I'm afraid not, Alice. I have no idea what's wrong with that girl, Jane muttered. It is what it is, Jane. When she and I decided that we'd be better off as brother and sister rather than boyfriend and girlfriend, I told her I'd be her brother for as long as she'd have me. Maybe that's run its course? I can't force her to talk to me and I'm not going to her house to pound on the door. I'd like to be part of the Ranger Regiment for a little while before they toss me out for conduct unbecoming. What she's doing is wrong. She feels what I'm doing is wrong, Jane. That's her reality, whether we agree with it or not. If I push, what happens then? I don't see too many people afraid to speak their minds in this room, and I know the apple didn't fall far from the tree with her. I want my friend back as much as you want her to talk to me again, but it has to be her choice, Jane. Good morning, sir, the young woman at Brophy EMS said when the visitor stepped into the lobby. How may I help you? Is Sean Brophy in? Do you have an appointment with Mr. Brophy today? No, not today. I will have to see if he's available to meet with you in that case. If you'll give me your name, I'll see if he has time to see you, sir. Feel free to have a seat while I do so. Jeff nodded and sat where he waited for his first interview with Seamus Brophy in 1993. Like that day, he didn't have to wait long. Within a minute of the receptionist's call to his office, Sean burst into the lobby. Jeff rose to meet him. Sean ignored his outstretched hand and embraced his friend. Holy shit! Are they feeding you cement? Sean asked, squeezing Jeff's bicep. The workouts got a little intense during Ranger indoctrination. You think? Are you going to say hi to me, or just ignore me for the rest of your visit? A different voice asked. Jeff looked behind Sean to see another of his former partners, Shauna Lestrange, smiling at him. He hugged her too. I expected to find this misplaced southerner here, but this is an added bonus, Shauna. How have you been? Sean McNeil Brophy was born and raised in Clinton, North Carolina, and earned a business degree at Duke before moving to Boston. Before you guys start catching up, let's go to my office and let Terry have the lobby back. Those who worked in the Malden office before Jeff's departure for DMD two years ago sprang up to greet him as he walked through the office. Getting to Sean's private office took almost 20 minutes. So you're a ranger now? Sean asked once his door shut. Well, I've made it to the regiment, Sean. They say that it's harder to stay there. Like that'll be a problem, Sean snorted. I've still got probably a year of training before I make it to being an official ranger medic, Sean. I have to make it through both upcoming courses. Then I have to get up to speed to be a useful part of my unit. Once I get there, training is constant in the regiment, even more so now. I'll have to meet and maintain the standards. You're still not done with training? Sean asked. Does that add time to your enlistment? 
No, I signed a 4-4 contract, four years active duty and four years inactive reserve. I'm headed to my special operations combat medic course in July. That's six months of training. Ranger school after that is another two months of training. Depending on their class schedule, it could be close to a year before I'm finished and at my unit. The time spent training won't add time to my enlistment unless I have to repeat part of either course. I owe the regiment 26 months once I finish SOCM. Anyway, how are things here? Good, despite a gaping hole in one of our division's management team. Come on, Jeff replied. It can't be all that bad, can it? It's okay, Sean admitted. I'd be happier if you were still out and surely running things. Your team's taken up much of the slack out there, and Dad and I are about ready to name an interim operations manager. We forget how nice it is to have someone else looking after all the daily details, until they're not. I'm sure it'll be fine. Sean looked at his friend from across his desk. There are no guarantees in life, remember? Jeff's brief visit back to the civilian world ended before he got the chance to fall back into that life again. In a way, it was a blessing. He wouldn't have to re-acclimatize himself to the military like in October. His week was long enough, however, to let him catch up on the happenings around the country. Jeff learned the administration was trying to link other countries in the Middle East to the September 11th attacks, more specifically Iraq. Which is crap, he muttered to Keiko while they watched the news the night before he returned to Fort Benning. The Iraqis couldn't find their asses with two hands and a flashlight right now. They've only just poked their heads up after a decade-long civil war. There is no government of Iraq to have ties to Al-Qaeda or bin Laden. I do not see how they are drawing these conclusions either, Jeffrey. At least the president made the effort last year to distinguish between the terrorists and the typical followers of Islam. I don't think even the mullahs in Tehran would go so far as to side with those thugs. They may call us the Great Satan, but openly siding with terrorists would be beyond the pale. Keiko hugged Jeff harder. Your class will not finish until the end of the year? If the coursework doesn't kill me before then, it'll be the equivalent of half of medical school condensed into under a year, if you count the clinical rotations. Keiko shivered at the phrase, kill me. And then? She asked. Sorry he said in response to her shiver. Ranger school. That's another two months if it fits into 3D Battalion's combat rotations. I don't hold an infantry MOS any longer, but I am an NCO, so I think that means I'll go before I report to my company. I'll find out for sure when I get back to Georgia. Will you be allowed visitors during your medic course? That I should be at least while I'm in the classroom portion of the training. I hope to be able to stay in contact better than during RIP too. They sat in silence for a moment. Each day that passes brings you closer to the day you will go to war, Keiko whispered. I can't promise that I won't get hurt, Keiko, but the guys I'll be with are some of the best in the world at what they do. I'll be as safe as I can be in that environment. Keiko burrowed further into her husband's arms. Taking care of the kids and focusing on her class lesson plans helped keep her mind off where Jeff was headed. The quiet times were when the worries about the dangers he faced crept in. Keiko fell in love with Jeff the moment they met in his barracks room at Fort Bragg. Her brother Ken told his family how Jeff became his friend within days of reporting in and soon became his best friend. Then Ken's roommate and Keiko fell hard for each other the weekend she visited. At that point, Jeff still had two years to go on his enlistment. Keiko had just finished high school and would be at the University of Virginia until 1994. Years of separation, other relationships, and even Ken's death hadn't kept Keiko and Jeff from marrying in 1996, only two years after reconnecting. Jeff was Keiko's life partner in every way. She could no more imagine her life without him than life without the children. Wrangling three children under five years old by herself wasn't any fun, but having her parents next door made things so much easier. The children were showing themselves to be the product of their parents' guidance, love, and attentiveness, even at their young age. Keiko hoped his re-enlistment would not cause Jeff's influence to diminish. Keiko knew she came unhinged the day of the September 11th attacks. Her behavior that day still surprised and concerned her. Since her parents' safe return that dark day, she'd held herself together. 
The exception to that was when Jeff announced he would return to the army. Her friends and family knew Keiko as a tough, strong woman. While this was true, something she recently heard was also coming true. She's strong, but she's tired. She had no choice but to remain strong for her family, especially with her partner absent. She couldn't afford to let her fears and weaknesses show right now. Jeffrey, bless his heart, sees the strain I already feel, Keiko thought. He spent as much time as possible with her and the children while he was home. The little things he always did for her became even more apparent once he wasn't around to do them. To have them return with her husband gave Keiko a small measure of comfort. Despite all her fears, Keiko truly knew the man she fell in love with and married. She knew that he would re-enlist after 9-11. His desire to join the Rangers dated from high school and wasn't surprising. His drive to succeed, to be the best at whatever he attempted, propelled him to a senior management position in EMS by the time he turned 32. Now it motivated him to join one of the most elite and demanding special operations units in the army. Nothing would stand in his way. I know you will be careful, Jeffrey. I do not want you, however, to hold back during your training. I want you to kick ass. Keiko? He chuckled. That's not something you'd usually say. Normally you would say, I wish for you to expend maximum effort in your endeavors, or something like that. Keiko poked him in the ribs. Do not think for one moment that I will not give you a sound thrashing, Jeffrey. The men you are training to join are the best at what they do, but I will still kick your posterior. Jeff tickled his wife, drawing a rare giggle from her. It's good to hear you laugh, Keiko. I worry about you and the strain my decision's putting on you. I cannot say that this is not difficult, Keiko sighed, nor that it will not get more so, but I know the man I married. Jeffrey, we spoke of this in a limited way before you re-enlisted. You and I are in agreement in that we feel there is a significant threat to our nation, one that is more obvious than the long simmering Cold War. We are in agreement that we should confront that threat at its origin, not here at home. She sighed again. In good times and in bad, Jeffrey. Your strength continues to awe me, Keiko, but don't be afraid to ask for help. Our families, including our army family, are here to support you. The children and I have begun their introduction to karate here at home. We are on the mat every day after I pick them up from big steps. All three of them appear to enjoy it, particularly Sabrina. It helps us maintain our bond and focus. Sabrina, our little ninja, Jeff chuckled. What did you decide about the dojo? Regrettably, I decided to scale back on my teaching there. I will only teach the Saturday intermediate class for now. Is that Emily and Ben's class? Emily Deust started watching the children for them when the boys were six months old. She was the youngest daughter of their sensei. Ben Matson, another student at their dojo, was her boyfriend of over four years. Yes, husband, it is. I suppose I am playing favorites, but I seem to derive the most pleasure from teaching their class at the moment. I have enjoyed watching their growth through the years. Keiko wormed her way out of Jeff's arms and off the couch before pulling him to his feet. You are leaving in the morning. Let us go. Make some more memories. Memories crashed over Jeff while carrying his duffel bag into 3D Ranger Battalion headquarters to report in. For a brief second, he was 18 and reporting to the 80 Sodud Airborne. He saw another soldier approaching and reached out to hold the door open. The soldier jogged to the door. Thank you, the soldier said, stepping through. He saw the rank on Jeff's Class A sleeves and snapped to parade rest. Thank you, Sergeant. As you were, Specialist, Jeff replied. You're gonna hurt something snapping and popping like that. He grinned. He extended his hand. Jeff Knox. Good to meet you, Sergeant. I'm Specialist Benny Montoya, Company Clerk for Headquarters and Headquarters Company, 3D Ranger Battalion. Montoya saw the combat star on Jeff's jump wings and scanned his ribbons. Panama? Right. Jeff confirmed. Back when I was young, dumb, and full of, well, piss and vinegar. That's not how that saying usually goes, Sergeant. I've got three small kids at home, Jeff shrugged. I had to censor myself during my leave last week, and I haven't shaken the habit yet. Anyway, 
I'm here to report in. Well, let's head into the office and get you squared away then. Once in the battalion office, Montoya muttered while reading Jeff's file. You're here until 25 June, and then you're off to brag for SOCM. They'll get you trained up on part of your battalion duties while you're here, but the bulk of your training will come when you get back from Bragg. Am I looking at Ranger School at that point, too? As an NCO coming into the regiment, yes. The battalion just deployed. They'll be two months from rotating back from the stand by the time you return from SOCM. I'd guess you'll start Ranger School just before they return. We won't deploy again for at least another nine months after that, from what we hear, if not longer, so you'll have time to finish up. N N How'd you get stuck here while the rest of the battalion's on deployment? It was my turn, Montoya shrugged. I was on the battalion's deployment right after 9-11. It's all good. You gotta have someone here to keep the lights on, and there aren't many company clerks sporting a combat ranger scroll. Jeff's laughter joined Montoya's. The laughter stopped when a gruff, compact man limped into the office. Montoya snapped to parade rest again, and this time, Jeff followed suit. Good morning, Sergeant Major, called the company clerk. The older man grunted, but that was all. He unlocked his office, stepped in, and all but slammed the door behind him. Sergeant Major Springer, Montoya whispered. He's less than thrilled that he isn't overseas with the rest of the unit. Jeff nodded but didn't say anything. He knew too well how sensitive people's hearing could be at the worst possible times. Montoya showed him where things were, on a map of Fort Benning, and answered a few of his questions before a first lieutenant entered the office. He was the senior officer present in the battalion and the headquarters company, XO. The LT acknowledged Jeff's reporting in and cut him loose so he could head to the barracks and get squared away there. Jeff joined part of 3D Battalion's stateside presence for lunch at the nearby DFAC later. Benny Montoya handled introducing him around. So how'd it go over at regiment? Montoya asked. Well, with me here I can conduct battalion sick call. Jeff shrugged. At least until I leave for Bragg. Battalion? Snorted Rafael Rafe Figueroa, a wheeled vehicle mechanic. Platoon is more like it. It'll be good practice for when I get back here, Jeff shrugged again. I certainly didn't do that kind of work as a civilian paramedic. Not on a regular basis, that is. You were a medic before you joined? Asked Bert Norfolk, another member of the battalion's office staff. Jeff nodded while chewing his sandwich. I've been in EMS since I got out of the army in 91. And you came back? Yeah. Gave up an operations manager's position too. Some things are more important. He looked around before he lowered his voice. Now, what's the deal with the sergeant major? He caught three bullets in his right thigh about three months ago. One of them cracked the thigh bone just enough to keep him sidelined. Benny Montoya whispered back. He's been grumpy as a bear since he got back here. Babysitting those who don't deploy isn't high on the list of things he joined the Rangers for. It's a shame he's closed himself off too, because he's hands down the best gunfighter in the battalion and a role model to most of the enlisted soldiers. He used to be more outgoing and approachable. When does he need to be back up to speed? <laughs> he's got a little less than six months to get back in fighting trim, or he might be RFS'd. He's been in the regiment a long time, which is another reason why he's not very happy. He doesn't want to leave yet. Jeff searched his memory for the acronym Benny used. RFS? Released for... Standards? Right. I suppose it might technically be RFM released for medical, but it'll be the same either way. He'll be out of the regiment if he can't perform. If the battalion weren't deployed, he'd already be out. So they stuck him here instead of cutting him loose? Yeah, could be worse. Only two more weeks and I'll head to brag, Jeff thought to himself. I wonder how Donald's doing at RIP. 3D Battalion's area is across the vast expanse of Fort Benning, from where RIP is held. There is no contact with the regiment for the soldiers in the program. RIP graduation would be next week. Jeff wouldn't know if his friend would graduate until a few days before the ceremony. Jeff finished escoring himself away after breakfast and walked over to the battalion office, 
Benny asked him to stop by to finish up his paperwork for SOCM. His slot was guaranteed, but a couple of forms still needed filling out. Jeff rolled his eyes when thinking about spending time in the same office as Sergeant Major Springer. Everyone else in the battalion welcomed him three weeks ago. Even the LT made a point of greeting Jeff whenever he was in the office, but the senior enlisted man's attitude was noticeably colder than before. Jeff guessed the man's rehab was not progressing well. Hey, Sarge, Benny Montoya waved when Jeff stepped into the outer office. The younger man stepped away from his desk with a file in his hand, but the ringing phone made him walk back to it. Bert Norfolk wasn't in the office, so there wasn't anyone else to answer. Benny answered while looking at Jeff and waving the file at the sergeant major's office. Jeff caught Benny's question and nodded, carrying the file to SGM Springer's door. He raised his hand to knock on the doorframe, but froze before he could. SGM Springer sat at his desk sweating, white as a sheet, and slumped in his chair. Jeff darted into the office without hesitation. Feeling for a pulse in SGM Springer's wrist, he barely found one, and it felt irregular. The one in his neck was stronger, but not by much. Jeff noted the distended veins in Springer's neck. Both pulses seemed to weaken when Springer took a breath. Jeff hauled the older combat soldier out of his chair and laid him on the carpet. He tipped that chair over and draped the man's legs over it to keep them elevated. Chest pain? Jeff asked. Springer nodded with fear in his eyes. Show me. Point with one finger where it hurts. After the man pointed to the center of his chest, Jeff asked, How long? Springer held up five fingers. Minutes? Another nod this time. Any pain in your back? Between your shoulder blades or in that area? Yet another nod. Jeff saw the line in use indicator on the phone wink out. Benny! He bellowed. The younger man was in the office in less than a second. Call an ambulance for the sergeant major. Tell them it's a heart attack. Then run down to the office I've been working in and grab my bag, please. Jeff looked to the sergeant major, but still felt Benny in the room. He looked back. Benny, go! While Benny retrieved Jeff's medic bag, Jeff worked Springer's BDU shirt off. He folded it and placed it under the man's head. He looked around and spied a large rucksack next to the couch behind him. Sar Major, is there a poncho liner in your ruck? Jeff opened the ruck after another nod and pulled out the thin polyester-filled blanket. Benny returned to the room while Jeff dashed back to the Sergeant Major. Jeff tore open his medic bag after telling Benny to wrap the Sergeant Major in the blanket. He pulled Ivy Start equipment and a liter bag of fluid out of it after checking Springer's blood pressure and lung sounds. Benny hesitated. Sarge, he's sweating. He's sweating because his pressure's in the toilet. Where's that ambulance? Jeff asked while starting the IV. Once finished, he looked for the cardiac monitor, the one he didn't have. Damn it. Time for a wag. Bert Norfolk wandered into the office. There you guys are. Where's the ambulance headed? He asked while waving at the medics behind him. Over here. Jeff flicked the IV flow control wide open. Right-sided IMI he told the medics. Get him packaged up. I'm gonna call Martin. Jeff grabbed Benny and pulled him out to the main office. Can you get me the ER at Martin? Ask for either the charge nurse or the attending physician. I need to give one of them a report so they can have things ready for the sergeant major when we get there. Benny nodded. I Jeff returned to Springer's office knowing Benny would be a few minutes. Springer's poncho liner sat bundled on the desk chair. Jeff shook it out and draped it over his patient again. Bert made the same observation Benny had earlier. Guys, Jeff answered, he has all the signs of a right-sided inferior wall myocardial infarction, which includes low blood pressure and increased vagus nerve stimulation. Either of those can cause you to sweat, but the combination of the two sucks. Low blood pressure also means he can't get heat out to his extremities well, so the sergeant major needs to be kept warm by wrapping him in that wooby. I'm calling Martin to give them the heads up we're on our way. I'll meet you at the ambulance. I'm gonna wear a path in the carpet, Jeff thought while returning to Benny's desk again. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. He's right here. Benny handed Jeff the phone. Captain Withers, ER charge nurse, he whispered. Jeff nodded. Ma'am? 
What is so vitally important that you drag me out of my office and keep me waiting on the phone, Sergeant? An irritated voice asked. A 46-year-old male experiencing five minutes of increasing substernal chest pain, which radiates through to the right scapula, who has an irregular bradycardic pulse, is hypotensive, diaphoretic, nauseous, short of breath, and exhibits pulses paradoxus and JVD. My main differential diagnosis is inferior wall MI with right ventricular involvement. Stunned silence came from the other end of the line, which was broken a second later by a simple, oh. The captain at Martin Army Medical Center's ER repeated back most of what Jeff reported. He clarified a few points and hung up. On his way out of the office, he nearly bowled over the XO, one LT bridges. Sergeant, what's going on? Sergeant Major Springer's having a heart attack, sir. We're headed to Martin. With that explanation, Jeff was gone. Riding with the ambulance crew, Jeff slowed the drip rate of the IV to KVO, a slow rate designed to keep fluid moving and prevent clotting in the catheter. The half-liter fluid challenge seemed to work. Springer's blood pressure and color both improved. The 15-minute ride to the hospital allowed Jeff to gather the Sergeant Major's medical history. In a scene reminiscent of many he'd been part of over the years, Jeff gave his report to the ER staff while they began treating his patient. He made sure the staff knew the whole story of the event before stepping out of the treatment room. He ran into the medics who helped him in the hallway. <laughs> hey guys, sorry to take over your call like that, he said. Are you kidding, Sergeant? One of them asked, a specialist named Franks. It would have taken us two or three minutes on scene before we were up to speed on what was happening. Instead, the patient is already in a bed here getting treatment. You must see a lot of patients as a medic for the Rangers, huh? Jeff snorted in laughter. Fellas, how old are you guys? Both admitted they were under 20. I've been doing this since you were in grade school, since late 91, but the Sergeant Major's my first patient in the Army. Ever. Huh? I was an infantry soldier my first time in and re-enlisted after September 11th. I was a paramedic outside Boston for the 10 years I was out. I should just have business cards made up with my story printed on them, since I'm telling it so much lately. So that's how you knew what was wrong so fast? Well, partially, but it was mostly a wag. Until he went on the monitor here, I wasn't totally certain. Wag? A wild-ass guess. Franks laughed and held up Jeff's medic bag. We replaced the stuff you used and put it where your labels inside said it should go, but I'm sure you'll want to check that when you get a second. He glanced behind Jeff before he stiffened and called, Attention! Jeff spun around. A woman in army nursing white stood in the hallway behind him. Her nameplate read, Withers. Jeff sighed mentally. Oh joy, here comes my first Article 15. As you were, the captain said. Franks, Souza, give the sergeant and I a moment, would you? She asked without taking her eyes off Jeff. They muttered a yes ma'am before telling Jeff they would be outside with his bag. They left a vapor trail they left so fast. Sergeant Knox, Captain Withers said in a low voice. Your tone with me on the phone came dangerously close to insubordination. Yes ma'am. He had been a little short with her. It was also the exact tone necessary to focus my attention where it was needed, that being on your patient's condition and what he would require upon his arrival here. Because of that, the TPA he's already gotten was waiting for him to arrive rather than the other way around. The Sergeant Major's condition is already improving because he received fibrinolytics so quickly. Because of your initial assessment and treatment, he stands a very good chance of walking out of here. Well done, Sergeant. Thank you, ma'am. To June 2002, 1st Brigade Area, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. The sign needs a bit of work. Jeff looked at the faded sign announcing what building he was at. He leaned against his car, arms crossed, while staring across the area where his army career started in 1987. While it officially started with basic training back at Fort Benning, Jeff considered this place to be where his career really began. He watched maroon beret-covered soldiers wander in and out of the area, and remembered when he was one of them. Help you, sir? Someone asked from his right. Jeff glanced over to see an airborne first sergeant standing five feet away. Good afternoon, first sergeant, 
Jeff responded while pushing himself off the car to stand upright at a loose position of at ease. I was reminiscing about when I was assigned here. One SG Eberly glanced at Jeff's civilian clothes, which revealed nothing about who he was. His haircut was another matter. How long ago were you here? I left over a decade ago, Top, which blows my ever-loving mind. I barely shaved when I got here in 87. I think we all had that problem when we joined up. I'm Sean Eberly. Jeff Canucks. Good to meet you, Top. Which unit? First of the 504th back then. Alpha Company. From your beret flash, I see you're in 2D Battalion, 505th. Affirm, Charlie Company. Where are you stationed now? When I make it through SOCM, I'll be assigned to the 3D Ranger Battalion. I won't know which company until I get back there. Eberly's eyebrows rose. I hear that course is a cast iron bitch. You've been in as long as I have, but you're just getting into the Rangers now. There's the rub, Top. I started when you did, but got out after the Gulf. Jeff gave his story once again. Eberly's eyebrows rose higher. Man, you've got stones coming back in at our age. You've obviously made it through the Rangers selection process or they wouldn't have sent you here. I've got stones or rocks in the head, Jeff said, shrugging. One of the two. When does your course start? Tomorrow. Well, best of luck. Thanks, Top. Have a good one. Later that evening, Jeff and Donald sampled the food at a pub-style restaurant recommended by the soldier working the desk of their VEQ. Jeff hadn't heard of the place before. It hadn't been around when he was stationed at Bragg after high school. Not bad, Donald commented while gnawing on a rib. I've certainly eaten worse, Jeff agreed. Jeff sipped on a beer which he found a bit too heavy for the meal he ordered, but it was still good and he'd PT it off in the morning. He'd switch to water once he finished it. A ringing endorsement. You'd be surprised how difficult it is to make good food for as many people as this place probably sees in a day. They're doing okay. There's a similar kind of place not too far from where I grew up which has the best pub food I've had yet. They brewed their own beers there too, which were out fucking standing based on the sampler I tried. Go there a lot? Only once years ago. I kinda left before they could throw me out. They're still in business, but I've never gone back. You got thrown out of a bar? Technically, no. Like I said, I left first. Some jerk at the table behind me was bad-mouthing a friend of mine, calling her a bimbo and an easy lay. She's a great girl and was my girlfriend during our senior year of high school. I took exception and expressed my displeasure in regards to his behavior and language. Donald's eyebrow rose. I tipped him over backward in his chair, slammed him to the ground, and scared the piss out of him. Jeff took another sip of his beer. Scared the shit out of him, too, come to think of it. I left not long after that. I can't picture you doing that, Donald said, shaking his head. I mean, we're going to be rangers, and I know you're a black belt and all, but still. I know. I give off such a I'm a lover, not a fighter vibe, it's hard to believe. Donald snorted. What do you think about this course we're starting tomorrow? It's gonna be a brain buster. From what I understand, the anatomy and physiology class we took at Columbus State University during pre-SOCM will help some, but it'll still be tough and far beyond what I know as a paramedic. Remember everything we've heard tells us, we're going to need to manage our free time carefully, split it between keeping up with our PT and our studying. No nightly binges. Donald gave him a look. Jeff held up his hands. I'm just saying. You young kids, first time away from home. Hey. hey, where did your walker go? Did you leave it in the bathroom? Donald rejoined. Good one. Now seriously, since they've assigned us adjacent rooms in the VQ, I think we should be each other's ranger buddy while we're here, to help each other study, to stay motivated, and to do our PT. From what I hear, any SEALs in our class will absolutely kick our asses when it comes to being in shape, but there's no reason we can't stand tall and represent as you kids say. Our minimum standard should be to score 300 on our PT tests. Donald nodded while taking a sip of his sweet tea. He was still underage and didn't like soda. I think you're right. They keep telling us the attrition rate for this class is close to 50%. I'd rather be in the 50% that stays. Good plan. Have you called Sarah Gillis since we got here? Yeah, once I unpacked. I want to thank you for telling me to keep in touch with her. She's starting to feel like my big sister now. 
It's nice to have something like family again. Jeff stared wistfully at the far wall, thinking of Heather once more. Move on, Jeff. Remember, it is what it is. Donald and Jeff started their new routine Monday morning before the first SOCM accountability formation. They woke at 0400 and hit the track near the VQ. Jeff introduced Donald to his normal workout, which pushed the limits of the younger man's endurance, even though he was already scoring 300 on PT tests. He cautioned Donald, don't let me lap you, before they started their six mile run. They completed their final lap with Jeff chasing Donald while yelling like a hellhound. Showered, shaved, and in the correct uniform before heading to breakfast, the two avoided carbs there as much as possible. The last thing they needed was to nod off on the first day of the course. SOCM cadre allocated the first day to the admin minute that goes with any multi-day class. Donald and Jeff met their Ranger liaison, most of their classmates, and received their mountains of reading material. Sukiem is required for medics from all branches who wish to work with special operations forces. Some SOF medics add more courses. Some have lengthier time and service requirements before attending than ranger medics, but all are deadly serious about keeping their charges alive. Looking around the room, Jeff didn't see many smiles in evidence. The most dangerous part of the course for Jeff would be the beginning, the basic EMT training, which makes up most of block one. As far as he could tell, he was the only one in the class who'd been a civilian EMT and the only one who'd have to unlearn civilian habits. Ranger medics who took the class in years past often passed along their observations from training. For this block, almost all the advice he heard was to drill yourself every chance you got to be ready for the tests. The cadre also wanted to see good critical thinking skills more than rote memorization. A face from class appeared in Jeff's VQ doorway later that night. Its owner knocked. Hey there, Jeff offered while placing items on his desk. He walked over to the door. Hey, I'm your neighbor to your right, Sean Stevens. Jeff Knox, good to meet you officially, Sean. Which branch? Navy. Seal Corman? Stevens nodded. So this is only the first of a couple stops for you then? Bud S and SQT were my first stops, but... Yes, I've got another 24-week medical class looming after this. You? Aiming for Army Ranger Medic, so this is the only medical class I'll need before I get back to the regiment. I'll be going to Ranger School once there. Not first. I guess I'm confused about how your training goes before you can deploy. Normally, someone enlisting on a Ranger Medic contract, what the Army calls an Option 40 contract, would do basic training, Medic AIT, Airborne School, Ranger indoctrination, then come here to SOCM. This is the last step of the journey for most. I'm prior service, so I did medic AIT and RIP before coming here. Ranger school is required for NCOs and officers in the regiment. You're an NCO then? Sergeant E5? Jeff confirmed. That equates to what? Hospitalman second class? Right. That's my rate and rating. Well, my buddy and I are going to try and keep up with you SEAL types on the PT, though I'm sure you're well out front in that regard. How goes the course so far, my husband? Jeff laughed a mirthless laugh. This phone call may be the only time I'm not studying or doing PT all week. I've heard about how difficult this class would be, but I'm glad I've already adjusted my routine. We're going to be going full speed until our clinical rotations. I am sure you will do well, as always. How many others are in your class? About 70 or 75. This course has folks from almost every branch too, which never happened at any other military training I attended. Also, I don't think I've seen more than a handful of smiles since the class started. Almost every branch? The Marines don't have a medical branch. They borrow folks from the Navy. What about receiving visitors? Weekends would be easier than during the week, obviously. Maybe Columbus Day weekend? That'll be toward the end of Trauma 2, traditionally the hardest block, but I'd like to see you guys. A long weekend will be easier too. Labor Day's too close the start of your school year. We'll be evaluated multiple times over the length of this course, so I'll have a good handle on how I'm doing and what the potential for visiting is like before then. Remember what I said to you earlier, Jeffrey. 
kick ass. Jeff made one other phone call during a weekday lunch break, despite what he told Keiko over the weekend. <laughs> American Association for EMS, how may I direct your call? Barry Silverman, please. Jeff Knox calling. One moment, sir. Hey, Jeff, how's it going? Barry Silverman was the AAFM's vice president for education and recertification. Barry acted as the point person for figuring out how to credit a military medic's education to help them maintain their certifications. He took personal interest in the subject. Hey, Barry, this course has been full throttle since day one, that's for sure. Well, just worry about the course. Your current research cycle is all set thanks to your work at Medic AIT. Your 2003 to 2006 research will be credited as complete as soon as you finish the SOCM course. When you pass the course, you'll get an AFEMS Medic card which reads, expires June 30th, 2006, about three weeks after we get your paperwork. Any advanced tactical provider refresher course you take while you're still in will count as your continuing education and refresher for whatever research cycle you're in as well. Wow, you're kidding. Not at all, Jeff. You worked hard helping to get the bridge program for Army medics off the ground, and you're putting your ass on the line for our country, so I thought the least we could do is to return the favor. We're about ready to add the 91B to paramedic bridge class to the post-Army classes we sponsor. We're going to work on making all the bridge classes applicable to folks from other services as well. That was quick. Eh, it makes sense. <laughs> Last time we spoke, I only asked what I would need to do to keep my certification active while I'm in. I appreciate your hard work on this. There wasn't much to it, honestly. Pretty cut and dried from our end since we already have a relationship with the Army Medical Department. My next big project will be to see if we can get the Paramedic Specialty Certification Board to allow a SOCM Advanced Tactical Practitioner to transition to their certified paramedic tactical. That'll be a bigger challenge since they don't yet have a relationship with a med. Yeah, they aren't part of AFEM, so I can see how that's going to be a tough sell. Still, it'd be one more way to provide an easier transition to the civilian world for these folks. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? I seem to remember telling someone that once. Good thing I listened to you then, huh? I guess so. I don't think it violates OPSEC to tell you this, but the way they test on EMT stuff here is a ball buster. OPSEC. Operational security. They make sure you know the material, but they also make sure you know how to think critically, too. Never a bad thing in our line of work. I'd imagine it's really important the way you'll need to do things downrange, as you've called it. Jeff followed other advice he picked up and skipped lunch after the first week of SOCM. A mile and a half long running trail next to the schoolhouse provided a chance to recharge in the middle of the day. Jeff found that if he sprinted most of it, he could finish two laps. He still had time for a shower and a granola bar before class started up in the afternoon. The tree-shaded trail kept the blazing North Carolina summer sun off of him too. Freshly showered, he munched on his lunch while walking back to the schoolhouse. Food wasn't allowed in the classroom though water was. Jeff dropped the bar's wrapper in the trash and took his seat. Thank God they sent us to Columbus State for that A&P class. I'd be totally lost right now otherwise, Donald said with his Block II Anatomy and Physiology books and flashcards spread out in front of him. There was a similar pile in front of Jeff. I doubt you'd be as lost as you think you'd be, Donald. You're a smart kid. Thanks, but this stuff's still got my head spinning. Mine too. You're not alone, don't worry there. A lot of this stuff is far beyond what I covered in paramedic school. Suck it up and drive on, right? Right, so the cranial nerves? Can we go over them again? They still had five minutes before class restarted. Sure, count them off. Okay, the 12 cranial nerves, one olfactory, two optic, three oculomotor, four, uh, four. Oh, 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 to touch and feel a good vagina and hymen. What? A mnemonic we used in paramedic school to help us remember their names in order. Oh, 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 to touch and feel a good vagina and hymen. Olfactory, optic, oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens, facial, auditory, glossopharyngeal, vagus, accessory, hypoglossal. The auditory nerve is now called the vestibulocochlear nerve, so one new mnemonic is oh, 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 to touch and feel virgin girls, vaginas and hymens. Donald stared at his study partner. 
Hey, what do I always say about if it's stupid, but it works? Then it's not stupid. Yeah, okay, I guess you're right. You don't get off that easy, kid. What did the nerves innervate? Geez, you're a bastard, you know that. Like I told your roommate at Fort Sam, my parents are married. Let's go, tell me what they innervate. Okay. Donald sighed. The olfactory is a sensory nerve which conducts the sense of smell from the nose to the brain. The optic... Jeff made sure Donald had the cranial nerves down before they moved on to the next topic. They alternated quizzing and being quizzed each day. They changed up the subjects when necessary. Their study methods proved successful for them to this point, as both were still in the course. Seven of the original 76 members of their class couldn't say that. Are you okay, husband? Hmm. Yeah, Keiko. Why? You seem distracted tonight. Sorry, Keiko, the course is getting pretty intense. More so than before? Believe it or not, yeah. <laughs> How are you and your young charge handling it, husband? We're doing okay at the moment, Keiko. I finally convinced Donald to join me on my noontime runs. The runnings helped me keep my head clear, along with keeping me awake in the afternoons because I haven't filled up at lunch. At the most, I have the time for a power bar, or something like it before class restarts for the afternoon. It sounds as if you need to change your routine again, Jeffrey, to help you stay loose as you are wont to say. Yeah, I think I might. It feels like I've had my nose in my books for months, even though I do extra PT when I can also. So, what are you going to do? During Jeff's brief forays off post, he found that precious few of his once favorite places were still present in Fayetteville. Most of the restaurants he'd once frequented had closed in the 10 years since he left, or their reputations declined so badly that he wasn't interested in returning to them he discovered one favorite recreation center where he once spent many hours was still open and thriving, however. He stepped up to the outdoor service window and picked up a batting helmet, which fit his head. The bats were different models of the same brands he remembered from high school, so he chose one at random. Jeff walked through the clouds of go-kart exhaust to reach the batting cages. He recalled hosting friends here and the fun they had. He stepped into a cage marked for 50 mile per hour pitches since he hadn't swung at a baseball in well over a decade. Jeff's first few cuts at the pitches revealed his rusty swing. He didn't even make contact. He stepped out of the batter's box and let a few balls sail by while he thought about the mechanics of his swing. His next practice swings felt better than the swings he took a few moments earlier. Satisfied that he remembered those hitting mechanics, he stepped back up to the plate. The baseball shot back toward the pitching machine on a line. It ricocheted off the protective screen in front of it. Jeff settled into a rhythm just before his dollar ran out. The lack of a pitch confused him for a second before he realized what happened. He walked back to the coin-operated timer and dropped in another four quarters. He laced the majority of the next set of pitches back as line drives. Jeff felt his swing smoothing out with each repetition. When the second dollar ran out, Jeff moved to a faster cage. After a few pop-ups and grounders, he returned the faster pitches in the same manner as the ones in the first cage. You were getting in some good cuts there, a man on the other side of the screen commented when Jeff went to add more money. Thanks. Did you want to get in here? I was going to add more money, but I'll hold off if you're waiting for a turn. No, I'm good, thanks. There's two other cages at this speed that aren't being used. You've got a real sweet swing. I'm guessing you played in high school? Maybe college? Jeff chuckled, stepping out of the cage. High school, yes. College, no. Some folks gave me a look during my junior and senior years of high school back home, but I opted to do some postgraduate work at the Fayetteville Institute for Vertical Envelopment. Up the road a piece. The other man laughed. Haven't heard that one before. Jack Spiker. Jeff Knox. There was a man who ran this place back when I was here in the late 80s and early 90s whose name was Amos Spiker. Any relation? Dad, Jack smiled. He should be in by now. You want to see if he is or take some more swings first? Jeff twisted his torso, working out a kink in his back from the now unfamiliar swing movements. Why don't we see if he's here first? Donald sat down next to Jeff while he and Sean Stevens reviewed their TMFs, Tactical Medical Emergency Protocols, at the end of another lunch break. 
Jeff watched the young man open an energy drink and fire it down before throwing the can away. What? Donnell asked. You've read the labels on those things, right? You've seen how much sugar they put in them, right? I'm trying to make sure I don't fall asleep. When you come off that sugar rush, your head's going to leave a dent in the table. Donald gave him a look while Sean chuckled. All I'm saying is you're not going to like it when I put my elbow in your ribs to wake you up. You'll be standing against the wall to stay awake for most of the afternoon. Mark my words. Five bucks says you're wrong. It's your money, kid, Jeff shrugged. You know what I've heard about clinical medicine? Donald shook his head. You know how we'll practice the physical exams we'll learn about in the A&P block? Yeah. You've heard how in-depth those practice exams get, right? Donald's eyes narrowed. No. We'll introduce each other to the old wizard finger soon. The what? The wizard finger. Jeff got a blank look from Donald. Finger of doom? Blanker. The first half of a dirty Sanchez? No. How am I more hip than you? Jeff shook his head and sighed. Sean looked pale. A digital rectal exam. It's used to check anal tone for evidence of neurological injury, to check the prostate, the appendix, for occult blood. Lots of things. It's part of the physical. The narrowed eyes widened. You're shitting me. Poor choice of words, Donald, Jeff chuckled. Anyway, there will be a lot of good information in this block, too. We're going to learn even more about all the major body systems. Cardiovascular, pulmonary, immune, GUGI, endocrine. You name them, we're going to learn more about them than at CSU. Donald rubbed his face. You thought they were kidding? Remember, it gets harder. You're going to want to stay awake. I'll stay awake just fine, old man, snorted Donald. Donald wasn't snorting when he handed Jeff $5 later that night. The change to Jeff's PT routine... Adding in time at the batting cages helped him remain on an even keel. He had played baseball for over a decade, from ages 5 to 17, and he missed it. He moved up to the 80-mile-per-hour cage two months before today's visit. Jeff found his groove there faster than expected. The mid-80s weather in the middle of September helped, too. Jeff toyed with the idea of moving to the 90-mile-per-hour cage soon. Today, when he approached the cages, a large group of high school-aged boys blocked the way, goofing around in front of the one he wanted to use. Excuse me, gentlemen, Jeff called. Are you waiting for this cage? What's it to you, Yankee? One of the youths laughed, not moving. If none of you are going to use it, I'd like to get in there. You're going to break a hip, mister, another shouted. You're too old to hit anything, a third boy yelled. Twenty bucks says you won't get wood on even one pitch. You're covered, Jeff responded. That quieted the crowd. Anyone else? No. Mr. Amos has an ATM in the building there. I got the money in the unlikely event you win the bet. When no one else spoke up, Jeff shrugged, squeezed through the throng, and entered the cage. Jeff didn't just get wood on a pitch. His weeks of practice allowed him to recover his hitter's eye. He crushed every pitch, 20 baseballs shot to the screen above and behind the pitching machine before it clicked off. Jeff turned back to the cage's gate, twirling his bat like he once saw the Yankees' Mickey Rivers do growing up. Got my 20 bucks? Jeff asked the youth who bet against him. The teenager looked around nervously. I ain't paying you, he blustered. Y'all are probably some kind of professional baseball player. Me? Jeff snorted. I'm in the army. You gonna pay up, boy? Jeff saw the youngster hesitate again. Gee, what a surprise. You'd have been all up in my shit if I fanned on those pitches yet you find it perfectly acceptable to Welsh on your end of the deal. The others started to crowd around Jeff and the boy. Touching me will constitute battery, gentlemen. I can assure you that you don't want to go that route. And I'll swear on a stack of Bibles all y'all started the whole thing too, someone new yelled. That someone pushed himself off the tree he leaned against and approached the crowd. Get the hell off my property, now. We're paying customers. Ah, uh, a jailhouse lawyer. Management reserves the right to refuse service. Didn't you boys read that sign? It'd be a powerful shame if your car suddenly developed some expensive damage, wouldn't it? It'll be you paying for it, old man. Don't know why I bother hanging any of those damn things, the man muttered to himself. Guess you boys didn't see the one that reads management not responsible for loss neither, huh? The man lifted the axe handle he carried to his shoulder. 
Might be a good time for all y'all to run along home. The group of teenagers scattered. Mr. Amos, don't be getting yourself in trouble on my account. Jeff told the man who helped him out. Shit, son, I spoke all hypothetical-like, never said I would do any of that. Though it was implied, Jeff said, grinning. Well, if that's what them boys inferred, then so be it, Amos guffawed. Damn, son, y'all were tattooing them pitches just now. Amos called everyone son, unless they were female. Then it was Missy. Like I said when I started coming here regularly weeks ago, Mr. Amos, I just get in this zone when I hit. Jeff shrugged. Believe it or not, it helps me clear my head. Got a lot going on, do you? Trying to be a medic in the Rangers, Jeff snorted. I think my head's gonna explode some days after my classes. We're about to start the part of the class where it gets really intense. Can't wait. Your family helping you stay relaxed? I talk to my wife and kids most nights, but it's hard not being around them. They're still home in Massachusetts. Before I re-enlisted, there were plenty of days where I got to stay home with my kids, especially when they were real little. How old are your little ones? Our boys are five and a half, our little girls four. Jeff looked away. Our oldest, Alex, has a better handle on why I'm not home, but our other two still don't quite get why I won't be home until after Christmas. From what I hear, that class of yours keeps you bouncing all over the place till you're done. The road I'm on will, yes, sir, since I've been back in, I've already been at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Fort Benning, and here. Once I'm done, it's back to Benning before Ranger School. Ranger School will have me at Benning, Northern Georgia and the Florida Panhandle before I finish. I'll be stationed at Benning when I'm finally done. I can see why y'all didn't want your family to come down with you then. Oh, I wanted them to, Mr. Amos. It just didn't make sense. They'll be visiting over Columbus Day weekend. Amos nodded. Well, make sure you bring them by. Y'all gonna take some more swings? No, I think I'm done. Those kids kind of took the fun out of hitting for today. In that case, let me buy you a cold one. I still got that grape soda y'all liked all them years ago. Okay, so remember you want to have the bevel up on the catheter when you insert it. You want it at about a 30 degree angle when you pierce the skin. Jeff watched Donald make an IV attempt on an IV training arm the weekend before their fourth training block, Trauma Wine. This was Donald's first practice IV attempt in months. An early start on retraining the younger man's muscle memory wouldn't hurt. The trauma I cadre quizzed Jeff heavily when he asked to help Donald get some early practice. They came to understand Jeff would allow his fellow student to make all the common mistakes during that practice. Medic AIT covered the subject of starting IVs, but that was a while ago now and wasn't an ingrained skill for Donald like it was for Jeff. Jeff admitted that he needed some practice too, since he hadn't started a live IV in well over a year. Donald did well with preparing for his first stick. He avoided contaminating the IV site after he cleaned it and remembered to have his equipment ready before puncturing the skin. Jeff covered his smile with his hand. He saw Donald forget to occlude the vein before releasing the tourniquet and removing the IV catheter from its hub. The look of accomplishment disappeared from Donald's face when the simulated blood began pouring out of the IV. He didn't know where to put his hands first, so he tried to grab a towel, replace the tourniquet, and occlude the IV site all at the same time. Jeff reached over and calmly clamped the line supplying the blood to the training arm. With his other hand, he handed Donald a towel. And that's why it's good to have a mental checklist of things to do before you remove the catheter from the IV hub, Grasshopper. Donald frowned while mopping up the blood. You're no help. Do you want to know how many times I did the same thing when I was in medic school? Or will that depress you too much? Still no help. <laughs> so you're not going to laugh if I mention you're supposed to fix the trauma and not cause more of it. Do I get to cause trauma to you? I might laugh in that case. Seriously, Donald, your technique was fine up until the point where you disconnected the catheter. It just takes practice until the entire sequence becomes second nature. You likely purged the skill from your memory during airborne school in RIP. We'll finish cleaning up, and we'll try again. While we're cleaning up, maybe you can explain to me how advanced cardiac life support is part of a trauma block. 
because you'll be banging your head off your desk trying to understand it. Donald gave him another of his patented looks. I'm serious. Until you have your aha moment cardiology and ACLS seem like total mysteries, not to mention the pharmacology that goes along with them. Are you trying to raise my blood pressure? You're the one who asked. The week before Columbus Day weekend brought stormy weather, although Jeff didn't care in the slightest. His family arrived that Saturday morning. They almost flattened him when all four tried to tackle him at the same time. I have missed you, husband, Keiko whispered while clutching her husband's arm. The kids clung to his legs. Jeff made them laugh by walking anyway and carrying them along. Really? How much? He asked, leering at his wife. Exactly that much, Jeffrey. Oh, baby, talk dirty to me. Jeffrey, Keiko hissed, wearing a smile. We must wait until the children go to bed. You started it. We're going to lock the door to the adjoining room, right? If you persist, you will be on the other side of that locked door and the children will be with me, Jeffrey. Geez, you're no fun during the school year, Keiko. I think you need a vacation already. School has only been in session for a month. And here I am, offering you a proven method of stress relief and relaxation, and you're rejecting it. Keiko rolled her eyes. Jeffrey smiled. He missed every expression his wife's face made. I've missed seeing you do that, among other things, he whispered in her ear. It was rare for Keiko to blush. More rain marred the family weekend on Sunday. Still, Jeff made sure his kids had fun while they splashed together in the hotel's indoor pool. Keiko cringed, watching how far into the deep end he threw them. The fact they all surfaced laughing mollified her only slightly. Jeff's family visited Amos' amusements on Monday, Columbus Day. The kids were too young for most of the activities there, but the mini-golf was perfect for them. Despite the size of the putter compared to Sabrina's height, she proved to be the best of the three kids. Over lunch in the attached restaurant, Mr. Amos kept Jeff's family giggling by alternating back and forth between his Carolina accent and the unaccented voice with perfect diction Keiko used. Mr. Amos, you've been shining me on all this time, Jeff asked. Heck, son, I got me one of them highfalutin English degrees from North Carolina back in 67. Talked all fancy back then, too, mostly to annoy my pappy. I bought into the hippie culture back while I was at UNC then, again, mainly to hurt my folks. Pappy had a heart attack just after I graduated. Marcy and me, we already had Jackie even though we weren't hitched, but we dropped everything and came here when Ma called us. We made sure stuff got done so Ma could take care of Pappy. I made sure I spent time with him too. Back then there wasn't any such thing as cardiac rehab. It was all just lying around in bed hoping you'd get stronger. Sitting with him, I got to catch up on all them talks Pappy wanted to have with me before I started ignoring him. Jackie got to know his grandpappy too. He don't remember too much because he was so young, but he remembers enough. Pappy always said he wasn't an educated kind of man, but he had a damn lot of common sense. Didn't take any guff either. He'd look right at you and call you a damn fool if you were acting like one. Because of our talks, I started learning everything I could. I thought might help me out later on. I knew I wasn't going to be teaching English class. No offense, Ms. Kiko. So I learned what I could before I opened this place in 77. Pappy was gone by then. Ma too. But up until a few years ago, I did most of the maintaining of things around here myself thanks to the talks Pappy and I were able to have when I came home. He's why I talk like I do, son, cause he talked the same way and it helps me remember him. Now it's just comfortable. Folks expect me to talk like this now. He winked at Keiko. I'll save my erudite speech of fine for when you bring your lovely bride a visit in. I don't know about this block, Jeff, Donald said after a day of training in late October. Jeff saw the stress his young friend suffered under the past few weeks. He was treating Donald to a meal at a mom-and-pop barbecue place, about a half hour from the base to relax him and to get him away from the books. Donald, like I keep telling you, you're a smart kid. You'll get through trauma too and before you know it, we'll be off to our clinical rotations. Donald grimaced as if he didn't agree before he took another drink of lemonade. Jeff, Donald C. Head, you know I just made it through TPA by the narrowest of margins. CTM is gonna kill me. Trauma patient assessment and combat trauma management make up the two hardest modules at SOCM. 
One out of every five students who make it to CTM fail out or recycle. Deep breath, Donald. Just remember what the green beanies say. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Donald didn't look like that advice gave him much comfort. Jeff's confidence in his skills came from many years of performing them. He realized he missed working on the ambulance and using his skills despite the emotional toll of the calls he'd been on. He was looking forward to the clinical rotations and interacting with patients again. Though Donald did well at AIT, he still harbored enough doubt in himself that it affected his performance. He couldn't meet the time requirements in a few of the training scenarios, and the mounting pressure made it worse. Jeff could see him falling behind despite his efforts to help the young man. During the first week of November, Donald trudged back into the VEQ one evening. He looked like someone just shot his dog. Donald, you all right? The younger man regarded Jeff with a haunted look in his eyes. I have to meet with the review board on Friday. Have you told McNulty? SSG Todd McNulty was the ranger liaison at SOCM. Not yet. Come on, Jeff said while spinning his friend around. Let's go see if he's in his room at the BQ. Friday the 8th saw Jeff jogging over to the building where the review board met during his lunch break. Donald's meeting started at 1100, and the door to the meeting room was still shut at 12.05 when Jeff reached it. There was nothing to do but sit and wait. At 12.30, the door opened. Donald walked out with his head down. Todd McNulty's hand rested on his shoulder in support. Jeff's heart broke for the friend who already experienced so much adversity in his young life. Donald looked up. Recycle, he said. Jeff let out the breath he held in one long exhalation. He worried Donald would get washed out of the course by the cadre. Like I told Donald already, Jeff, Todd McNulty said. The cadre saw the effort he's been putting in, both in the classroom and with his PT. Most of the meeting was an oral review to see how much he retained. They came to their decision pretty quickly after talking to him. Jeff nodded. While I was waiting, I started to worry they might think he'd been using me as a crutch or something. They mentioned that, Donald replied. I told them how our study sessions have been structured since we got here in July, and how we alternate roles. I knew why they were questioning me the way they were, and surprisingly, I didn't let myself get too worried. I know I know the material. I just needed to show them I can do the job when I restart CTM with the next class in a couple months. I'll pass this time, no sweat. You'd better, Donald, otherwise I'm gonna come back here and chase you around the track all day. 9 November 2002, McDill Air Force Base, Tampa, Florida. You ready for this week? Sean Stevens asked Jeff while they ran along the base's roads. Yeah, it'll be strange being back on an ambulance after more than two years. I'm sure it'll be like riding a bike for you. Like falling off one, more likely, Jeff joked. You gonna be okay? Sean asked, seeing his running partner's face and seeing through the joke. Yeah, Jeff sighed. I was only on the road for seven years, Sean. Even so, some of those calls built up, and there are calls that you never really finish. There were some real doozies in those few years before I landed my operations manager position. You were management? Did I forget that or just not know? How old are you again? Older than your first platoon's lieutenant will be, Sean. I turned 33 in August. Yet you still keep up with me at PT. I'm a decade younger than you. Clean living, Sean. Right. The younger man snorted. I expected more people to be looking at you cross-eyed, you know since you're wearing your Navy PT gear on an Air Force base. I guess with Special Operations Command being headquartered here, you squids aren't quite the novelty I thought you'd be. That's because everyone here acknowledges SEALs are the penultimate warriors within the Special Operations community, Jeff. We're being treated with the respect we deserve. Oh, here we go. Hey, it ain't bragging if you can back it up. Anything you say, youngster. Jeff commented before snatching Sean's baseball hat off his head and breaking away in a sprint. Sean couldn't back down from a challenge like that and ran to catch up. Jeff and Sean walked into Baystar EMS in southeastern Tampa the next morning. Both cut imposing figures with their close-cropped hair, uber-fit physiques, matching shades, black polo shirts, and tan tactical pants. People cast nervous looks their way when the pair walked into the building. 
Despite the menacing image they projected, Jeff was warm and friendly when explaining the pair's presence. The company hosted other U.S. SOCOM ride-alongs over the past years, so the receptionist got them where they needed to be without the stammering and nervousness they expected. The same wasn't true of the two young women Jeff would ride with that first day. They hadn't evaluated military personnel before, though they were experienced paramedics. In his usual manner, Jeff put them at ease. Ladies, I've had my morning workout, coffee, and breakfast already, so I'm in a good mood. Let's go check out your office before we hit the streets, okay? So you're not gonna snap us in half is what you're saying? The woman who introduced herself as Tamika Granger asked. Be kinda hard for you to sign off on my paperwork if I did that, don't you think? Plus, if word got back to my wife that I did something like that, she'd have my head. I'm far more afraid of her than the folks in the military. Afraid? Stacia Fontenot asked. My wife is a fifth degree black belt in karate. She can kick my ass just by looking at me. The two paramedics looked at each other like they were uncomfortable. You ladies okay? They told us we shouldn't ask you any questions, Tamika said. I'm riding with you for 12 hours today, right? Then we've got another shift together Thursday. The women nodded. It's true there are some things I can't answer questions about. There are other subjects I've been cautioned about volunteering information on because of what the military calls PERSIC, personal security. You need to trust I can do the skills out here. How are you going to do that if I don't let you get to know me a little? That seemed to relax them. Okay, so, in the time honored tradition of third riders around the world, I'm buying the coffee. Jeff got set up to ride in the patient compartment so he wouldn't disrupt Tamika and Stacia's routine too much. Memories of ambulance shifts past came flooding back within minutes of leaving Baystar's station. Paramedic 4 creaked and rattled like almost every other ambulance Jeff ever worked in back home. Stacia gave him a long look when Jeff spun the airway seat around to face front without any effort. Jeff smiled at his preceptor. Stacia, I won't bite. You want to know how I knew how to spin the seat right? That usually takes about five minutes of explanations and three demonstrations before our third riders can figure it out. Yeah, but I've worked in ambulances for over ten years. Stacia's jaw dropped. She shared a look with her partner. Jeff could see Tamika's brown eyes staring back at him in the rearview mirror. Hey. That's why you looked so comfortable when you checked the laryngoscope. You're a paramedic already, aren't you? Yes, since 95. Then why the hell are you wasting your time riding with us? It's part of the program, Jeff shrugged. And I don't consider it a waste of my time at all, Tamika. While I'm off in foreign lands doing the king's bidding, folks like you two, and the others in the public safety community, are watching over the home front. Anything that reminds me that my family and friends will be in good hands while I'm away isn't a waste of my time. The ambulance rattled down the street while the two Baystar medics considered his words. Okay, here's the rest of it. I'm 33, married, and have three kids. My wife is a high school English teacher. I'm the operations manager for an ambulance service back home, or was before I re-enlisted. They're holding my job under a federal law designed to protect those who join up or are already in the reserves or guard. I played hockey in high school so I'm glad the Lightning have a half-dozen home games scheduled while I'm in Tampa. I played baseball too, but I don't think the Devil Rays have any games at the Trop this month. We good. Yeah, Tamika said. Are you buying our lunch too? We love it when management buys us lunch. Jeff agreed to buy lunch on one condition. No chain restaurants. The two Baystar employees agreed right away. After two easy ALS emergencies, they drove straight to their favorite family-run sandwich shop in their service area. The people behind the counter greeted them warmly. We come in here almost every day we work, Stacia explained. Tampa's got a huge Cuban community, so the Mixto is the most popular sandwich in the place. That's what most people know as the Cuban sandwich. Our local variant has salami on it in addition to the other traditional ingredients. I'll get that then. Stacia nodded before turning to the man behind the counter. Mr. A, three Tampa-style mixto, please. Right away, Stacia. Be just a few minutes. 
The trio backed away from the counter while the shop made their sandwiches. We've been coming here since they partnered us together a few years ago, Tamika said. Man, did we get some strange looks back then? The black girl and the pasty white blonde Cajun over there coming into this neighborhood? The Alvarezes didn't care though, especially not after we kept coming back. Telling anyone who would listen that they have the best sandwiches in Tampa didn't hurt either, Stacia added. Tamika nodded. We usually get the mixto, but their other stuff is great too. The city really does have great food, and these folks know how to do it upright for not a lot of money. Girls, you're all set, called the man who'd taken their order. The three medics grabbed drinks and chips before Jeff paid for their food. Thanks, Mr. A. We'll see you on Thursday. Inez will be here Thursday, Tam, along with Juan Carlos. JC's home? Stacia asked, sounding excited. He's coming home tomorrow. He graduated at the end of October, but his lease doesn't expire until the end of the month. He just finished cleaning the place, and the landlord's doing the move-out inspection in the morning before JC drives home. Well, we'll definitely be in to make eyes at your son. He's dreamy. Uh-huh, Stacia agreed. Go on, get. You troublemakers go eat your sandwiches. By Mr. A, the ladies laughed and crooned while waving over their shoulders as they walked away. Jeff looked back to the counter. Good luck. Thanks, Mr. Alvarez. I might need it. They drove paramedic four around the corner to a city park, and then they ate at a shaded picnic table. Oh, this is good, Jeff moaned after his first bite. Told ya, Tamika mumbled around hers, and I can't believe it's in the 80s here. There's usually snow on the ground by now where I'm from. We usually get lucky with the weather here, Stacia added. The bay keeps the temperature around 85 or so during the summer, though we sometimes see high 90s and hundreds. The ocean breeze is nice, but we do have to contend with hurricanes once in a while. Jeff nodded while chewing on another bite. <laughs> Nothing else of note occurred during the rest of Jeff's shift Monday. In fact, the trip to the sandwich shop was the last thing of note to happen during his shifts on Tuesday or Wednesday, too. The crews on those days were standoffish and made no effort to engage Jeff in conversation at all. Once they waved him into the back of their ambulances, they seemed to forget all about him unless they had a call. Tamika and Stacia greeted Jeff like an old friend when he arrived for their shift Thursday. Jeff looked like he wanted to say something to the crew of Paramedic 4, but he waited until they left the base first. Thank God I'm working with you ladies today, Jeff muttered once clear of the station. Why? What's up, Jeff? Stacia asked. I don't think the other crews spoke more than a dozen words to me over the last three days and barely answered when I tried to talk to them. What are the guys from my program who ride with your company usually like? Honestly, Jeff, they've always seemed a little cold. We don't remember hearing about too many others from your program making the effort to engage us like you have. Of course you're the first from your program we've precepted. And now you're spoiled. We've been spoiled for years. Stacia laughed. Just ask our families. Jeff shook his head. He was sure he'd understand exactly what they meant in a few more years. So are we headed back to La Boca Feliz for lunch? The ladies were suddenly at Witter. Did I say something funny? Stacia waved at Tamika to answer. She was laughing too hard. Stacia and I have been teasing JC, Juan Carlos, for years now, since his senior year in high school. He used to blush red as that fire hydrant over there when we'd get going. Then during his sophomore year in college, he started teasing us back. Tamika glanced at her partner in the driver's seat. I think Stacia's sweet on JC, and vice versa. Stacia punched the other woman in the shoulder. Am not. Right, and your face is doing an impression of a ripe tomato, why? Bitch, Stacia grumbled. At least I acknowledge what I am, babe, Tamika said with pride. Stacia only frowned in reply. Five hours later, the P4 crew walked into La Boca Feliz. A handsome young man behind the counter looked up, wiped his hands, and stepped to the customer's side of the counter. Grabbing Stacia, he drew her into a long, deep kiss. She melted into it, wrapping herself around her admirer. The other customers clapped and whistled at the floor show. Told ya, Tamika muttered to Jeff. Your partner seems okay with this development. 
Yeah, methinks the lady did protest too much. Mrs. Alvarez seemed happy with the scene in front of her also. Jeff and Tamika knew Stacia wouldn't run into any resistance from JC's family. Tamika and Jeff ate, while Juan Carlos and Stacia mooned at each other at a different table. Forty-five minutes later, a flustered Stacia and her amused partners left the sandwich shop for another emergency. Stacia blushed again when the other two broke into song. JC and Stacia sitting in a tree. JC and Stacia sitting in a tree. Knock it off, you two, she protested half-heartedly. It's only a date. Go into the chapel and Stacia's gonna get married. Go into the chapel and Stacia's gonna get ma a a a a a Stop! Stacia whined, though she was smiling. Hey, up ahead, Tamika pointed. We've got someone signaling us like a third base coach. Right, Stacia replied. She pulled to the curb and the three got out. Come on, hurry! The man who signaled them complained, while P4 gathered their equipment. Four's call came in as a simple arm fracture, so as a result, there was no immediate police or fire response. The ambulance crew would be on their own for at least part of the call. EMS crews don't run, so despite the man's protests, the crew walked into the building. Running raises the heart rate and releases adrenaline, both of which can lead to the shakes and are not helpful if you're trying to start IVs right away. They climbed to the third floor apartment. There they found a woman in her late twenties sitting at the kitchen table. Her arm was clearly broken. Fading bruises on her arms and legs were just as obvious. Her nervous glances and his interruptions, answering every question for her, aroused the ambulance crew's suspicions further. Stacia began to examine their patient's bruises, and the man darted for the table. Jeff, who'd been retrieving a flexible splint from one of their bags, saw the movement. Keeping his head down while focusing on his target, Jeff stood and pretended to bump into the man by accident. In point of fact, he finished his check the way his hockey coach used to drill him and his teammates. He stepped through his target and tried to put the man through the wall, causing the man to slump to the ground. Sir, are you okay? Jeff asked while stepping over to help the man. In the process of being helped off the floor, the man banged his head into the stove. A shelf holding cookbooks fell onto him, and he walked into a doorframe twice. The ladies carried the woman to the ambulance. Meanwhile, Jeff sat the still-stunned man on the couch. He handed him a bag of frozen peas as an ice pack for his head. The man thanked him as Jeff waved and walked out. They didn't transport the young lady to the closest hospital. They transported her to an ER 20 minutes further away from her apartment, in case the boyfriend went looking for her. Once in the EMS charting room, Stacia closed the door and turned to Jeff. So what happened after we left? Not much. I handed him a bag of frozen peas and came downstairs. He thanked me for my help, and that was it. Both base star medics looked at each other and began rolling in laughter. They tried speaking a couple of times, but that only caused more laughing. I don't know how much help you really gave him, but damn, that's funny, Tamika said five minutes later. Yeah, the fact that he thanked you for kicking his ass and didn't even realize it, that's perfect. Now come on, ladies, Jeff cautioned. I did assist the man. The other two raised four eyebrows at once. I did. I helped him to see the error of his ways, but still. Jeff joined their laughter. Jeff regretted not getting to work with Tamika and Stacia after that shift. The interaction between the two partners, and they with him, made Jeff realize how much he missed being on an ambulance. That was something he'd have to figure out when he got out of the army again. From a clinical standpoint, his shifts in the emergency room at Tampa General Hospital were excellent. From a personal standpoint, they were disappointing. The doctors, nurses, techs, unit admin staff, all were professional, competent, and completely afraid to engage him or Sean in conversation. Christ, it's a good thing they pair SOCM students when we're working in the ERs. Other than you, I don't think anyone said more than ten words to me over the past two weeks. Sean muttered over dinner two nights before they returned to brag. I know. If I hadn't hit it off with those two ladies over at Baystar, this would have been a pretty dry rotation. Jeff took a bite of his food. I wonder if the don't ask them any questions thing is being misinterpreted. 
You think SOCOM meant no personal questions, but that's been lost in translation? That explanation would make the most sense. It's too bad, too, because the girls and I had fun working together. I'd be careful calling them girls. My nephew is almost their age. See? That just proves you're old. The SOCM students returned to Fort Bragg heralded the approaching end of their class cycle. The cadre used the month of December to wrap up the class and schedule the students for a final clinical rotation, doing the Army's version of family practice medicine. Jeff thought it was amusing to be doing a rotation in the same hospital where he'd been a patient in 1990. During Jeff's time in Tampa, he learned that he passed the ATP exam taken the week before departing for his clinical rotations. In the eyes of the United States Special Operations Command, he was now good to go as a ranger medic. He'd likely have to do one refresher cycle to maintain his advanced tactical practitioner status before leaving the Army in 2005. The ATP certification was only good for two years. Jeff shook his head, thinking about the recert. He'd ETS in October of 2005, and a refresher for nine or ten months' service didn't seem to make sense. That's the army for you, he mused. Two weeks before Christmas, Jeff caught up with a friend. Going stir-crazy yet? Not as much as you'd think, Donald O'Brien replied. They've loaned me out to one of the medic units that provides support for airborne school while I wait for the next SOCM class to start CTM. I'm using the skills we learned in AIT, applying a little of what we learned at SOCM. I'll be ready to finish the class before I head to second bat. I'm glad they're helping you stay busy. I was afraid I'd find you moping around, acting like a mushroom. You know, sitting in a dark room, pasty white, dirty, kind of spongy. I see you still think you're funny. Looks aren't everything, Donnell. Did they let you have any leave? Not yet, but I'm going back to Chicago for Christmas. Sarah's taking me to her parents' house to introduce me to her family. We'll visit my parents and Chloe at the cemetery before I head back here. In all honesty, Donnell, I'm happy you're doing as well as you are. I'm not saying it was easy to wrap my head around being recycled, but Sergeant McNulty helped me keep my spirits up. When are you leaving for home? After the weekend. I report back here on Zorro 2 January. You? The difference between the weather in Tampa and Lancaster shocked Jeff. The difference between Fayetteville and Lancaster was noticeable too. He shook his head at how fast he'd become used to the warmer weather. Like his young friend Jeff left Fayetteville on Monday, December 16th. Unlike Donald, he wouldn't have to report to his unit until January 6th. The guard at the high school's new security post waved Jeff along once he showed his active military ID. He looked down the long stretch of fence now lining Route 2A while he walked in from the parking lot. He shook his head at the sad necessity of all of it. Jeff, is that you? Jeff looked up from the visitor's sign-in sheet to see Principal Carl Hammond walking toward him. Hey Carl, how's it going? Good, welcome home. Keiko told me you were driving home today, but that you wouldn't get in until later. I left an hour earlier than I thought I would, and I made really good time. Well, let's not keep your bride waiting, Carl said while motioning down the hall. Carl escorted Jeff to Keiko's classroom. The room reminded Jeff of his mother's in so many ways, yet it was uniquely Keiko's. Carl knocked on Keiko's open door and stepped into the otherwise empty room while Jeff waited outside. Hi, Keiko. How are you, Carl? Keiko, I'm afraid I have to remind you not to let your guests wander the halls of the school, especially these days. Guests? Keiko asked while cocking her head. I do not have any guests coming to the school today, Carl. She's right, Carl, Jeff said while he walked in. As much as I've been in here helping her set up this room, I should be considered staff and be on salary. If Carl was going to give a witty reply, Keiko's mad dash around her desk and over to her husband interrupted it. My husband, she whispered once she removed her lips from his, my Keiko-chan. Carl coughed and the couple turned to face him. Your classes are all done, right Keiko? She nodded. We'll get packed up and get out of here. I'll see you in the morning. Why don't we pick the kids up early and take your folks out to dinner? Jeff asked while they walked back to their cars. Where would you like to go, husband? How about that Italian place? Not the chain place near the mall in Leominster, 
but the mom and pop one in Sterling? That would be fine, Jeffrey. Mother and father enjoy eating there as well. And I can go dressed like I am. Keiko looked at him over the hood before getting into her car. Yes, they allow the don't bother me, I'm on leave look there. Jeff watched Paramedic 3 pull out of its bay and respond out of DMD's parking lot. He stepped out of his car and heard the siren Doppler away from him. Damn, I miss that sound, he thought, shaking his head. Jeff scratched at his unshaven face before he dodged the rivulets of dirty meltwater from the snowbanks surrounding the lot. He smiled upon seeing the service flag on the flagpole below the U.S. flag while he walked to the front entrance. Good morning, may I help you? The woman at the desk asked when he stepped inside. Hi, Abby. How have you been? The young woman tilted her head and asked, I'm sorry, sir. Do I know you? Jeff smiled and passed her his DMD company ID. Jeff! Abby exclaimed while springing from her chair. She gave him a tight hug. Hey, 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 lady. That's gonna get you an invitation to a sexual harassment seminar. I'm a happily married man. Abby put her hands on her hips. A happily married man who's been warned about making jokes. Yours are terrible. Everyone's a critic. With the jokes you tell, they should be. I learned them from my dad. Then God help your mother. No respect, I tell you. No respect, he said, shaking his head. Okay to go back and say hi to folks? You're my boss, remember? Well, technically I'm not right now, but thanks. I'll stop by on my way out. Jeff wandered down the admin hall saying hello to the people he remembered. He did a double take at seeing his old office empty, but didn't ask about it. He glanced through the window on the door to dispatch before swiping his ID through the card reader. He was surprised. It still worked. The on-duty dispatchers and a supervisor looked at the door when it opened. Pete DeFranza, did you take a wrong turn on the Fellsway or something? Jeff asked. The supervisor and dispatchers shared a look before looking back to the stranger. Who? I guess I need a shave, he muttered to himself. I used to work P-31 in Malden with Shauna Lestrange before she became a supervisor. Jeff? Pete asked. Jeff smiled and walked over to him with his hand out. How are you, Pete? <laughs> Holy dog shit, how are you, Jeff? What are you doing home? Jeff shook hands with Sheila Klausner and Scott Neumeyer. I just finished up a six-month training course at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. I've got a couple weeks leave before I report back to Fort Benning in western Georgia. Six months? Sheila asked. What were they training you for? I'll be an Army Ranger medic when I get back to Benning. Pete whistled. Hey, how come my old office is empty? I thought Seamus and Sean were about to name an interim ops manager last time I was home in March. They did, Scott confirmed. A pretty good guy from Pittsfield, Ed Berg, but six months in, he learned he had cancer. He's doing okay after his round of chemo, but he won't be back as the manager. They're still looking more than a year after you left, Pete added, but they haven't found anyone yet. The lights in the house were off other than the ones on the tree and the candles in the windows. His mom was a big believer in the small white lights on the conifer that lit the room. The Christmas tree sat in the same spot he remembered when growing up in this house. He stood by the back of the couch, looking at the kids' spoils, surrounding the tree, and smiled. Keiko and Jeff's parents were in the TV room at the back of the house. He drifted out to the living room after grabbing a beer in the kitchen. His thoughts swirled, as they had during the rest of his leave. Still, he wasn't surprised by the arm which snaked around his waist. He hadn't heard Keiko approaching and grinned down at his wife. I was certain I would startle you, Jeffrey, she said. Gotta expect the unexpected, Keiko-chan. That and I felt a disturbance in the force. It will be difficult to surprise you on the mat now, I'm guessing? I doubt it, Keiko. He chuckled before turning back to the tree. You're a sneaky girl. Keiko wrinkled her nose at him. The children certainly enjoyed themselves today. They definitely did. I'm glad Kara Stu and the kids came over too. I feel like I haven't seen them in forever. Yeah. It has been almost 18 months since you've seen your sister and her family, Jeffrey. Yeah. Jeff sighed, still staring at the tree. Are you alright, husband? I'm okay, 
I'm just taking in this moment of normalcy. There aren't too many more ahead for me, for quite a while. Keiko didn't answer other than to hug him harder. Joe Knox listed Jeff as a garage employee for two reasons. His son owned 5% of the business, though Jeff didn't know that, and for insurance purposes, so Jeff could work on his own vehicle there, like today. Jeff would make the two-day drive to Fort Benning on Friday. Today, however, father and son shared time working on cars together, like they did during Jeff's younger days. The garage was closed for business on New Year's, which gave them plenty of space. Joe tinkered with the Explorer parked alongside his son's Volkswagen. Dad, can I grab the gap tool? Sure. Joe handed it over. Jeff checked the firing gap at the end of the Passat spark plugs. How are you doing, Jeff? Hmm? I'm okay, Dad. Joe didn't reply. The silence caused Jeff to look up. His father stared at him from under the hood of his own car. Really, I'm fine, Dad. I know what I signed up for. My worry is for Keiko and the kids, but I've done everything I can think of to prepare. My will's up to date. The kids all have trust funds and education funds, and I know the family will take care of them if the worst happens. Not to be morbid, but it'll be beyond my control if that were to occur. Joe frowned, but nodded. Do me a favor. Don't say that around your mother. I haven't said that around my wife, Dad. I'm not about to say it around yours. Jeff connected new wires to the spark plugs he just cleaned and gapped. Seems like a discussion you should have with Keiko sooner rather than later. I plan to, Dad, but not just yet, before I deploy. Silence again filled the garage. The thing I worry about the most is maybe how I might come back, and being a burden to Keiko and the kids in that case. You think she would ever consider you a burden? She takes that in good times and in bad thing pretty seriously. I think you're selling my daughter-in-law short, Jeff. This time it was Jeff who didn't answer. Jeff, life rarely goes as planned. You of all people should know that we adjust on the fly, hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Jeff nodded but kept quiet. What do you hear about the war's progress? His father asked. You probably know more than I do at this point, Dad. I've had my nose in medical books since June, remember? It's not like I'm part of an operational unit yet or could say anything if I knew anything. Now it was his dad's turn to nod. From what I do hear, it sounds like the Northern Alliance isn't as allied as they build themselves to be. That slowed things down and allowed the Taliban to reinforce their holdings in the South. It sounds like there will be war enough left for me to fight when I finish my training. Joe didn't like the sound of that. Jeff tried wiping the sleep from his eyes one more time before he walked into 3D Battalion headquarters. He'd woken sore and stiff from two days of driving, but a vigorous workout helped him loosen up. He opened the door, ready to see how long this pit stop would last. Hey, Doc, Benny Montoya from his desk. Welcome back. Benny, how have you been? Jeff asked while shaking the man's hand. Never better, Doc. You? The same. What's with the doc thing? Benny froze. I meant no disrespect, Sergeant. No, 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 Benny, no worries. I was just surprised, that's all. I wasn't here that long before I left for Bragg, so I'm wondering how I earned the title already. Have you forgotten about Sergeant Major Springer already, Doc? You saved his life. Well, we'll skip the debate on that. I thought I would wander in and let you tell me how long I'll be here until Ranger School starts. Last I heard about two months, but let me check on that and I'll get back to you, okay? Give me a couple of hours. Hey Benny, it's not like the army doesn't own my ass for at least the next two and a half years. Yeah, okay, good point. The LT still in charge of things? Roger that, Doc. Got ourselves a new sergeant major, though, as you might expect. How's Sergeant Major Springer doing, by the way? Anyone keeping tabs on him? He's doing okay. He's been in a couple of times, mostly to clean out his office. Moves kinda slow now. Not that that's a surprise. Anything for me today? I know I have an appointment with the battalion surgeon at 1300, but that's all at the moment. You've got nothing scheduled other than that. Tomorrow's another matter, though. Wonderful. Let me guess. I start learning how to be a ranger tomorrow. Yep, back to the range for you. At least I get to go shooting. He got to go shooting, all right. He spent all day going through evolutions at the range, 
putting hundreds of rounds through his rifle and a magazine or three through a pistol while in various firing positions. At the end of the day, the instructors ran everyone through combat reaction courses to test their focus while tired. Benny Montoya let Jeff know his ranger school slot was a month earlier than they originally thought. Jeff spent the next month running and marching with a weighted ruck to get ready. Jeff chuckled at the memory of that day at the range. Given his surroundings, the chuckle was out of place. It was day one of ranger school. The darkness of the West Georgia night hid his smile. The sound of his chuckle was lost in the footfalls of 322 other candidates of Class Aero 6, 2003, running alongside him. After hours of hand-to-hand -hand combat drills, bear crawls, and buddy carries, they were running from the fight pit to the obstacle course known as the Darby Queen. Once at the O course, Jeff and his ranger buddy, roster number 227, waited for their command to start. Jeff wouldn't start learning people's names until they made it through the assessment portion of ranger school. There was no point at the moment, and that's how Kadri referred to people anyway. Once on the O course, Jeff saw he always lead the way. Sometimes he had to stop and help 227 through the obstacles. Many times he had to repeat the obstacles because his buddy was still on them and needed encouragement. They enjoyed the low crawl mud pit three times until they went through it the right way. Jeff suspected it was his buddy not low crawling properly, but they were a team. He kept his head down and his mouth shut. Like RIP Ranger School would be a major gut check, though Ranger School would last an eternity by comparison. 61 days. A shower and a delicious MRE at U0255 prepared Jeff for the best three-hour nap of his life. He felt he'd just closed his eyes when the Ranger instructors, the RIs, woke them for day two. Jeff was glad he was still used to short blocks of rest like that after RIP. The nap had recharged him. The early morning temperature was in the mid-50s when his class formed up in front of the water confidence course. Jeff knew the water would be cold too. Strangely enough, roster number 227 wasn't in formation with him. Jeff's winter weight BDUs and boots held the frigid water next to his skin each time he emerged from the muddy lake. At parade rest between events, he wiggled his fingers and toes to keep some feeling and to keep them loose. The cold March rain falling on his head felt warmer than the lake water. After another filling MRE, the remaining class members braced themselves for another endurance event, the 15-mile forced march. They started at dusk. Soon, a long line of bobbing red-lensed headlamps stretched out along the route even with the weighted ruck runs Jeff prepped himself with the month before, fatigue and hunger set in. Jeff didn't hear many complaints from the front third of the road march group. Barring injury, these men would make it through the assessment phase of ranger school without issue. Those who lacked the drive and determination, the intestinal fortitude, to push past the limits their minds thought were there wouldn't last much longer. An army two-and-a-half-ton truck called a deuce and a half trailed behind the formation, waiting to pick men up. Man, this poor kid's in over his head, Jeff thought. He stood in the formation known as a gaggle with others in his class, waiting for a command from the patrol leader while the unit was stopped. They were deep in the woods, conducting a movement to make contact. The platoon should have been spread out and behind cover. Instead, they stood around, were bunched tight, and invited disaster. One grenade could kill or injure half the patrol. In his first unit, he would have made his men spread out and get low to the ground. Here, at a school designed to be a leadership evaluation, the waters were murkier. Here, Jeff had to walk a fine line between followership and initiative. He wasn't in the platoon's chain of command, and he definitely didn't like how Specialist Bricker's assistant patrol leader hadn't taken the initiative to get the men sorted out. Bricker would have to figure it out for himself. The RIs loved to assign new leadership at the worst possible moment, i.e., right before execution of a plan, by picking a new patrol leader, an assistant patrol leader. That's what they did to Bricker. That's also why Jeff made sure he knew the plan beforehand and where they were in its progress. Jeff watched Bricker fumble through the raid and winced when the young man came up short on the head count afterward. The kid was a good soldier, smart, though a bit young, and he admitted his shortcomings during the AAR. 
The R.I. went easy on him. He listed the mistakes Bricker made, but did so gently, teaching the man rather than embarrassing him. Chin up, Shane, Jeff whispered while they headed to the next evolution. We all used to make the same mistakes when we were getting started. Thanks, Jeff. My platoon sergeant back at first bat warned me ranger school would stretch me. I've only got one deployment under my belt, and that was as Private Snuffy, so there were minimal leadership chances for me over there. Shane Bricker shrugged. I'm trying to pay attention and absorb what I can here. Keep at it, Brick, Jeff said, patting the man on the shoulder. I'll help you out however I can. Us bat boys have to stick together. Jeff shook his head and blinked rapidly when the unicorns appeared. The mythical creatures and grassy plains before his eyes gave way to the reality of the thick swamps of western Florida. They were on the final ten-day exercise of the Florida phase of ranger school. Halfway through the mountain phase in the hills near Dallanega, Georgia, Jeff's class began to drone. They would hallucinate or fall asleep whenever they stopped moving. Jeff was at the point where he was fighting to not fall asleep while standing in chest-high swamp water. Some of the younger soldiers in AIT swore by energy drinks to stay awake, but the army included coffee with every MRE, and the RIs gave them two MREs a day. The students usually ate them only hours apart. Even the average of 3,200 calories a day wasn't enough to keep them from losing weight. Jeff was convinced he'd sleep for two weeks and weigh 20 pounds less when graduation rolled around. Back on dry land, he pulled out a battered zip-top plastic bag holding coffee from his MREs. He put a pinch of grounds inside his front lip. Unlike the energy drinks, dipping coffee didn't sound like you were opening a brewski in the middle of an operation. The patrol had another mile and a half to go to reach the objective, and he needed to stay alert. The caffeine would give him that extra push. The long days of patrolling, minimal food, and even less sleep began to blend together midway through Benning phase. Mountain phase was a blur with the initial mountaineering training standing out. Florida phase was a blur with snakes and swamps the distinct memories of that third of the course. Chiggers, the constant chiggers, were memories of the entire ranger school course. Soldiers from the ranger battalions were often chosen by their peers for leadership roles over the course of the class. The cadre selected the patrol leader and his assistant, but those students chose their subordinate leadership. The patrol leader tapped Jeff as a squad leader for the final assault. He also tapped Shane Bricker as another squad leader, based on how Shane handled himself after his raid and the mission since. The kid would make a great sergeant someday. Jeff hadn't seen any overt appearance of the West Point Protective Association, which was notorious for protecting a military academy graduate at the expense of others. He was confident the final peer evaluations for his class would be handled without regard to USMA graduation status. Jeff's execution of his squad's part of the assault plan went without major incident. An enemy fighter grabbed one of Jeff's soldiers while his squad cleared a part of the objective building. His soldier tried to pull back from the fighter, but Jeff knocked them both to the ground. Once down, he and his man subdued the fighter in seconds. Remember, sir, aggressiveness and violence of action, Jeff said while helping the young lieutenant to his feet. No one wore rank, skill badges, or unit patches on their BDUs in ranger school, but at this point in the course, everyone knew who was who. Roger, Sergeant, the young officer smiled. Thanks. Jeff nodded, then left to check the rest of his men. Once the AAR was complete, their rifles cleaned and turned in, and their equipment stored, the surviving students of Ranger Class 06-2003 enjoyed showers and a full night's sleep, following a leisurely and unhurried meal at the Gator Lounge. Their class completion photo and a plaque would adorn the Gator Lounge wall for years to come, along with those of the men who passed the course before. Two days later, Jeff's class marched along the shore of Victory Pond at Fort Benning, the location of their water confidence course two months earlier. Jeff and his classmates wore no rank and no badges, all still united at the completion of their trial. In moments, they'd become ranger qualified, something only 1% of army personnel could claim. When the ceremony ended, Jeff still didn't have a ranger tab on his shoulder. Tradition required someone meaningful to pin one on. Keiko beamed with pride while she pinned the simple gold and black tab to her husband's BDU sleeve. That tab had been one of Jeff's goals since high school. Waiting behind Keiko were the ranger regiment, 
3D Battalion and Bravo Company commanders, along with two sergeants major and a first sergeant. Two civilians also stood with them. Jeff accepted their congratulations and wondered aloud at the leadership of those three units being there. Sergeant, we're here to say thank you for saving this old bastard here, the regimental commander said, pointing to the male civilian. He was my first platoon sergeant back when I was a wet behind the ears second lieutenant. Well done. Thank you, sir. Sergeant, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Shepard. You'll make a welcome addition to 3D Battalion and Captain Miller's Bravo Company after your leave. Jeff shook the other soldier's hands before clasping the outstretched hand of a man he met once a year earlier. Glad to see you upright walking and talking, Sergeant Major Springer. Pete, Sergeant. The man smiled. My name is Pete. I don't know how to thank you. The woman with Pete Springer did. She elbowed Pete out of the way and hugged Jeff, then gave him a kiss on the cheek. Stella, thank you for saving this crusty old soldier of mine, Sergeant Knox, Stella Springer said before wiping her eyes. It was my pleasure, ma'am. Please, both of you, call me Jeff. I'm guessing you've already met my wife, Keiko? Yes, Jeffrey, and I told everyone the most embarrassing stories about you. Keiko smiled up at him from her usual spot tucked under his arm while she hugged herself to his side. Of that I have no doubt, Keiko-chan, Jeff replied, giving his wife's ribs a tickle. She gave his ribs an elbow shot. 23 April 2003, 3D Ranger Battalion, Fort Benning, Georgia. And now the fun starts. Nineteen months earlier, the world changed. It had taken Jeff that long to arrive at this point to be a Ranger-qualified special operations combat medic in a Ranger platoon. Now it was time to put up or shut up. Jeff carried a stack of folders containing his new platoon's medical records. In the Rangers, he was part of the platoon, though his chain of command went through the battalion surgeon, with whom he had just had a meeting. He was a Ranger first, though, one with a medic, Emos. In other units, medics may be attached to a platoon during training but rarely on a permanent basis like he was here. His assigned barracks room was a regular sized room, but he wouldn't have a roommate. The extra space where the other desk and bunk should be would give him room to do minor exams if needed. Anyone needing lab work or x-rays would be sent to Martin Army Medical Center. Jeff's new platoon was now his ranger family. He'd know these men better than a doctor would know a patient in civilian life. Jeff carried the medical records so he could try to memorize them as much as possible. Thankfully, the platoon was under strength following their deployment. There were only 31 soldiers currently assigned to 2D platoon, where its authorized strength was 40. He shook his head to chase the lingering weariness away. Ranger school ran him ragged. It would be a while before his PT was back up to his normal standard. His appetite was now skewed as well. Jeff found himself getting seconds, sometimes thirds, at meals because he was so hungry. In the Rangers, you could take all you wanted, but you better eat what you took so he didn't go crazy filling his plates. He would continue to select well-balanced meals each time to prevent gaining too much body fat while his body continued to recover. Another source of his fatigue was his wife. Keiko wouldn't let him out of her sight or out of their bed while they were on leave together. After Ranger School graduation, they drove to Columbus and holed up in their hotel. Since graduation took place the week before the Massachusetts April school vacation, Keiko took the week off and enjoyed the time alone with Jeff before her parents brought the kids to Columbus. Exiting the stairwell on the second floor of his barracks, Jeff made his way to his new room at the end of the hall. He continued to shake his head at Keiko's behavior while she was with him. The woman had been insatiable. There was this one thing she... Flames shot across the hall just in front of Jeff, followed by an unpleasant odor. Tracking the flames to their source, Jeff saw a hairy posterior protruding from one room. The posterior's owner held a lit lighter behind it. Ha ha ha, that was a good one, someone else inside the room yelled. Jeff whirled and stepped into the doorway. What in the actual fuck are you two morons doing? Hey, lighten up fresh meat. The fragrant soldier cautioned while turning and pulling up his pants, not recognizing the new face in the barracks. That Sergeant Knox to you, Jeff growled, getting nose to nose with the man. 
The man's gaze shifted to the rank on Jeff's collar. He gulped and went straight to parade rest. The other man did the same. What's your name, Ranger? Nowart, Terry S., Sergeant. Nowart Terry S. stared straight ahead at some distant point, careful not to eyeball this unknown sergeant. He also tried to ignore the fact he'd dropped his BDU pants again. Jeff shifted his glare to the room's other occupant. You? Schultheis, Dieter J., Sergeant. Jeff let them stew in the silence which descended. I've got good news and I've got bad news for you two Rhodes scholars. The good news is, I'm not in your chain of command. Jeff paused to let that sink in. Once he saw relief in their eyes, he continued. The bad news, the bad news is I'm your platoon's new medic. Their eyes widened again. That's right, and I don't tolerate bullshit very well, as you may have guessed. Jeff refocused his attention on Nauert. Nauert felt like Jeff's glare would bore a hole in the side of his head. Nauert, do you know what a third-degree burn is? Roger, Sergeant. Do you know what debridement is then? Negative, Sergeant. It's where they remove dead or contaminated tissue from a wound so that it will heal. This happens after someone receives serious burns, and it happens a lot at the beginning of treatment. The method they usually use with burns is known as sharp debridement, which means they use something like a bottle brush to scrub at and remove that tissue. I hear it's a bit on the painful side. Nauert gulped again. So Ranger Nauert, unless you're interested in that kind of experience, I suggest you refrain from the human flamethrower routine. Read me? Roger, Sergeant. And if something other than your gaseous emission had come out of your asshole, my size 11s would be making a field goal attempt with your nutsack right about now. Understand? Use the brain God gave you, Nauert. Roger, Sergeant. Jeff looked at Schulteis again. The man was sweating. You two find something productive to do before I suggest something creative to your squad leader. Pull up your pants, Nauert. He turned on his heel and left the room. Rangers lead the way, echoed down the hall. Jeff strode down the hall, staring straight ahead, his displeasure clear on his face. He didn't acknowledge anyone sticking their heads out of their rooms. Most of them saw his scowl and ducked back out of sight. In his room, Jeff dropped the stack of folders on the desk before sitting in its chair. He sighed, leaned forward, and began banging his head on the folders. Hey, are you our new doc? Someone asked after a few thumps. Jeff picked his head up to see a staff sergeant in his mid-twenties in his doorway. Yeah, can I help you? He asked, rising to his feet. I'm Trace Dinkins, first squad leader. Jeff shook the outstretched hand and introduced himself. Dinkins added, Let me hazard a guess. You just met Nauert and Schultes? Yes, Nauert was lighting his farts on fire and nearly barbecued me while I passed their room. Dinkins rolled his eyes skyward. God save me from those two, they usually don't get that stupid. But we've only been back a couple of weeks, so that might be part of it. A couple of weeks? I thought you were supposed to be back a couple of months ago? Back in February? Jeff waved the young squad leader inside, offering him a seat. They extended us, of course, Dinkins grumbled. We're lucky we didn't lose anybody during our extra six weeks, as intense as they got. While they're still blowing off steam, should I expect to see them again? After some joint misadventure? Of the soldiers in my squad, those are the two you'll probably run into first. I'm hoping everyone's gotten everything out of their systems by now. By himself, Schulteis usually has his head on straight, but now it's my baby Huey, and is known to lead people astray. Those two together can get a bit dangerous. I can't believe you would give that big meathead live ammunition. In garrison, he does get to be a handful. In the field. Whether we're in training or deployed somewhere, he's the best soldier in this company. Jeff stared in disbelief. Dinkins shrugged. Out there, he's animal mother. What can I say? Don't run out of hand grenades, Jeff muttered in response to the Full Metal Jacket movie reference. Like that would happen in the Rangers, Dinkins laughed. Oh, in case you haven't read Schulteis's file yet, he's one of your combat lifesavers. In combat, Schulteis would assist Jeff with casualties where necessary. Jeff stared at the younger man. In the spirit of your previous comment, you gotta be shitting me, pile. Serious as a heart attack, Doc. Believe it or not, he is capable of making good decisions. 
Jeff shook his head. Anyway, I should introduce myself to the platoon sergeant. He around? Not yet. We're getting someone new. He's finishing ROP, the Ranger Orientation Program for Soldiers who are E5, promotable, and above. I'll bet he's having fun, Jeff muttered. When's he done? He'll be here next week. What happened to your old one? Rotated out. He's been promoted to first sergeant out in 2D bat. This new guy's coming from a stretch outside the regiment for career progression. He's already tabbed, though. I hate to kick you out, Trace, but I should get the rest of the stuff out of my POV before chow. I'll give you a hand, Dinkins offered. You don't have to do that. It's no problem. Besides, I know where we can get some volunteer lifting help. Dinkins introduced Jeff to Sal Pellegrino, Josh Brogan, and Enos Torvalds, the other squad leaders in the platoon, before they all headed to dinner. They were the squad leaders of 2D, 3D, and the machine gun squads, respectively. Jeff locked the platoon's medical files in his desk's secure drawer without having looked at them. The five NCOs got acquainted at the DFAC. How come some of the folks from battalion are coming over to welcome you back? Pellegrino asked. I thought you just got here. As a member of this company, I did, officially, Jeff confirmed. While you guys were on your nature hikes over there, I was here for a month between RIP and SOCM, then again between SOCM and Ranger School. I was attached to HHC then, and only assigned to our company after I got tabbed. I didn't officially become a BCO, Ranger, until this morning. Jeff pronounced BCO as BCO. Were you here when Sergeant Major Springer had his heart attack? Torvalds asked. Yeah, I was here then, Jeff replied, not saying anything else. Come on, don't be so modest, Sergeant, 3 Battalion's current Sergeant Major, Efrain Bautista, said while placing his tray across from Jeff's. Okay to join you guys? Of course, Sar Major, Dinkins said immediately. He turned to Jeff. This is Sergeant Major Bautista. Bautista reached across the table to shake Jeff's hand. The Sar Major makes it a point to eat dinner with the battalion at least once a week. He rotates through the companies so he can talk to and meet folks after hours. What did you mean by what you just said to Doc, Sar Major? Bautista glanced at Jeff. They're going to hear it at some point, Sar Major. Jeff sighed in resignation. Go ahead. Gents, you're looking at the medic who saved Sergeant Major Springer's life. The eyes of the squad leaders snapped back to their new platoon medic. Pete Springer is telling that to anyone who'll listen, and the staff over at Martin's emergency room feels the same way. They're exaggerating, Jeff muttered around a mouthful of fried chicken. I just helped get him to the hospital. Uh-huh. Why don't you tell these guys what you've been doing for the past decade, work-wise? Jeff looked at the senior NCO. Go on. Jeff sighed again. Ambulance work. By that he means he's been an EMT for over a dozen years. A civilian paramedic outside of Boston for almost eight. General manager of his EMS company for a year before 9-11. Your platoon's getting a medic who knows his shit and has actually done the job. I was only my division's operations manager, SAR Major. Oh, excuse me, paramedic sergeant operations manager, my mistake. Jeff studied the platoon's medical files all weekend, making up index cards on each of the rangers assigned. He laminated the cards so he could carry them in the field, and they wouldn't get ruined. Making changes to any single card wouldn't be a big chore now that he designed a format he liked. The only card he hadn't made yet was the new platoon sergeant's. Since he was scheduled to arrive today, Jeff wasn't too worried about getting the information. Jeff tried to loosen up his neck. He'd sat hunched over his desk too long over the weekend already. He rotated his shoulders after doing 20 quick push-ups to try and wake up. He was happy his PT seemed to be improving after getting back from ranger school. Jeff wouldn't score his normal 300 plus anytime soon, but at least he wouldn't embarrass himself. He opened another protein shake from his fridge he was still down 15 pounds from what he weighed before ranger school. Jeff heard Trace and Josh talking in the hall. From the sound of things, the new platoon sergeant was here. Jeff almost sprayed chocolate shake all over his room when he recognized a third voice, the platoon sergeant's, which was one from ages past. 
Sticking his head around his doorframe, Jeff saw the two squad leaders in the hall, but the platoon sergeant wasn't visible. The man must be in his room. When Trace and Josh went back to their own rooms, Jeff slid down the wall and peeked into the platoon sergeant's barracks room. The man's back was to the door. Jeff crept in and slammed the door behind him. The platoon sergeant whirled and almost passed out. For Christ's sake, Mendoza, are you trying to get yourself killed? Or maybe you're trying to collect Article 15s? You act like you never want to make it past E3. Be my guest, but that'll make for a long four years. Rick Mendoza stood there, mouth agape and blinked like he was seeing things. The words from his first official ass-chewing continued to echo in his ears. That girl you've been seeing's gonna get wise to you and dump your ass. Then her father's gonna perforate it with buckshot because you broke her heart. Or your lame ass will land in Leavenworth first because you did something stupid here. I won't have to watch the train wreck for long either way because you won't be around. Of course, you could try pulling your head out and act like you give a shit once in a while. Pay attention to detail here. Quit screwing around in town and you might still be alive and able to make sergeant before your four years are up. Mendoza blinked again. Sarge? He squeaked. How you been, Ricky? Jeff smiled while holding out his hand. Holy fucking shit, where in the hell did you come from? I thought you got out after we got back from the Gulf. I did. What are you doing here then? I'm your platoon medic, Rick. I re-upped in 2001. You're our medic? That's great, but why'd you change your MOS? That's what I did while I was out, Rick. I was a paramedic in civilian life. Changing my MOS seemed a better fit than coming back in as an infantryman. What else have you been up to? Other than scaring the crap out of people. I married Sergeant Takahashi's sister in 96. You remember Ken, right? We've got three kids now, Keiko and me. How about you? That girl you chewed my ass over? The one I was dating before we shipped to Saudi? We kept dating after we got back. And then I married her after you ETS'd. We have four boys. Are they here with you? No. Not until after the older boys finish school at the end of June. I just PCS'd from Ord, and they're stuck with packing up our old place in the meantime. I guess the army figured it'd be better to have me start here sooner, rather than later. We'll be assigned housing on post, but the place won't be available until 01 June, so I'm here in the barracks until it is. What about your family? Jeff told Rick the tale. You'll have a standing invitation to dinner with us once Tasha knows you're here. She thinks you're the reason she and I got married, and she's probably right. I know she'll want to meet you at a minimum. Tonight, though, how about you show me where the NCO club is here and I'll buy you dinner? Even with 3D Battalion just back from deployment, their training schedule restarted almost immediately, though it wasn't quite back at its normal tempo. Jeff used the slow time to practice his pistol work at the base's shooting club. The Beretta M9 was an okay pistol, but he missed his SIG. He preferred the action of that weapon better than either the M9 or his M1911. He debated bringing his pistols down from Massachusetts. As the platoon's medic, Jeff restarted combat lifesaver training before the battalion restarted its heavy training rotations. The platoon's six CLS designees reviewed how to apply tourniquets under Jeff's watchful eyes. Good job, guys, Jeff offered. Man, I see why you told us to put the gloves on, SPC Normo Terry from 2D Squad muttered, while holding his hands over a towel. Simulated blood dripped off the gloves. Are you left or right-handed, Norm? Right. Why? No. With your left hand, pinch the bottom of your right glove here. Pull it off slowly, turning it inside out while you do. Good. Now ball that up inside your left fist. Slide a finger from your right hand under your other glove and pull that one off so that it's inside out, also with the other one inside it. Good. That keeps the contaminants contained and you can throw the whole thing away. If they're visibly soiled like these are, they go into a biohazard bin. If not, they can go in the trash. So in here? No, that's the sharps box. It's four needles. You'd have to use your fingers to push something as bulky as those gloves through the opening, and I don't recommend that. That's a good way to get stuck. No, put bloody gloves, blood-soaked gauze, and anything not sharp in a red plastic bag, marked biohazard, if you have one. 
This isn't real blood, so they can go in the regular trash. After cleaning up the practice arms, they sat in the training room chatting. Okay, guys, what did you learn from that? That you can make a tourniquet out of a lot of things, DJ Schulteis said. That they hurt like a bastard, was PFC Ruben Holland of 3D Squad's contribution. Everyone agreed with that assessment. Jeff made sure they put a tourniquet on each other, briefly, so they could understand how tight they needed to be before they worked as intended. Yeah, they're definitely not designed for comfort. Your patient's distracting injury, the arm or leg that's not there anymore, will likely keep them from noticing the tourniquet until I can get some pain medication on board. Jeff tossed a strange-looking orange device on the table next to them. We'll introduce these to the guys during the Ranger first responder training next month. I just heard about them while I was over at battalion meeting with our PA. What is that thing? A combat tourniquet, DJ. Everyone will be expected to carry one on them at all times while we're in the field, and in the same place too. That way, we won't have to search for it when we really need it. Like with the Mark and Nerve Agent Antidote Kits, you use the one assigned to the casualty on the casualty, and not your own. I'll carry four to six extras in my bag when deployed, if we need more. Why are they having us carry these? I thought tourniquets were no longer in vogue. There's already plenty of evidence, very strong evidence, that tourniquets are saving lives in the stan. Survivable extremity trauma is way up now that we're all wearing armor. The armor protects the core in explosions, but at the cost of the extremities. Preventable hemorrhage is the leading cause of death in combat, and they want to cut the numbers. We can't do too much about serious bleeds from the torso or abdominal area yet, but we can stop most serious bleeds from the extremities. So the field expedient tourniquet training just now was to help us think outside the box? Right, Jeff confirmed to PFC Tyler Williams, an assistant machine gunner. All three of the machine gun squad's A-gunners were designated CLS providers. This model is the one the Army's decided to go with, though the ones we'll use in the field will be black. The stick here is the windlass. See how it's permanently attached and can't be lost unless this piece here is cut. The manufacturer says about three turns is all you'll need, before it's tight. After that, the windlass gets secured in this simple holder here with the Velcro over it. You guys each play with one for a bit, then we'll practice putting one on someone. Well, I won't go so far as to call it comfortable, but this one is more comfortable than the improvised tourniquets, Norm said after DJ put one on his arm. So they're rolling these out at the company's RFR class next month, A gunner Kyle Peterson asked. Right, Kyle. You guys are getting hands-on time with them now so you can help demonstrate their use. We'll get guidance about where they want these carried at that point, too. Pretty slick work, Doc, Terry Noward offered after a raid exercise. You're a natural. Youngster, you remember I've done this before, right? Despite their initial meeting, Jeff developed a good relationship with the man. The platoon hadn't missed a beat after adding its new members. They operated well as a team already. Jeff would train with each of the squads to get to know them, and so they could all get used to people swapping in and out when necessary. Yeah, but it doesn't look like you've forgotten anything during your time off either. Maybe not, but I'm still trying to get used to the body armor and having a functional sling on my weapon. It's a good thing you kids showed me that trick of working out with a chain draped around your neck. I'll need to stay used to carrying extra weight around. Works pretty good, huh? Easier than remembering to grab my ruck full of sand before I head to the gym, that's for sure. Before we deploy again, you're gonna want that ruck so you can get used to the bulk in addition to the weight. How do you like those assault gloves? They fit better than the old leather gloves, that's for sure. You don't even notice them after a while. I'll try wearing my nitrile exam gloves under them next. Why do that, Doc? DJ asked. <laughs> With or without these gloves on, my hands will get pretty sweaty on an op. Trying to get my exam gloves on won't work so well in that case. I want to see what hours with the nitrile on does to my hands, too. Two minutes, guys, called Rick Mendoza. We go again in two minutes. He's full of good news, isn't he? Trace asked, walking over. Okay, guys, on your feet. Time for an equipment check. Good job, guys. See how effective these things will be? Jeff oversaw 2D Platoon's practice of tourniquet placement with the new equipment. 
His CLS troops all gave him thumbs ups to say their groups hadn't had any issues Jeff didn't catch. The Ranger first responder Corsi was drive not presented well, but it was also critical to the regiment's push to reduce fatalities among its ranks. Okay, Jeff called to the entire platoon. The next evolution is placing the tourniquet on yourself. On your arm, placing it one-handed. Grumbles filled the room. Wait until I make you practice with your non-dominant hand. This will seem easy as hell. Practicing one-handed proved challenging. Practicing with their weak side hands tended toward the comical. Don't forget why we're practicing this, children. Jeff often emphasized the difference in his age and the platoon's average. The guys got a kick out of it. Downrange, you're going to want this to be second nature. I know we won't ship out for almost a year, but how much other training do we do? This is something you can easily practice for a few minutes in your rooms before lights out, every night. Doc is right, Rick Mendoza called out. Just think how much better your social lives will be when your offhands get stronger. The room dissolved in laughter. <laughs> Rangers are not known for being politically correct. Rick was sure he knew how his remark would be interpreted, and he was right. <laughs> Make your buddy smile, someone sang out. Don't ask, don't tell, was the follow-up. After the end of the class, Jeff grabbed a beer with his platoon sergeant at the NCO club. That went pretty well, he said. That went really well, Bones, Rick corrected. Since Rick was a Star Trek fan, Bones was already his tongue-in-cheek nickname for his medic. He used it half the time instead of Jeff's given name. I think the grumbling over RFR training reached an all-time low today. That stuff is so dry it can suck the moisture out of your eyeballs in a hurry, especially if it's presented as death by PowerPoint. Death by PowerPoint? Those are the presentations where they read from the slides word for word. I know we're infantry, Rick, but even Nowart can read a slide by himself. I like to put a little life in my classes, and that's not the way to do it. Why should I read it for these guys? This isn't story time. Do I need to remind you you're not technically infantry anymore? Okay, so I'm a medic with a minor in infantry. How's your family settling into life in western Georgia, by the way? Rick shrugged. Thankfully, it's pretty similar to life on an army base in California and to life on an army base in the Pacific Northwest. The scenery outside the fence line's a little different. But Tash has enjoyed the moving around, believe it or not. She'll be happy once we're unpacked, though. What about not being close to your families? I know you once told me you and your family aren't that close, or has that gotten better? It has, thankfully. My Aunt Dora used to visit us quite a bit while we were at Ord. The boys think of her as their grandmother since Mom died before they were born. Tasha's dad took a while, but he's finally warmed up to me. Do you get back to Fayetteville to visit with him much? I try to, Rick shrugged. Tasha and the boys have been more successful and Dan usually comes to us. One person flying to see five or six is easier than the other way around. Ready to get your knees in the breeze, Doc? Josh Brogan asked over the noise of airplane engines in late June. Forgive me, Sergeant, for I have sinned, Jeff joked. It has been two years since my last jump. Josh smirked at him. A devout Catholic, he remembered too many confessions through his years. You are forgiven, my son. For your penance, you must count to 6-1000 without shitting your pants tonight. At a terminal velocity of 180 feet per second, jumping from 1500 feet would yield less than an 8 second fall. If a paratrooper's chute didn't open by the count of 4-1000, he was trained to deploy his reserve, lest he fall to an altitude too low for a chute to work. Counting for 6 seconds would leave Jeff at an altitude of less than 400 feet. Thanks, Padre, but I'll take the zero on that. That sudden stop at the end will get you every time. Josh grinned and got the attention of the rangers near him. Ooh! Their fellows didn't disappoint. There was blood upon the risers. There were brains upon the chute. Jeff joined in the morbid chorus which soon took up the rest of the song. Intestines were a dangling from his paratrooper suit. He was a mess. They picked him up and poured him from his boots. And he ain't gonna jump no more. Gory, gory, what a hell of a way to die. G gory, gory, what a hell of a way to die. G gory, gory, what a hell of a way to die. He ain't gonna jump no more. The company laughed at the conclusion of the tune. Most people would question the mental health of paratroopers anyway, but the crew of the Air Force C-17 just shook their heads. These rangers were nuts.
July 4th found Jeff sitting in a lawn chair watching Enfield's annual parade as it wound down Main Street. The tradition was alive and well in the fertile Swift River Valley. He pointed out things he remembered from his childhood to his own kids while the groups marched past. His family stood to honor the flag when it would pass by. Both Jarrett families, Jack's and Lisa's, joined his on this glorious, sunny day. Lisa Jarrett seemed much more relaxed than the last time he saw her. I'll miss Tom for the rest of my days, Jeff, she said to him during the parade. We should have had so many more years together, shared so many other memories, but I have to look ahead for the girls. We remember the good times now, though, not the horrible end. How do the girls like Tompkins? They love it. Ashley still gripes she didn't get to have your mom as a math teacher while Kira did. But the whole staff there is wonderful. The girls love the sports, too. Ashley's trying out for the new girls hockey team this winter. She can't wait to be a babe on blades. How about you, Lisa? How's the move been for you? I won't lie, it was tough at first. I was trying to learn a new job, a new home, and a new reality all at the same time. Kathy and Jack have been amazing, though. They've known just how much help to give or not since I arrived. The whole community's been great, too. I loved where I grew up, but I love the valley even more. Even Jack's little son Tommy's helped. How so? I keep seeing flashes of Tom in him as he gets older, but he's also his own little person. Jack's not the same person Tom was, nor do I expect him to be, so Tommy won't be either. They were brothers, though, and very close growing up, so those flashes come through in Jack's son. Those little things helped me come to grips with Tom being gone, strangely enough. What's one of your favorite sayings? The only constant is change? Yep, he chuckled. Stand by to stand by. Jeff looked at the group of veterans approaching. He stood and wolf whistled at one of the men in formation. Tom Cavanaugh pointed in recognition, and Jeff sat back down. I've been meaning to ask you, but I heard you're not going to the barbecue afterward. No, Jeff said. Actually, I've changed my mind on that. We're going. Lisa and Keiko both looked at him. Even if Heather is there and chooses to ignore me, there will be plenty of other people there I'd like to see. It's getting close to fish or cut bait time, and I figure the hell with it. This is my hometown, and I'm not going to run and hide because of one person. Jeff stared at the ceiling of his former bedroom, at his parents' house in Enfield later that night. A confrontation at the town's July 4th cookout that afternoon troubled him and kept him from falling asleep. Keiko slept curled up against him, her head on his chest while his mind whirled. His friend TC walked up to Jeff's family while holding his son Jeff during the celebration. Other than a few phone calls during his extensive training, Jeff hadn't seen or talked to the man since October of 2001, almost two full years. He hadn't seen the boy named for him in all that time either. During their conversation, Jeffrey Pelly recognized Jeff's voice and reached for his vaguely remembered uncle. Like a safety intercepting a pass in football, Heather swooped in unseen and snatched her son from her husband's hands. TC was in the process of handing the boy to Jeff when she did so. The almost three-year-old began bawling at the rough treatment while his mother stomped away. Alice Cavanaugh looked mortified while her husband turned beet red in anger and embarrassment. The two fled the common with their daughter after that. T.C. disappeared into the staring crowd, dragging his petulant wife by the elbow. My husband, you must center yourself if you hope to sleep at all this night. Did I wake you, Keiko? Not directly, no, but I believe I could feel your tension even while asleep. I certainly feel it now. I'm sorry, I'll go sleep on the couch. You will do no such thing, Jeffrey, she hissed. You saw Alice and Tom's reaction to their granddaughter's behavior. Jane and TC's too. You still have many friends here. I know you have been friends with Heather for many years, and I do not mean to discount her friendship, but is it worth how she is treating you? She sighed. You said it yourself this afternoon. It is time to fish or cut bait. It is what it is. You have only a few days of leave remaining. Do not allow one incident, one person, to ruin it. He didn't have a reply, and Keiko soon fell back to sleep. Jeff sighed once more. 
He pushed the memory from his mind and let his weariness take him. Jeff reclined on his bunk while on the phone at Benning two weeks later. TC, as shitty as you feel about what happened at the cookout, the only other person's behavior you are responsible for in your family is Jeffrey's. I appreciate you saying that, Jeff. I really do. But I'm still shocked at how my wife treated you. Jane, Alice, and Tom are as well. It's not their fault. Still. Look, TC, Tom. You know I consider Heather my sister, or I did before this all started. Honestly, at this point, I've got other things to worry about which are starting to take precedence over your wife's feelings. Like what? I've got a platoon of rangers I'm responsible for now, at least medically. For all intents and purposes, once we deploy, I'll be their doctor, or PA, in the field. I need to keep track of their health at the most basic level, their allergies if any, and keep them alive if they are injured outside the wire. More important than that, I've got my wife and three kids I need to take care of before my deployment. I've got to make sure they'll be okay during and afterward, just in case. I'm sorry, TC, but I don't have time for your wife's temper tantrums. There was silence from the other end of the phone. Jeff came pretty close to a line you didn't cross. He was afraid he was about to lose his friend from basic training again. Jeff, at the risk of making you mad at me, can I ask you a question? TC asked a minute later. Yeah, go ahead. Your mom and I did basically the same thing to you after high school. Why didn't you cut us out of your life then? Jeff blew out a breath. How is this different? Is that what you're asking? I guess I am. I don't know, TC. I really don't. In your case, I think I understood what you were going through, even though I hadn't experienced something like that yet. When Ken was KIA two years later, I certainly did. Mom? I think I was too young to really understand the treatment I received. My friends helped me through it more than I realized back then, too. Now? Maybe it's the way Heather's been treating me or how long she's been treating me this way. Being isolated from friends and family is probably making it feel worse this time around. I've made friends everywhere I've been since re-enlisting, but there's still a hole there. 16th July 2003, 3D Ranger Battalion, Fort Benning, Georgia. The Army Deuce and a halves carrying Bravo Company to their training site for the day bounced down the track laughingly called a road. Bravo trained at the same site yesterday, brushing up on house clearing techniques. Tomorrow they would assault this site in a night raid after the Air Force dropped them on a DZ two miles away. I don't see how that's comfortable for you, Doc, Specialist Ruben Montes of 2D Platoon's 2D Squad commented while pointing to Jeff's rifle. Jeff glanced down at his M4. The angled grip on my rifle's forearm instead of a vertical one. He shrugged. The vertical grip doesn't feel right to me. Just preference, I guess, especially since we didn't have them the first time I was in. I guess it's because this grip feels more natural to me when I hold it a few different ways. I can pull the rifle back into my shoulder like this, help point it like this, lock my CE clamp grip like this. Like you keep telling us, if it's stupid but it works. Right? Exactly. After 10 minutes of jokes about being truck-borne rangers during the ride, and 5 minutes of bitching about the ride after climbing off the trucks, the company formed up for their briefing. The assault wasn't anything new. Even Jeff settled into the routine of the evolution. Which is why the op for the opposing force, likes their job so much. They like to catch people napping when they settle into a routine. A hidden door sprang open next to Jeff, while his platoon stalked down a hall trying to clear the second floor. Jeff reacted on pure instinct. The butt of his rifle shot out, striking the hiding enemy fighter on the padded chin of his safety helmet. The man dropped to the floor. Sal glanced at the fighter, then back up at Jeff. Jeff shrugged. Sal nodded to two of his rangers, and they secured the man. Within three minutes, the rangers cleared the floor and signaled the all-clear along with the rest of the company. Jeff went back to check the man he struck. Cutting the zip ties around his wrists and ankles, Jeff helped the man to his feet. The red-suited man blinked and swayed. You okay? Jeff asked. I wasn't expecting that, that's for sure. The man's eyes focused on Jeff after a moment. Sorry, gut instinct. I'm glad I was wearing the padded suit, he said while removing the suit's helmet. He ran a hand through a graying buzz cut. I didn't think they taught that anymore. 
I don't know if they're teaching that now with the collapsible stocks on the carbines, but when I went through basic, I was taught the old thrust slash butt stroke routine using a nice solid M16A1 rubber duck. Lucky me, the man muttered before moving his jaw from side to side. How long ago was that? 1987. The man gave him a look as they reached the top of the stairs. Well, help me down the stairs then, Methuselah. If I'm Methuselah, what does that make you? Me? It makes me think I'm way too old for this shit. Jeff pumped his fist at the end of the Red Sox game. The 2003 team was truly a sight to behold. They were putting a serious hurt on the rest of the American League, even if they didn't have the best record in their division. They owned the best team batting average and the best team slugging percentage in the American League. They were on pace to score the most runs in all of Major League Baseball. This new combination of Ortiz and Ramirez was the deadliest hitting duo he'd ever seen. Dare he dream this was the year? He remembered his father waking him up to watch a replay of Carlton Fisk's Game 6 home run in 1975, only to learn two days later the Sox lost the World Series to the Cincinnati Reds. He remembered the one-game playoff against the Yankees in 1978, where Carl Yastrzemski kicked forlornly at the warning track while Bucky Dent circled the bases. The train wreck at the end of World Series Game 6 in 1986. Many people forget there was still another game following that one's upsetting end. Heck, the Sox were the butt of a joke on Law & Order last season. Rooting for the Red Sox seemed to be a cycle of painful events at times. This new guy Miller, though, was the personality the Sox needed this year in Jeff's opinion. Brash, loud, opinionated, he seemed like a guy who could wake up the clubhouse and light the fire the team needed to get them over the hump. Along with Walker, Muller, Nixon, and a few others, Miller was part of Boston's Dirt Dogs, players not afraid to throw their bodies around and get the uniform dirty if that's what it took to win games. There was a feeling about this year's hometown team Jeff didn't remember from growing up. A Red Sox team flag hung proudly from the wall in his room. If you didn't like it, the door was right there, and you could close it behind you as you left. Dare I say they look pretty good this year? Rick Mendoza asked, echoing Jeff's earlier thought while the post-game highlight show started. With training early in the morning, Rick would stay in his barracks room tonight. They look damn good, Jeff replied while handing Rick another beer. They're not in first place, but they're right there in the wild card race. I like these guys this year. Don't folks from up your way say that every year? Only the last 85. Oh, is that all? Hey, Cubs fans have it worse. It's 95 years for them. Statistically, it's got to be our year eventually. I know. Yeah, but are you going to be around when that year comes? Happy birthday, husband. Thanks, Keiko. I wish I could be there with you guys tonight. Rick and Tasha had me over for dinner, but I'll miss cuddling up with you tonight. Like every night. I know, Jeffrey. I miss you lying next to me as well. However, you made a commitment when you re-enlisted two years ago, and you must honor that. And the commitment I made to you seven years ago, Keiko? The one that really started in 89 when I met you? Jeffrey, we have been over this many times, beginning on the night in 2001 when you first broached the idea of re-enlisting with me. In committing to protect the nation, you are protecting us by extension. To me, your service there is no different than your service as a paramedic here. You have not stopped serving since you enlisted in 1987. All that has changed is the size of the community you are serving. Jeff sighed. Keiko was right. They talked about his service almost every time they spoke. He'd bring it up and apologize for being gone. She'd remind him they agreed about the threat and what he was doing. How is your classroom coming together this year? He asked changing the subject. You only have about two weeks before your school year starts. It is almost ready. I should only need one or two more days to have it completed. So soon, Keiko chuckled. Your mother came out to watch the children last week and wound up coming by to see the room. The children played with their toys while your mother helped me set up. I believe she misses certain aspects of teaching already. Well, she has been retired for a whole school year which has been good for her. She looks more relaxed than I remember her while she was teaching. I'm surprised she was able to sit still over the last year. Do you not know, Jeffrey? Your mother walks every day. 
Some days she walks to your father's garage, eats lunch with him, and then walks home. Your mother has also become quite the amateur photographer. She keeps herself busy. She walks to dad's shop, that's like a seven mile round trip. It is shorter than that, Jeffrey. She takes the shorter route over Great Quabbin Hill. Okay, note to self. Don't ask mom if she wants to go for a walk when I get out of the army. A forced road march might be more fun. So what's this? Is the army giving us the option to carry different weapons? Jeff asked. He stood around a table with the company's NCOs and medics. On the table were pistols other than the military's 9mm Beretta M9, Sig Sauer pistols, similar to his 40 caliber pistol at home in Lancaster. Jeff bent closer to read the engraving on the slide of one. Only for certain SOCOM units at first, the armorer explained. The military's trying them out. They're calling the SIG the M11. May I? Jeff asked. He picked up the SIG 9 aminers when the armorer nodded. First making sure the pistol was empty and safe, Jeff tested the weight of it in his hand. There didn't seem to be any difference in the width compared to his SIG at home, despite the difference in caliber. Will there be any chance to fire these? Yes, after lunch we'll head to the range. At the range, Jeff fought to keep himself calm while he waited for his turn. He hadn't fired a pistol much since re-enlisting, and was like a little kid at Christmas. He walked the instructor through the function check on the weapon. He'd selected a number of holsters to compare carrying options. He wore one on his plate carrier, one on his hip, and one on his right thigh. Jeff loaded the pistol with practiced ease when his turn on the firing line came. The muzzle flipped less than his 40 caliber pistol. He took his time with the first 15 round magazine. When the instructor nodded, he loaded a second and ripped through it in under five seconds. He dropped that mag, made sure the weapon was clear and safe and placed it back in the thigh holster. That option already felt the most natural to him. The instructor whistled when they walked up to Jeff's target. All 30 rounds went through the center of the target inside the 10 ring, shredding the thin paper. Remind me never to piss you off, Doc. I used to practice a lot more. That's why this group's so loose. I used to shoot every week at home, sometimes more than that, mainly with my pistols. The rifle range wasn't always open. The instructor looked at Jeff out of the corner of his eye. So is it safe to say I should put you down for one of these? Well, I wish it was available in 40 S&W or 45 ACP, but beggars can't be choosers, I suppose. That's a yes, right? A second person sat in the company field medical officer's office when Jeff arrived for his bi-weekly meeting in mid-September. Morning, sir, Jeff said while saluting CPT Blackburn. Morning, Sergeant, come on in. Jeff, I'd like to introduce you to Lieutenant Steve Perry. He's going to be Bravo Company's new PA and medic liaison officer. Steve, this is Sergeant Jeff Knox, 2D Platoon's medic. Good to meet you, sir. Sergeant, 1LT Perry didn't seem all that enthusiastic about liaising with medics. Captain, before I forget to ask, is it okay to grab some of the stuff that's expiring soon in the stockroom to practice with? Sure, Jeff. What's catching your eye this month? The captain asked. Well, sir, Riley says there's two cases of 3-0 sutures about to expire in there. We've got that load of open cell foam blocks we use to simulate human tissue. It's not perfect, but it'll work. Sounds like good training. If Sergeant Riley has any concerns, have him give me a call. Jeff opened his mouth to answer CPT Blackburn, but the newcomer interrupted him. Forgive me, sir, but are you sure that's appropriate? The lieutenant asked. CPT Blackburn and Jeff shared a look. Carry on, Sergeant. Well, no meeting this week. Roger, sir. Rangers lead the way. Jeff saluted the captain, nodded to the lieutenant, and scorched the carpet, leaving the office. Close the door, lieutenant, the captain said. 1LT Perry did so and turned around. CPT Blackburn was right behind him, already in his face. You got a problem with how I run my command, Lieutenant? No, sir. Then don't ever question my orders like that again. How old are you? Sir? 25, sir. And how long have you been a PA in the Army? I've been a PA for two years, sir. I've been in the Army for under a year. Fort Sam for Medical Corps OBC after I received my direct commission, and then Ranger School, sir. 
Lieutenant, that sergeant who just left has been practicing his branch of medicine for close to half of your life. He spent almost two years in training just to get here. He's still recovering from ranger school. But he'll test himself again by trying to earn his expert field medical badge next week. He'll give it everything he has like he always does. I have no doubts he'll pass. If you know anything about the EFMB, you'll know that's not a given. Here at Cozy Fort Benning, he's not going to be doing much suturing. But once we deploy, he'll likely do more than you will. He's getting ready now for a deployment months in the future. Over there, he'll practice what they call austere medicine. He'll be the one trying to keep his platoon, almost 40 of his friends, alive, often while far out of contact. Carrying a pharmacy's worth of meds, he'll know backward and forward, in addition to 10 pounds of other medical supplies. While he's at it, he'll hump a combat load weighing well in excess of 50 pounds, if not more. Unless I miss my guess, Sergeant Knox will carry close to half his body weight while climbing up and down the sides of the mountains of Afghanistan. While he's doing that, you'll likely be sitting at the support hospital sipping coffee. They call men like him Doc for a damn good reason. So, Lieutenant, if you'd like to set the record for the shortest assignment in Army history, keep questioning me and the men under my command. Jeff made sure the wires for his headphones ran under his t-shirt and down his back. This would keep them out of the way during his workout. He selected a type of song from his iPod he wouldn't normally listen to, set the song to repeat, and pressed play. The style and tempo of the music fit his intended workout. Before the music began, Jeff picked up one of the simplest and most effective pieces of workout equipment ever devised, the jump rope. Soon a techno beat began pounding in his ears. With his eyes closed and head down, Jeff allowed the music to take him to the place he needed to be. He bounced in time with the beat for three or four seconds to get his rhythm. He looked up and started his workout. Jeff increased the speed of the rope's orbit around his body once warmed up. Rather than the playground hops of children, Jeff's jump roping resembled that of a boxer. He bounced twice on one foot before switching to the opposite foot and then back in time with the music's beat. He liked this warm-up because he could think about other things once at a constant speed. His mind ran through protocols, treatments, and medications while his muscles took care of the workout. Sweat began to soak through his t-shirt. The one he wore today was a dark maroon, which turned almost black when it absorbed his perspiration. Its back sported a giant, distressed, golden caduceus with the word Doc stenciled boldly across it. He long ago embraced the title. The front simply read 91B on the left chest in the same golden color. There was a good reason Jeff selected the jump rope as his warm-up. His primary workout would be on the heavy bag today. The bouncing during his jump roping foreshadowed the footwork he would use when working the bag. He bobbed his head in time with the beat of the song while walking over to it. He wrapped his hands before slipping on the boxing gloves. The heavy bag in front of him hung down from its bracket on chains and was chained to the floor to keep it from swaying too much. Like his workouts at home, his first strikes on the bag weren't very hard, though that changed in a hurry. Allowing the rhythmic beat to keep driving him, his blows soon took on an arrhythmic character. If the bag were a live opponent, it wouldn't have been able to pin down the timing of his next punch or kick. Jeff prowled around the bag, reversed course at irregular intervals, and struck from unexpected directions. He launched brief flurries before starting to circle again. Kicks aimed low on the bag rattled the chain, holding it down, and the noise echoed across the gym. Those not familiar with Jeff's workouts tried to keep their minds on their own and not be distracted by the power he unleashed. Those who'd seen him over the previous months glanced over and went back to their workouts. There wasn't a dry spot on his shirt after 20 minutes. With blood pounding in his ears, Jeff walked over to the empty tumbling mat where he did his warm-up, turned off the iPod, and put it in his bag before kneeling. He closed his eyes, centered himself, and brought his heart rate down below 60 within minutes. The energy from his workout burned deep in his core, waiting. Jeff rose and began his kata. There was nothing in his mind but the forms he practiced. The stored energy bled off while he did them the sweat rolling down his face and neck which cooled him as it evaporated off his shirt, the crash of the weights in the gym, the hum of conversations. He ignored all of it. 
Jeff used his time in the gym as a workout, inside a workout. The frenzy at the start simulated combat or other stressful environment and got his adrenaline flowing. The meditation and kata were ways to practice purging that adrenaline and calming himself so he could treat his rangers. He'd try meditation alone at some point to see if that worked for him as well. That was impressive, Sergeant, Jeff heard while toweling off his face. He moved the towel and saw one LT Perry standing in front of him. Thank you, sir, he replied in a neutral tone. Jeff's face gave nothing away. Sergeant, I want to apologize to you for my tone yesterday. I'd been here for all of half a second, and I was way out of line to question your dedication to your platoon. I'm the PA assigned to work with the medics of Bravo Company, and I'd very much like to have a good working relationship before and during our deployment. I'd like to start over, with you in particular, if we could. Of course, sir, Jeff said with a more genuine voice. At least he admitted he was wrong, he thought. Not everyone can do that. May I ask what song you were working out to? The lieutenant asked after they shook hands to restart their acquaintance. Confusion by New Order, sir. I'm afraid I've never heard of them. They're a British post-punk and dance rock band. They formed in 1980, broke up in 93, then got back together in 98. Have you ever seen the movie Blade, sir? Sure, I was halfway through college when it came out. Damn, kids! Do you remember the scene at the start of the movie, the one in the nightclub? That song? That'll get you moving, that's for sure. That it will, the one from the movie's a remix. The original doesn't sound like that. Jeff caught a whiff of himself. With your permission, sir, I'd like to head back to the barracks and get cleaned up before dinner. Of course, Sergeant. I'd like to sit down with you after you test for your EFMB and discuss what you need for training and support from me. Absolutely, sir. It'll be about midweek before I get back to you. I'm testing on Monday and Tuesday. One more win and your Red Sox are headed to the World Series. Nine innings is a long time, Rick, especially for a Sox fan when they're in the playoffs. They gotta get all 27 of those outs before I'll be happy. They sat in the Bravo Company day room with other baseball fans before Game 7 of the 2003 ALCS. You're quite the pessimist, you know. The glass isn't half empty, it's half empty with a hole at the bottom. Okay, Rick replied, pretending to write a reminder in a notebook. Don't make Bones the morale officer. Don't be so negative, Rick. I would be an excellent low morale officer. His platoon sergeant glared at him. Okay, I know you don't quite get it, but when it comes to the socks, we expect the worst while we hope for the best. You could root for a different team. A different team? Dream on. Game 7 started off well for the Red Sox, as they jumped out to a 4-0 lead by the middle of the fourth inning. Yankees slugger Jason Giambi touched the Sox's ace Pedro Martinez for a solo home run in the bottom of the fifth. Then again in the seventh, however. Well, at least Pedro got out of the seventh still leading by two, Jeff said while nursing his third beer of the night. David Ortiz brought Boston's lead back up to three runs with a solo home run of his own in the top of the eighth. That would be the only run of the inning for the visiting Red Sox. Okay, six outs to go now. Williamson comes in for the bottom of the eighth, Timlin for the ninth, and we're in like Flynn. Jeff stood and put his now empty beer bottle on the table to his right. Uh, Doc? Steve Cunna, a private first class from 2D Platoon's 2D squad, asked. Jeff didn't like the sound of that. He straightened and turned. There was Pedro Martinez jogging back out to the mound. What the hell is Grady doing? He muttered in horror. Pedro looked tired last inning. He's got Williamson and Timlin warming in the pen. They've been lights out all series. Let them pitch. Jeff watched in continued horror while Martinez gave up a double to Yankees shortstop Derek Jeter, followed by a single to center fielder Bernie Williams. Manager Grady Little emerged from the dugout after the Williams single. Thank God. Grady will pull Petey, put a fresh arm in there, and they'll end this. Jeff saw Little pat his ace on the arm and walk away after a brief conference on the mound. Martinez remained in the game. No, you can't be fucking serious. But the baseball gods were serious. Martinez gave up two more runs, allowing the Yankees to tie the game at five before the inning finally ended. Jesus Christ, guys, Jeff muttered, 
taking off his Red Sox hat and running a hand through his buzz cut. On the screen, the crowd at Yankee Stadium cheered wildly. The Sox and Yankees both failed to score in the ninth, sending the game to extra innings. Mariano Rivera, the brilliant Yankees closer, stayed in the game during the 10th inning and held the Sox scoreless again. Tim Wakefield, the winning pitcher for Boston in games one and four, came into the game to pitch the bottom of the 10th. Why is Wakefield pitching? Asked Frank Paulos from 3D Platoon. It's game seven of the ALCS, replied Kunha, a Minnesota Twins fan. There's no point in saving him for the World Series if they can't reach the World Series. Plus, he's a gamer. The team is what's important, so he'll do whatever he needs to do to help them win. Tim Wakefield helped the team by pitching an inning of scoreless relief. Unfortunately, Rivera's third scoreless inning matched his effort. Aaron Boone, the Yankees' third baseman, stepped to the plate as their first batter of the bottom of the 11th. He immediately tore the hearts out of Red Sox Nation by crushing Wakefield's first pitch of the inning into the left field seats for a game-ending home run. Jeff stared at the television. He sat with his elbows on his knees and his hands covering his mouth while his eyes watered. Again? Damn it, no. The cameras cut away from the exuberant celebrations of the Yankees and their fans to a shot of Tim Wakefield walking off the mound. His eyes watered too, while his mouth twisted with the pain he felt at letting his team and its fans down. Oh, Timmy, it's not your fault, Jeff thought to the longtime Sox pitcher. It's that fucking Grady's fault. He's so gone, it's not even funny. Jeff couldn't watch anymore. He rose from his chair, straightened the Red Sox hat on his head, smoothed the front of his Red Sox sweatshirt, and walked out of the room with his head held high despite his team's performance. The Boston Red Sox, my team win or lose. The two dozen other baseball fans were silent while he left. Even the Yankees fans in the room were quiet. They celebrated the win at first, but stopped when they saw Jeff's face. He was a fellow Ranger, even if he did root for the unluckiest team in baseball. Jeff trudged up the stairs and made the long walk down the hall to his room. He locked the door to his room behind himself, but didn't turn on the light. He sat in his desk chair and stared at his Red Sox flag, lit only by the glare from the lights of the parking lot which shined through his window. He whispered into the dark space while his heart continued to break. Aaron fucking Boone. The Yankees fans in the company gave Jeff a wide berth over the following week until he fired a shot across their bow. Hey, you dirty Yankees fans are the ones who don't know how to use soap, not me. My baseball team may stink, but I personally do not. I should be avoiding you. He still wore his Red Sox hat whenever possible. Jeff felt a small measure of redemption when the Yankees lost to the upstart Florida Marlins in the World Series, four games to two. Jeff sat in his barracks room with 2D Platoon's NCOs, drinking beer following a company live fire exercise in early November. His room was the most spacious, assigned to the NCOs. Most of the younger rangers were off post, getting into whatever trouble they could before lights out. You were holding yourself back today, Doc, Josh Brogan said. What do you mean, Josh? A couple of times it looked like you wanted to light into my newbies. You had things under control, Josh, so why would I have needed to? You set them straight. Yeah, but if I or my team leaders hadn't, I think Sergeant Doc would have made an appearance. The other squad leaders saw Jeff frown. Sergeant Doc appeared when Jeff needed to remind people he was an NCO. That happened when people thought they could get away with stuff around him when their NCO wasn't nearby. Hey, Doc, don't sweat it. It needed to be done. We were playing with real bullets today. These kids needed to wake up before they killed someone, Jeff muttered, finally responding to the squad leader's point of why Jeff wanted to yell at the new men. It was like they thought it was a game or something. They'll be rfs if they don't wise up. You on the other hand, Bones, are absolutely locked in and focused in the field, Rick said. A totally unforgiving warrior. Totally. It's such a change from your normal personality that it catches my attention every time especially now that I'm not an overawed private in your squad. Jeff drank from his beer and offered a quote, as he often did to illustrate a point. In peace there's nothing so becomes a man, as modest stillness and humility, but when the blast of war blows in our ears and then imitate the action of the tiger, stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard-favored rage, 
There are no points for second place in war, gents, he reminded his fellows. Is that Shakespeare again? Rick asked. Yes, from Henry V. Rick shook his head and snorted. Did you swallow all of Shakespeare's work at some point or something? You seem quote him every time I turn around. One of Keiko's first gifts to me was a copy of Henry V. She said that it had a number of examples of good leadership traits, and those examples are neatly wrapped in an adventure story, too. Rick rolled his eyes this time. Hey, Trace and I are probably going into town to get new tattoos soon. You guys want to come with us? Sal asked. I'll have to think about it, Sal, but probably, Jeff replied. Rick and the others nodded in agreement also. I've got an idea for one I've been kicking around. Yeah? Remember the back of Tom Hanks' helmet in Saving Private Ryan? Yeah, he had the World War II 2D Ranger Battalion recognition flash over a vertical officer recognition stripe on the back. Right. So my idea would be a tattoo of an orange lozenge, that stretch diamond, with a three for our battalion on it, and a horizontal stripe for an NCO behind it. I like it, Trace said right away. Simple. Clean. The others nodded in agreement. The thick forest flashed by as the flight of Blackhawks skimmed the treetops. One minute, the chopper's crew chief yelled over the noise of the rotors. The whole platoon repeated the message to make sure everyone knew their ride was about to end. Thirty seconds. The trees vanished when the clearing of the landing zone appeared below them. Their platoon's helicopters flared to bring the aircraft to a hover where they would disembark. The others in the flight sped by to their LZs. Just before the craft leveled out, the crew chief gave two last commands. Stand by. Go. Thick ropes dropped from the aircraft. Before they uncoiled fully, the first rangers slid down. Within 20 seconds, the entire platoon had landed and sprinted away. The helicopters dropped the ropes and raced to catch up with the other ships. In ordered fashion, 2D platoon regrouped. They melted into the woods surrounding the LZ. They cleared the landing zone before someone came to investigate why a helicopter paused in flight there. The platoon's woodland BDUs and facial camouflage paint combined to make them near invisible in the surrounding foliage. Only movement might catch an enemy's eye, which would be the last thing they'd ever see. The platoon's passage generated little sound. This wasn't a high school group on a nature hike crashing through the woods. These were rangers, professionals whose lives relied on stealth. After an hour of careful maneuvering, their point man, Specialist Montes, signaled a halt. They knelt where they were and scanned the forest around them. Montes signaled for the lieutenant to come to the front. Two LT snow crept forward. The platoon went to ground behind cover. Jeff rose when signaled. When the patrol resumed their single file movement, he caught the briefest glimpse of other soldiers. This was their rendezvous with 3D platoon. Both platoons pressed on to their objective as a new combined unit. Another 30 minutes passed before hand gestures signaled that they'd arrived. They waited in silence, spread out below the crest of a low ridge overlooking the enemy compound, a loose cluster of five buildings. Jeff glanced at his watch. The attack would begin in 10 minutes unless their commanders saw something they didn't like. It was just shy of 1300 when the attack kicked off. The lieutenant's watch must be fast. The deep, deadly chatter of M240B machine guns split the calm of the day. The rest of their force fired down at the enemy with the lighter pop of 5.56 millennia rounds. Jeff, in his peripheral vision, saw flashes to his right. This was the other half of the company, first and fourth platoons, the assault element. The assault commander fired a red star cluster, a flare, over the target to call for a shift in fire after 30 seconds. The overwatch element would fire into the back of the compound to pin the enemy in place. A curtain of lead would hit them if they tried to run. Ten seconds later, a distant whistle blast signaled the assault. When the assault force reached a certain point, a command to cease fire rippled down the line. The guns of the overwatch fell silent. Jeff's half of the company swept down the ridge and joined the other half at the objective once it was secure. While the others set up a security screen around the perimeter of the compound, Jeff moved in to provide medical support. The assault element leader spotted him. He pointed to Jeff's nine o'clock, his left. He found the casualty there, a wounded soldier who lay on his back. 
a combat lifesaver knelt next to him. Jeff read the casualty card around the soldier's neck. Twenty-year-old, breathing but unconscious with blood visible on the chest and thigh, soaking through his BDUs. A combat lifesaver, who was about to establish an IV, will assist you as you direct. E-Train, get his molly vest off and open his blouse while I check his legs, Jeff ordered. On it, Doc, Specialist Eric Trainer of 1st Platoon replied. Jeff checked the casualty's left thigh. The man tapped him on the arm and handed him another card. Eric, I've got an arterial bleed here. I'm placing a tourniquet. Jeff placed the tourniquet above the wound. He tightened it until the pulse in the casualty's foot disappeared. He loosened it when the evaluator nodded. This was only an exercise. He helped E-Train remove the casualty's molly vest and scanned the man's bloody chest. Another card popped up when he palpated the area. Jeff grabbed his stethoscope and monitored the soldier's lung sounds. When the evaluator told Jeff what they were, he pulled bandaging supplies from his bag to treat a sucking chest wound. He and his CLS partner finished treating the wounded soldier just as the exercise ended. Good job, Sergeant Specialist, their grader, 1LT Perry, said. Thank you, sir, they responded. You were full of good news just now, weren't you, Mick? Jeff teased the man playing the wounded soldier. Sure and I was that for certain, Sean Murphy quipped in a pretend Irish accent. Jeff and E-Train stifled laughter. Jeff produced a long, thick IV catheter from his medic bag. Eric, hold Mick down. He's not going to like this part. Jeff uncapped the needle and began looking for the space between Sean's second and third rib on the injured side of his chest. Sean's eyes widened and the evaluator began to laugh. Jeff, it's not nice to tease the casualty, 1LT Perry pointed out. It's not nice to tease the medic either, sir. I haven't popped someone's chest in almost five years. Telling me Mick's got attention pneumo is a big-time tease. Let me dart him just once. Please? I got to practice applying a tourniquet. I doubt Captain Blackburn or Lieutenant Colonel Fisher would find that so funny. I sure as shit don't. Sean said, wide-eyed and without a trace of an Irish lilt. One LT Perry laughed again. Put the needle away, Jeff. Jeff did as he was told. Sean Murphy made a miraculous recovery and bolted away toward the AAR area. Was it something I said? Jeff asked. Jeff sat in his room listening to his iPod. He tapped his fingers on his leg in time with the tune coming from the speakers plugged into the music player. Hey, Bones. Hey, Rick. Have a seat. Want something to drink? I wouldn't turn down a beer. Jeff handed him a bottle. What's that? Rick asked, waving at the paper in Jeff's hand. Jeff handed it across. Before Rick could read it, the song changed. Who's this? The Hooters. This is their song, Satellite. What's that they sing in the first verse? Jeff restarted the song. Hush, little baby, don't cry like that. God's gonna buy you a Cadillac and he's chosen you to do his will. You can spread the word in your coupe de ville. Rick's eyebrows rose. Man, that will piss some people off if they hear that song. The whole song's a send-up of the televangelists who constantly have their hands out. You know the ones who make wild claims about dying if their followers don't send in millions of dollars by a certain day. What does God need with a starship? What's that? A line from the end of Star Trek V. Rick turned his attention back to the paper in his hand. Hey, this is great. So you'll get another stripe in a few months? Yeah. Ito, here I come. You'd better start racking up the promotion points before I catch up to you. Let's see, since you re-upped, you've been to AIT and RIP, where you kicked ass. And then to SOCM and Ranger School, where you kicked more ass. That's not counting the PT tests you keep maxing, the EFMB you earned, or the two excellent NCO ears you've gotten since you've been here. If I remember correctly, Captain Blackburn wrote, Excellent. Recommend promotion as soon as possible on your evals. That had to have been a thousand points right there. I was under direct orders to kick said ass, Jeff chuckled, remembering his wife's instructions. Dizzy and Goofy both have more time in the battalion than I do. It almost doesn't seem fair. I'll slot in as the second most senior medic in the company behind Gill. Gill... SSG Newman was the company's senior medic. Dizzy and Goofy 
Specialists Chuck Gonzalez and Nick Dijkstra had two and three months, respectively, more time in Bravo Company than Jeff did. No offense to Dizzy and Goofy, but Rick stopped to listen to the new song coming from Jeff's speakers. Who's this now? Men Without Hats. Safety Dance. Rick shook his head. Where do you find this shit? Rick, I grew up on this shit, remember? Who do you listen to again? The Backstreet Boys? Very funny, old man. So what did the x-ray show? Josh asked a month later. Gil has a comminuted fracture of his right tibia and a simple fibular fracture, Jeff answered. He shattered his shin bone and broke the one behind it too. That's why his leg looked as bad as it did after he landed. So he'll be out for a while, right? At least six months, if not longer. With that kind of injury, he'll likely get RFM'd. Man, that sucks. You'll be the company's senior medic then, right? Looks like it. I'll cut you guys some slack on bowing to me when I pass by. Don't take too long to get with the program, though. You'll be the one bowing when you bend down to kiss my ass? Both men laughed. How are your socks looking this year? They picked up some big names in the off-season. Schilling and Fulk are big for sure. I hope this kid Bellhorn is a good replacement for Todd Walker. Those are some big shoes to fill. I remember Francona from when he was managing Philly, but didn't follow him too closely while he was there. I'll wait to see how these new folks fit in with the rest of the personalities in the clubhouse. What about Rodriguez signing with the Yankees instead of Boston? That overpaid prima donna, Jeff snorted. He can kiss my ass. He didn't impress me when he was with Texas. The Sox are better off without him. The Yankees fans here are convinced his arrival means they'll win another championship now. They can kiss my ass too, Jeff chuckled. I'll settle for not having my heart stomped on again this year, honestly. I'd rather the Sox sucked from the start than collapse at the end. Rick Mendoza stuck his head into Josh's room. There you guys are. Hey, it's our illustrious leader, quipped Josh. Funny, you won't be laughing in a second, I'm afraid, Josh. That doesn't sound good, Jeff muttered. Nope. After you pin your new rank on Jeff for your promotion present, the armies told us we're deploying a week later. Jeff sighed. Once more into the breach, dear friends, once more. Term 8, 2004, outside Fort Benning, Columbus, Georgia. Keiko sat on Jeff's lap at their hotel in Columbus. Keiko and the kids flew down for the Memorial Day holiday with both sets of parents. The children slept in the adjoining room. Jeff would be part of the ceremonies on Monday, honoring the fallen who gave their lives for their country. Their families were here to watch and be with him as he left to put his life on the line. Keiko, I can't imagine this will be your favorite subject, but we need to talk about what I've put in place if I don't come home. He felt his wife stiffen. I don't want to put this off any longer. No, you are right, Jeffrey, Keiko sighed. It is a subject which warrants discussion. I am guessing you have already set funds set aside for the children? The accounts we have been meaning to establish for them? Yes, there are funds for each of their educations and separate general trust funds. I'm also naming you my proxy in any business related to Neptune's Forge. I trust Satcha to be honest with you and give you the pros and cons to whatever she presents you. Does she contact you frequently? We talk occasionally, but not with any frequency. She says she likes to keep me in the loop, though, since we own 13% of her company. I do not understand how their products work. I don't either, Keiko. Beyond the basic theory of fusion, that is. You have common sense, which is more important than technical knowledge for us at this point. Thankfully, Sacha and her team have it as well. They balance that common sense with the daring needed to innovate. Is there more? Yes. My will leaves everything to you in the event of my death. That's probably no surprise to you. There's also a separate living will, which makes your temporary proxy permanent and spells out certain medical wishes. In the event I become mentally incapacitated as a result of injuries sustained. And when you come home? There was no if for Keiko. There are certain parts of the wills which will automatically update if, sorry, when, I return alive and unharmed. Keiko asked no further questions, but sat silently in her husband's strong arms. I am scared, Jeffrey, 
she said in a whisper. I won't tell you not to be, Keiko. Part of me is as well. There are thousands of troops deployed right now, and though the percentage of them who return wounded, or not at all, is low, it's not zero. That low percentage is scant comfort to the families who are living with the aftermath. I know I don't need to explain that to you or your parents. I want to see the kids grow up, finish school and live their lives. I want to see the amazing people they will become. To see them fall in love, see them marry, and have children of their own. If they choose another path, I will be happy for that too. Most of all, I want to be by your side to watch that happen and grow old with you. I want to see your face when you hold our first grandchild for the first time. I'm leaving to fight a battle I believe our country should fight. The Taliban gave aid and comfort to an enemy, one which attacked us in the most brutal way. They both need to be put down and put down hard for that reason alone. The Taliban still hold the southern and southwestern portions of Afghanistan. And if what I hear in the news is correct, they still support active terrorist training camps in those regions. We need to make sure the Northern Alliance captures those areas and destroys those camps, or we need to do it ourselves. Our government seized all the Taliban's assets they could identify in this country and shut off their funding sources. Our military operations are draining their bank accounts too. To get through this deployment, I need to be confident in my skills and those of the soldiers in my unit. We are trained as well as anyone out there. We train often and we train with intensity. Sometimes I think the saying work hard, play hard was invented for people in the military, rangers in particular. Yeah, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear no evil because we're the fucking meanest sons of bitches in the whole damn valley. Keiko couldn't hold her fears inside any longer. She began to sob. Let it out, Keiko. You've been so incredibly strong these last three years. I know you've been putting on a brave face for our families, and for the kids in particular, but let what you've been hiding go. Her tears soon soaked his shirt. I love you, Jeffrey, she sniffed. And I you, my Keiko-chan. I've loved you since the day we met. I believe we still have many years together yet to come, in spite of my preparations. Former rangers stood with active duty members on the shores of Victory Pond for the Memorial Day ceremony at the Ranger Memorial. Time may have softened some of the veterans' bodies, but it hadn't taken the fire from their eyes nor the steel from their spines. Jeff wouldn't want to be on the wrong end of their displeasure, even now. While Jeff and his mates heard the names of the fallen, the older men remembered the men behind those names. Men who scaled the cliffs at Pointe du Hoc, teared up at the memories of friends, fellow warriors, 60 years after D-Day. Jeff saw Keiko in the stands watching the proceedings, bow her head while remembering her brother. Ken hadn't been a ranger, but this day was set aside to honor all of the nation's fallen. By this time, Jeff's three kids knew he would deploy next week. He was glad they understood why they were here and not lying on a beach somewhere. Regimental headquarters and 3D battalion hosted a cookout for everyone after the ceremony. This was the battalion's informal send-off. Jeff's kids found ready playmates and the other children at the party. Shrieks and the sound of young laughter filled the area. Active rangers who hadn't deployed before listened to the stories told by both former and current rangers who had. The stories were of their departed friends of the shit they pulled in the barracks and off post together. Not combat, for the most part. The men cried because they laughed so hard at some of the stories. The wives and girlfriends sat in a quiet, gloomy group thinking about the impending separations. They would soon say goodbye to their men. Some would never see them again. Those who lived through a deployment before put on brave faces and tried to comfort those who hadn't. Keiko, Mayumi, and Marisa were silent. The only extended deployment experience two of them could share would be the kind none of the other families wanted to think about. When Jeff's family gathered back at the hotel, the men noticed their wives were very quiet. Nothing was said while the children were awake. Neither of the mothers said anything until they were alone in their rooms with the dads. In contrast, Keiko remained silent for the entire night, even when curled up next to Jeff in their bed. Jeff could feel her tension, 
her not wanting to unload her fears on him again, this close to his departure. Army and 3D battalion flags whipped in the breeze. Colored campaign streamers fluttered above those flags. They flashed and snapped in their own rhythm. The battalion stood at ease in formation on the parade field, listening to the muckety-muck speaking from the podium. The soldiers' thoughts were of their deployment less than 24 hours away, not the speeches. Their separation, once months away, now loomed over the families sitting in the stands like the crest of a giant wave. They once hoped it wouldn't break over them, but it was now inevitable. The speeches sounded good on TV, but stole dwindling time from the soldiers and their loved ones. Finally, the command, Fallout, came. The unit dissolved into individual family groups. Wives and children clung to their soldiers after the ceremony. Most drifted away to be alone. The Knox family was no exception. This was 3D Battalion's official send-off. Its rangers would load onto the C-17s, taking them to war early tomorrow. Jeff's family stayed in Columbus to be with him as much as possible before he deployed. Keiko would use up her time off because of two days' delay in the battalion's departure. But her principal told her not to worry about it. Carl Hammond wasn't a veteran, but, as the principal of a school, where almost 25% of students had at least one parent in the military, he understood the stresses of a family facing deployment. Keiko, who hadn't been out at all this school year, earned considerable leeway. Keiko and the kids drove Jeff to the 3D battalion area the next morning. No one there raised an eyebrow at the sight of Jeff carrying his daughter over from the parking lot. Other rangers repeated the scene numerous times before the 0700 assembly time. He put Sabrina down so he could say goodbye to the boys. I love you guys, Jeff said to Alex and Ryan. You take care and I'll be back before you know it. Figures you'd leave while the socks are doing so well his oldest, now seven, remarked while fighting tears. We'll go to Fenway together after I get home, Alex. I'll get some awesome seats and we'll all go, okay? Alex nodded while trying not to cry. Boys don't cry, he kept thinking. You'll have to sit through a Bruins game at the garden with your brother and sister in return, though. Jeff noticed the looks on both boys' faces. It's okay to cry, guys. Don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. Ryan near tears himself shook his head. Mom and Sabrina will start if we do. Jeff ruffled their hair before turning back to his daughter. I love you, princess. I'll write as often as I can. Sabrina nodded, burst into tears, and nearly popped his head off with a hug around his neck. That set everyone else off. When their tears stopped, Sabrina stepped back to let her father say goodbye to her mother. The boys put their arms around their sister to comfort her. Keiko kissed Jeff harder than she ever had in her life. Come back to me, Jeffrey, she pleaded in a whisper. Third Battalion, fall in, echoed through the area before he could reply. I will, Keiko. I love you. Jeff kissed her again before he hustled away to join Bravo Company. Keiko knelt behind their three kids and hugged them while they watched their father march away. I'll be glad to get off this damn plane. Rick Mendoza said for the third time that hour. Careful, Rick, cautioned Jeff. You're gonna hurt the nice Air Force crew's feelings. With as long as we've been on this flight, they're probably ready to open the ramp and tell us to get out and walk from 30,000 feet up. We had that layover at Ramstein. That was so they could pump the toilets out. We got real food out of that layover instead of another MRE. MRE, Rick snorted. Three lies for the price of one, and that meal wasn't more than a drive-by. We barely sat down. I think we got more time to eat at airborne school. You're not going to be Debbie Downer for our whole deployment, are you? That'll make for a long 12 months. If I can't bitch to you, Bones, who am I going to bitch to? I thought bitching went up the chain of command. Yeah, but you're not in my chain of command, so it's even better. I can bitch to you all I want. It's going to be a really long year, I see, Jeff replied while massaging his temple. The Air Force crew began passing the word they would land in ten minutes. The C-17 bumped down on the unseen runway. There weren't any windows in the Southern Thien's cargo area Jeff could see out of. Bravo Company formed up on the tarmac behind their plane and began marching toward the terminal building. A breeze from the northwest brought an unpleasant odor. 
Okay, that's vile, commented Emilio Reyes, a private on his first deployment. Nay. Yeah, I don't know what Getty meant when he sang about the fragrance of Afghanistan, but I'm sure that wasn't it, Jeff replied while biting back the urge to vomit. Who? Trace asked. Getty Lee, the lead singer of Rush. That's one of the lines from their song, A Passage to Bangkok. Then what the hell is that? Reyes asked. They're probably burning the dried fecal matter from the latrines. The what? The shit, Emilio. The dried shit from the latrines, Jeff said. Where do you think the phrase shit detail comes from? They must have older model deployable latrine recyclers here. With those models, you have to manually remove the solids, douse them with diesel fuel, and light them on fire. They send the recycled water to the fusion generators as fuel. The current models incinerate the solids internally. Ultra-high temperatures and a two-stage incineration process eliminates most of the smell, too. How do you know so much about the latrine units, Doc? Asked DJ Schulteis. Ensuring proper sanitation in camp is part of my job description, as is knowing how to achieve that. Bravo Company and the rest of 3D Battalion marched through the gates of a sprawling, fenced-off area with several large tents. Bravo remained inside the area and in formation for five minutes, while the other companies filed into some of those tents. They were told to hold all questions as they waited. A tent large enough for their whole company was their destination after the wait. An officer stepped to the front of the tent. Men, he began once Bravo Company sat. My name is Captain Sears from CENTCOM J3. Welcome to Afghanistan and Bagram Air Base. When you leave this briefing, you will receive one full magazine for your M4s. Those of you carrying an M9 or M11 will receive one mag for that weapon as well. No ammunition will be issued for your machine guns, nor grenades for your 203s while inside the wire. You'll get that before you leave for any missions. You may seat the magazines in your weapon, but your weapons are to remain on safe, and you will not chamber around. We are seeing an increase in what we're beginning to call green-on-blue violence. That is trusted Afghans in uniforms, opening fire on U.S. or Allied forces. The policy of unloaded weapons inside the wire left those blue forces helpless, hence the change. The north, south, and west sides of the base, the sides of the base closest to the city of Bagram, currently have completed barrier walls of offset, back-to-back -back HESCO bastions topped by a third. The perimeter wall is not yet finished to our east, though that gap is closing every day and is controlled with rolls of concertina. There's a cozy idea, Jeff thought. The possibility of enemy inside the wire. Just what we need. The Taliban still hold most areas in and around Kandahar and Helmand provinces. The Afghans have not experienced much success in rooting out the insurgents in that area. To date, U.S. policy has been to provide support to the Afghans without directing their policy in their country. That is about to change. We will be taking the fight to the Taliban rather than hanging back and waiting for our hosts to take care of things. While other units will concentrate on patrolling, getting to know the people in their AORs and the main enemy strongholds there, your battalion will be CENTCOM's troubleshooters. Your combat power will be brought to bear in areas where we've run into difficulty. Two companies will be assigned to the four southernmost provinces, while the other two companies will be responsible for necessary missions in the rest of the country. I wonder how much door kicking will do on those necessary missions, Rick asked under his breath. Our fair share, I'm sure, Jeff replied in the same manner. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when we come for you? Bad boys, bad boys. This ain't TV and this ain't cops, Rick. I won't be reading anybody their rights. The briefing lasted another few minutes before the captain cut them loose. The company filed past tables outside and received their ammunition allotment. They were directed to 3D Battalion's area once back in formation. Be it ever so humble, there's no place like home, Jeff said while tossing his duffel bag on a cot inside 2D Platoon's temporary tent. What did you guys call this kind of place back in the day, Doc? A hooch? Nowert, I'm gonna dropkick you right over the perimeter wall. I was not in Vietnam. I did spend close to seven months in GP large tents in Kuwait and Iraq during the Gulf War, however. This place is like the Hilton compared to those places. It's even got a floor that's not dirt. 
Half a year in a tent? Reyes asked, clearly displeased with the prospect. Not exclusively, no. I did spend about a week sleeping in a Bradley. I'll take the tent over that any day. Suck it up, Emily, Nowert yelled from the other end of the tent, using the nickname Reyes earned because he whined too much one day. Emilio flipped him off. It's only gonna be six weeks or so before we're in those plywood bee huts they're building. We just gotta wait our turn. Hell, at least there's air conditioning here. Jeff walked into the base hospital along with the other battalion medics and their PAs the next day. One of First Bat's PAs led them on a tour of the facility, pointing out where they could restock their medical supplies. First Bat would rotate home in a week after 3D settled in. The hospital was a series of interconnected rigid wall tents complete with climate control. They even had an ICU wing with air purifiers. This hospital is the equal of any trauma center in the continental United States. It might even surpass them. We see more trauma here in a week than the largest center stateside will see in a whole year. Like our country's past conflicts, what we're learning here will be used to improve trauma care back home. The staff here is highly motivated, and they are among the sharpest clinicians I've ever met. The level of trust our battalion's medics enjoy regarding their skills in the field is unmatched anywhere. Be straight with these people. They will be as exhausted as you will be, and tempers will flare over the course of your deployment, but do not take it personally when it happens. They will also be genuine when they apologize for their attitudes later. Remember, we're all here for the same reason. Casualties from the South come north to us, or one of the other Allied combat support hospitals, to get them away from the heaviest fighting. Those requiring care in the far north go to our CSH, near Dushanbe in Soviet Tajikistan. Those of you who will be stationed away from Bagram will be based out of secure compounds within HH-60 flight range of here or other compounds. Many of those compounds will also host forward surgical teams to stabilize your casualties before they're evacuated to a CSH. Helicopter evac here is very good, but there's a lot of ground for them to cover. If you need to call for dust off, be aware that you may get an Army HH-60, an Air Force MH-60, or one of our allies' choppers depending on where you are. All the flight medics in country have been around the block if they've been here any length of time, and some of them have been around the block multiple times. There will not be a time where you get two wet behind the ears medics or PJs on the same aircraft, regardless of which nation they're from. Those of you with previous experience, whether it be civilian or military, watch your new folks. Watch everyone for burnout. Watch for that thousand yard stare. Be persistent when you recognize it in your rangers and try to help them. Be accepting if someone recognizes that in you. You are the ones who will understand what each other is going through. No one else will come as close to understanding. Jeff noticed a small medical library space within the hospital. He learned they were welcome to, and were expected to, take advantage of any of the hospital's available resources if they had questions during their tour in-country. This included asking hospital staff for clarification if they had questions as well. The four Bravo Company medics explored the growing relaxation area of Bagram people. They're called the Boardwalk after their hospital tour. Rough plywood canopies, wooden walkways, and large tents in the bazaar house various small slices of home. There were three different fast food places, a barber shop, military post office, and even an open air performance space used for concerts. As Jeff strolled down the boardwalk with the other three medics from his company, an unexpected yet familiar face caught his attention. Mish, he barked in surprise. The haggard specialist stopped and turned back toward him. The friendly, open face he remembered from AIT wasn't there. Whatever she'd seen here wiped her normal smile from her face at some point. She blinked at him without any apparent recognition. Mish, it's Jeff Knox from AIT. Sergeant Knox. There was no emotion in her voice. He'd seen the same haunted look before in too many people, himself included. Mish, can I buy you a drink? he asked, motioning to a kiosk. The incongruity of a coffee shop in a war zone made his head spin. Mishka Gupta looked to her friends. Go ahead, Mish, one of them said. We'll wait for you over here. 
Jeff's fellow ranger medics nodded toward Mish's friends, indicating they'd wait with them. Jeff bought a tea for Mish and a black coffee for himself before leading her to an open table. He'd seen more signs of life in department store mannequins. It worried him to see her like this. Mish stared blankly as she sat on the bench of the picnic table, while Jeff straddled the bench on the same side of the table, facing her. Mish, do you want to talk about it? He asked gently. She didn't give any indication she heard him, or that she was listening in the first place. Mish, you heard most of my stories when we were at Fort Sam together. You know how horrific a lot of them were. You also know I cautioned you guys not to bottle up your feelings, especially when they start to gnaw at you. I can't be the first to tell you this since we left AIT. The way your friends keep looking over here, I'm sure they've told you the same thing, as well as others. Jeff reached down and took her hand in both of his. Come on, where's the girl who nearly tore my arm off at graduation? He asked with a crooked smile. Mish looked down at her hand in his, then looked up. The impassive eyes began to brim with tears, her lip quivering. A single tear fell before she launched herself at him and clung to him for dear life. Loud, racking sobs shook her body and almost deafened him. Jeff could see a couple of her friends lowering their heads while they also cried in relief. Others looked over in curiosity, but wisely kept to themselves. Mish cried herself out after five minutes. I'm sorry. For what, Mish? You obviously needed that. For getting snot all over your BDUs. Jeff shrugged. He handed her some napkins from the nearby dispenser so she could blow her nose. He took a couple and wiped the aforementioned substance off his shoulder. It's not like I'm going to be on parade anytime soon. He took a slow breath. What happened, Mish? She took a similar slow breath and let it out. My division's been deployed for almost a year. We're rotating home in three days. As a female, I wasn't allowed to go out with the infantry guys, but I've gone out with our transportation units plenty of times. I was assigned to one company and really hit it off with one of the section leaders. I'd volunteer to go with her platoon as the medic when they went somewhere. They call transportation a non-combat MOS, but you couldn't tell that around here. They don't catch as much shit as the troops who go looking for the bad guys, but plenty of the bad guys come looking for the trucks. I can't begin to guess how much ammo I've sent downrange. Hit the supply lines, Jeff interjected. One of the oldest stories in warfare. Right. There were lots of times where we had to dismount and fight off insurgents and other assorted assholes. I guess they think women can't fight so transportation's an easy target. They usually find out the hard way they've walked into a buzzsaw. We don't roll over. It's not a mistake we let them repeat, either. Last week I went out with Rachel's platoon, on what was a fairly typical run for them. Bringing a load of supplies to a forward operating base to the southeast, near coast, from the camp we were all assigned to down there. They timed their first IED strike just right, Mish said in a shaky voice. The blast was huge. It took out the first two trucks all by itself and disabled a third. Where they hit us gave us no options, no routes of escape. They cratered the road behind the last truck too. Thankfully that truck was following the truck in front of it, too closely, and the explosion didn't touch it. Two more soldiers from the platoon would have died right away if it had. We bailed out took cover in the village we were passing and called for EOD and the quick reaction force from our camp. We were a little surprised when no follow-on attack came. We were only a few miles from the FOB and about 15 from the camp, so we knew we wouldn't be waiting too long. Rachel reminded us to stay on our toes in case the insurgents were using us as bait for more American soldiers. We got complacent, Mish whispered as she began to cry again. When the first relief force showed up, we forgot about 360 security, or at least I did. Whoever the sniper was, he wasn't very skilled, but in the end, it didn't matter. I saw the muzzle of a rifle sticking out of a window above and down the block from us when Rachel went to talk to the sergeant in charge of the QRF. I screamed a warning while I raised my rifle, but it was too late. Rachel turned at my shout. The bullet entered at the base of her neck behind the right collarbone, bounced off her spine, and tumbled down through her chest. It blew out her left armpit after it ripped through her aorta and left lung. 
My friend was dead before she hit the ground. I don't remember dragging her body out of the line of fire. I just remember the look of shock frozen on her face. I do remember kicking in the door of the building the sniper used and charging in like I was John Wayne. The rest of the relief force had already started surrounding the sniper's building, but I charged in like an angry bull and without backup. I ran up to the room he used as his hide, tossed in a frag, and emptied my magazine into the bastard's chest after it went off. I then began beating his face in with the butt of my rifle. I didn't care that the full magazine from my rifle had already killed him. It took three QRF soldiers to drag me off him and pull me outside. After that, I shut down. There was a parade of people who chewed my ass for my little stunt, but I didn't care. Nor do I remember most of what was said. I didn't even cry at Rachel's memorial service. I Jeff wrapped her in a brotherly hug and let her cry some more. When she wound down, Jeff told her Lily Sepulveda's story, the one story of his he hadn't told anyone but Terence Davis, and how he dealt with the pain of that call. Don't close yourself off again, Mish. Everyone reacts to trauma differently, but most everyone I know needs to talk stuff like this out. If we work together at some ambulance service somewhere, I'd be telling you to find a counselor and talk with them about it. For us, this environment we find ourselves in now will be so unique that I'd also recommend talking to other vets if you can find some, or one, you trust. No one will understand you 100%, but I think other vets stand a better chance particularly Afghanistan vets. Before Mish could respond either way, a sudden echo down the bazaar. People started to scatter. Jeff found the source, an Afghan soldier with a pistol. The man turned the pistol on someone else. Jeff spun himself on the bench. He reached back to pull his rifle around on its sling. Red mist blossomed downrange and the shooter dropped to the ground, threat neutralized. Jeff glanced to his left to find Mish with her rifle shouldered smoke wafting from its barrel. The smell of cordite hung heavy in the air. She pulled the rifle from the pocket of her shoulder and, calm as you please, dropped the magazine onto the table. She cleared the rifle's chamber and put it on safe before also placing it on the table. He let his rifle fall back to his side and pulled Mish in for another hug. That's for you, Rachel, she whispered. The MPs kept Jeff and Mish separate while CID investigated the attack. When it was Jeff's turn to give his account, he walked his interviewer through events since leaving the base hospital. She didn't ask him any specific questions until he began to describe his reaction to the attack. Why did you elect to try firing from where you were sitting? Why not close with the tango? The terrorist, the tango, was on the move. Any delay in engaging him would have meant two things. More of our personnel would die, and Mish and I would have lost our best backstop. Explain, please, Sergeant. It'll be easier if I show you, ma'am, may I? Jeff walked the woman to the table he and Mish shared before the attack. Once there, the CID agent saw right away what Jeff meant about the backstop. A line of HESCO barriers designed to be mortar protection angled away from the table. From where Mish fired, the tango would have been directly in front of those barriers providing protection downrange if her shots missed. The arrangement of the other tables would have prevented Jeff and Mish from closing with the tango and keeping the backstop behind him at the same time. Engaging from any other angle would have increased the risk to the other soldiers in the area. I see what you meant, Sergeant. Thank you. I don't have any more questions for you at the moment. You may rejoin your friend if you like, but please remain in the immediate area until my boss releases everyone. CID give you a hard time? Mish asked when Jeff rejoined her. The rest of their friends were being kept away from them for the moment. No, she was cool. Once I showed her our view from the table, everything seemed to fall into place for her. Same for the guy who interviewed me. Nice shooting, by the way, Annie Oakley. Told you that you deserve the Soldier of the Cycle Award at AIT. For a small girl, Mish could throw a powerful punch. The CID investigators walked over while Jeff massaged his shoulder. The lead agent spoke to Mish. I'm ruling this a good shoot, not that there was ever any doubt on that. Here's your pistol and rifle back. The agent who questioned her handed them over. Mish made sure they were clear before holstering and slinging them. Jeff received his from his agent as well. You saved lives today, specialist, 
I'll be sure to tell your CO. I understand you'll rotate home in a few days. Yes, sir. I'd recommend finding someone to talk to about this at least once or twice, if not more. What I've seen through the years tells me bottling up the experience of killing. Whether or not you think it'll affect you will affect you. Talking to someone else, even once, helps immensely. Thank you, sir. A friend already convinced me to do so before this. I'll start looking for someone to see when I get home. Good. You two are free to go. My thanks for your cooperation. Your unit is all set to go in the morning? Jeff asked at dinner in the DFAC two nights later. Mish nodded. All the unit's equipment is already loaded on cargo planes on the airfield ramp. We simply have to walk onto the C-17s set up as airliners at first light. Probably some of the same ones my battalion took to get here. Probably. While Mish could relax when she walked onto the plane tomorrow, Jeff's battalion received word that individual platoons would ship to their respective bases at the beginning of next week. For 2D platoon, that meant they won the lottery. They'd stay at Bagram Air Base, though they'd move into a different tent for their time in country. With the operational tempo in the more dangerous south, the rangers there would need relief at some point, so his platoon might occasionally rotate there. Your enlistment ends when? A year from now? He asked. A little bit more than a year from now. Beginning of next August. Thirteen short months. Yours? Next October. Do you think you'll be deployed again before you ETS? I hope not, she grumbled. Mish was able to sleep better since the bazaar attack than since her friend's death, but she wouldn't say she was sleeping well yet. Her being able to put the tango down helped her mental state immensely. You have my home address and phone number still, right? Yeah? Call Keiko if you feel you have nowhere else to turn, especially after you get out. She's a good listener and an incredibly giving person. We've got plenty of space at our house. If push comes to shove, her parents live next door and have even more room. You barely know me, Jeff, other than those two months at AIT. Why make this offer? For she today who sheds their blood with me shall be my sister. We're friends, Mish. You said so yourself after the boardwalk incident. You've known combat and the horrible cost of it. Yet you didn't hesitate two days ago. You terminated that bastard with extreme prejudice before I had my rifle in my hands. At the least, I owe you for that. Everyone needs help at some point, no matter how strong they are. Whether they ask for that help is another thing. The following morning, Jeff watched a long line of cargo planes climb into the thin mountain air, taking his friend and the rest of her division home. Nana July 2004, Bagram Air Base, Bagram, Afghanistan. Jeff sat in the hospital's library, bright and early the next morning, trying to learn everything he could about altitude sickness. He kicked himself for forgetting to do so during the pre-deployment preparations. He noted the signs and symptoms of two similar syndromes, high altitude pulmonary edema and high altitude cerebral edema, fled in the lungs and swelling of the brain, respectively, both cause had by the decreased air pressure at higher altitude. 3D Battalion discovered a third related side effect soon after they landed in Afghanistan called High Altitude Flatus Expulsion. They nicknamed it Explosive Decompression. When the battalion landed in the reduced air pressure at 5,000 feet above sea level, their bodies wanted to equalize the pressure inside the colon with that of the outside air, continuing the process which started on their flight. Bodies equalized that pressure by expelling excess gas. If they flew straight through without the break in Germany, the phenomenon would have occurred in the confined space of the plane due to the cabin pressure in flight. Instead, it occurred in the platoon tents. Er, for the love of God, what did you eat, Nauert? Stan Maurer, a fire team leader in 2D squad, asked that night. Eat? Ruben Montes protested. I think whatever it is crawled up his ass last month and died. Shit, where's my gas mask? Does anyone have a book of matches they can light on fire? Doc, how long will this torture last? Until the pressure inside us drops to match the air pressure here, Jeff answered. If they serve beans and anything tonight, someone keep Nauert away from the chow line. Jeff looked over at Rick Mendoza. We're stuck in the campfire scene from Blazing Saddles. Super. 
<laughs> Jeff shook himself out of the memory with a chuckle and returned to the book in front of him. His ubiquitous iPod played familiar music through the small speaker connected to it. His hand played air keyboard of its own accord while he read. Is that Jay Giel's? Someone behind him asked. By God, someone around here listens to music I recognize? Jeff turned to find a large man filling the doorway. His long, sandy hair matched his beard. His altered BDU shirt sported Special Forces unit patches on both shoulders. Everything about the man screamed non-standard, while also screaming, You don't want to mess with me. Sure is, Jeff answered. It's part of a playlist I named Growing Up Boston. I've got ones labeled Hair Bands and Growing Up 80s also. What's on the Boston playlist? Aerosmith, Boston, Jay Giles Band, Del Fuego's The Cars, John Butcher Axis. Sweet, is that where you're from, Boston? Well, Western Massachusetts originally. My family and I live in Central Mass now. Jeff rose and extended his hand. I'm Jeff Knox. Simon Michael Casperson. Yeah, I get that look all the time. Casperson laughed in response to the question on Jeff's face. Dad sports the curly black hair, brown-eyed Jewish look, but Mom was the hippie with the blue eyes and long blonde hair he was smitten by. Obviously, I'd take after her. Dad's parents used to give Mom and me the hairy eyeball when we'd visit. We reminded them too much of the Nazi bastards who wiped out their families. Must make family reunions interesting. Very. The same was especially true when I had my blonde buzz cut during the summers as a kid. We only visited with Dad's parents once or twice a year while I grew up. Dad didn't talk to his parents for the better part of three or four years. After Bubba called Mama Shiksa. Not a good thing. Mom and Dad moved to Mom's hometown of Dover, New Hampshire not long after that. I grew up there, so I remember most of those bands' names. Where are my manners? You want to sit? Casperson nodded and took the offered seat. Do you go by Cy? What do you like to be called? Mickey, actually. Simon is my paternal grandfather's name, a peace offering which was ignored for a long time, and Michael is Mom's dad's name. I give my full name when I introduce myself, but I prefer Mickey. I'm guessing you're in here because you're an SF team medic? Yep, I'm the 18 Delta on Team Charlie 97 12th Special Forces Group out of Fort Carson, Colorado. Charlie. I guess it's because C is 12 in hexadecimal or so I've heard. First group's team numbers start with 1, 10th group's numbers start with A, and 19th group's numbers start with 9. Helps avoid confusion. Is 12th group the group they brought back after 9-11? Yeah. I used to be in the 7th but got caught in the expansion draft when they spun the 12th back up. Can't have the newbies running the show after all. Anywho, I'm guessing you're in here for a similar reason? You're a platoon medic, right? Studying up on some stuff? Right. I'm a platoon medic in the 3D Ranger Battalion. I'm reading up on altitude-related injuries. You know, the reading I should have done before we deployed? We got here a few days ago and learned about one unpleasant side effect of reduced air pressure after we landed. Jeff described the events of their first night in country. We're lucky in that Fort Carson's already at about 5,000 feet of elevation. We didn't have any of those problems when we deployed. Jeff shuddered again at the memories of that night. It was like what I've heard about being seasick. First you're afraid you're gonna die, then you're afraid you won't. Impacting fragments rattled against the steel door. The door crashed open after a loud slamming sound. A battering ram landed in the dirt with a thud. The shuffle of feet rushing in. Loud, shouted commands were heard from inside. Then, grenade! A short burst of automatic weapons fire. Clear! 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 Ten seconds ticked by before Jeff heard, Hey, Doc, over the radio. He dashed inside the compound before the next syllable. Once inside the target building, now specialist Steve Cunha waved him to Emilio Reyes, who bled from a few spots on his face. Emilio had raised his NVGs at some point. What's the matter, Emilio? Cut yourself shaving. Reyes looked at him half-dazed. Okay, forget I said anything. Steve, what gives? After the flashbang went off, we made entry per plan. One of the enemy tried to throw a grenade from inside that room there while we cleared the front room. He definitely wasn't destined for a career in Major League Baseball, 
because his throw missed the door and the grenade bounced back at him. I pulled Reyes out of the doorway just as the grenade exploded. I think he caught a few pieces of adobe and ricocheting shrapnel off the doorframe. The target all but took himself out with his own grenade. Does he need to be checked after I treat Emilio? No, he still tried to raise a weapon after the grenade went off. He suffered a fatal case of acute lead poisoning. Jeff nodded. Emilio, take off your safety glasses, would you? Though still in a daze, Reyes did as Jeff asked. The younger man's left cheek showed abrasions below where the face-hugging lenses once rested, along with a scattering of small cuts. The safety glasses were scratched. If the army hadn't started mandating eye protection in the field, at a minimum, Reyes would be dealing with corneal damage. Jeff cleaned the cuts with an alcohol wipe for the moment. He'd take a better look at Reyes's face after they returned to the base and the younger man washed up, but all the cuts looked minor. Anyone else hurt? Jeff asked over the net. He heard repeated answers of negative Doc from the other section leaders. Doc, all set to move, Sal Pellegrino asked on his way through the room. Their ride would be there soon and they needed to clear the area. What, this isn't our new summer house? It's kind of cozy and has a great view of the mountains there. Jeff waved at the peaks visible through his own NVGs. Get your ass outside, Doc, Sal laughed and take the kid with you. He knew Jeff wouldn't be joking if he wasn't ready to go. I hear and I obey, oh great one. He gave Reyes a small push and they left the building. Reyes all right? Rick asked him outside. A little sandblasted, that's it. He's got a few minor cuts on his face but won't even need a band-aid, Jeff replied. Unless he's hiding something else from me, he doesn't even qualify for a purple heart, Kemo Sabe. Let's try to keep it that way, okay? It sounds like plenty of Purple Heart paperwork got filled out last time the battalion was over here. The Blackhawks landed outside the compound walls to bring the platoon and their two prisoners back to Bagram, some 30 miles to the south. The sun was just beginning its climb above the horizon. Uh, I don't know why, but I'm still surprised by the swaths of green around here, Rick commented once they were at cruising altitude. Dawn revealed fields of deep green scattered across the dusty brown landscape. Did you think these people only out of sand or something? Just because the base is a uniform desert tan doesn't mean the rest of the country is, Rick. From up here the place almost looks peaceful. Unfortunately we know the reality is quite different. You managed to catch your breath yet? Almost, but not yet. You? No. I know we'll acclimate to conditions up here soon, but it's a bit jarring to go from playing games at Fenway Park's altitude to playing at Mile High Stadium. You're mixing your metaphors. Sue me. Tsud Platoon walked into their tent following another successful raid early one morning the following week. It was 0415, but the weary soldiers still faced an hour or so of weapons cleaning before they could shower and crawl into bed. The op tempo for them seemed to be one every two to three days. Hey, do you guys mind if we try to turn on sports night? Jeff asked while the others began field stripping their weapons. The Sox played the Yankees today, and I'd like to try and see the highlights. Receiving the okay from everyone, Jeff tuned the satellite receiver to the appropriate channel. The receiver made the connection with the satellite, which wasn't always the case. He shook his head at the thought of watching sports highlights from home in an active war zone. Not only was war hell, but the contradictions in this one were crazy too. The highlights show came on and Jeff took a seat while waiting for the Red Sox game segment. One of the guys told him the segment was on, while Jeff scrubbed the powder residue from the inside of his rifle. The Yankees played Boston at Fenway this afternoon, in the second game of their series, and it got a little... contentious. Jeff snorted. Contentious? He thought. A Sox-Yankees game is contentious on a good day. The sportscaster went on to describe a three-hour rain delay and how the Red Sox players lobbied to play the game despite a soggy field before getting to the events of the game. In the top of the third, things went from contentious to fractious. Jeff watched Red Sox pitcher Bronson Arroyo plunk Yankees third baseman Alex Rodriguez. The pitch hit him square on the large pad he wore on his left elbow. A-Rod began jawing at Arroyo while walking to first. Jeff could read A-Rod's lips and he wasn't using nice language. 
A-Rod soon turned his ire on Jason Veritek, the Red Sox catcher and captain who stepped between A-Rod and his pitcher protect him. The not-nice language turned into a string of F-bombs. Tech took exception, then took his catcher's mitt and tried to flatten A-Rod's face with it. Holy shit! Jeff cried out while watching the benches clear. He was sure the image of A-Rod getting pie-faced by Veritek would become as iconic as Carlton Fisk, urging his home run fair in 1975. No love loss between these two teams, Steve Kunna commented. 86 years of frustration will do that for you, Jeff replied. Well, at least they won. Maybe this will wake them up now. They've only been so-so for the last couple of months. Kahuna, launch another one! Rick yelled while pointing at a second-floor window with a bladed hand. Steve Kunha raised his M203. 40 millimeters of attitude adjustment delivered. The enemy gunfire stopped. Assault? Go. First and three squads charged into the low mud brick structure with Jeff in tow. Jeff dropped one insurgent with two rounds to the chest. Clear. Nah. Half the force swept the first floor while the other swarmed up the stairs to the second. Bravo 26 from Bravo 236. Building is secure, Josh Brogan reported while looking at three former insurgents upstairs. Roger 236, report status. 26, 0 KIA 0. Weight 1, 1 wounded, Brogan reported when he saw Jeff point to Private O'Fume's foot. The private hobbled out of the room with a grimace. One package and four enemy KIA. Roger, 236. You three finish up searching the room, then search the dead. I want to be out of here in under 20 minutes. Brogan turned his back to the chorus of Roger, Sergeant, and focused on the platoon medic's report. What happened to Kwame? He went partially through the floor in the other room, mainly the heel of his foot, Jeff said. He punched through a rotten board, and he sprained his Achilles pretty good. We might need a little more time than 20 minutes, Sarge. SPC Noam Alexander added while hefting his M249 saw. Kwame punched through to a hidden room. He's lucky no one was down there or they probably would have lit him up. Josh's eyebrows rose. Huh? Why didn't the bad guys head down there when we showed up? I think the first high explosive round from Kahuna's 203 damaged the frame of a hidden door. The round impacted the frame and jammed it so the tangos couldn't open it. Artie was going at it with a pry bar when I came upstairs. SPC Arthur Artie. Conklin was 3D Squad's other automatic rifleman and a very big boy. Let me know if we need to call in the S2 so I can tell Sergeant Mendoza. Roger. Sergeant. Gnome left the room. Kwame still came up here after he got hurt, huh? Adrenaline is a wonderful thing, Josh. Back for more? Mickey Casperson asked when Jeff entered the hospital library. Oh, hey, Mick. Jeff replied. Thank you for not saying, oh, Mickey, or hey, Mickey. I figure you've heard those lines enough, Jeff said with a grin. Yeah, high school was a hoot after that song came out, Mickey grumbled. Gee, thanks, Tony Basil. How's life? So far, so good, dare I say. All minor stuff so far. Minor cuts, bruises, and one sprained Achilles tendon. Mickey winced. Ouch. Those hurt. Kwame is going to be restricted to Bagram for a week or so until he can bear weight without wincing. Jeff shrugged. It's not enough time for him to fully rest up, but it's going to have to do. You guys going out a lot? About three or four times a week right now, it's picking up. How about you? Our missions are longer, range further afield, and take a little more planning. Not that yours don't take planning. So we only go out once or twice a month. I haven't seen you in a few weeks. You catch the Yankees game? The one where Tech tried to cave in A-Rod's face? Jeff laughed. Not live, unfortunately. I caught the highlights, but we were out on an op while they were playing. I wish they showed the start of the fight in slow motion. <laughs> I know, I've heard a photo of the moment of impact is already behind every bar in New England. The two shared a good laugh. So what are these things? Jeff asked. And PVS 44s, answered Rick. The latest in NVGs. In fact, they're calling these VADs now, visual augmentation devices. Instead of binocular objective lenses, these use hundreds of tiny CCD cameras on the outside of the visor to give a 150-degree image on the flexible LCD screen inside. 
The cameras will give a full image, even with up to 35% of them damaged. They'll do night vision, thermal imaging, magnification. The works. I hear they'll help you see in a dust storm or through smoke too, even during the day. The signal processing takes place in this box at the back of the harness, which will be on the back of our MIC helmets. The rechargeable battery is back there too. You can also use regular batteries if recharging them isn't an option. The word out of soldier systems in Natick is the troops testing these absolutely love them. Since we're deployed, we're one of the first operational units to receive them. It seems like we should have some non-operational training with these before we use them on missions, Sal Pellegrino commented. Guess what we're doing tonight, Sal? Rick asked. That night, 2D platoon prowled through the empty desert inside the perimeter east of the airfield. The clarity of the VAD's images was stunning. Rangers used to the grainy, narrow view through their usual NVGs ran through battle drills without worrying about missing something they could trip over. The normal side-to-side -side scanning to maintain awareness of their surroundings could be abandoned since they could still use peripheral vision. These things are awesome. First Squad's Benny Rabbit wear crowed. Shading, depth of field, full field of view, and they flip up out of your way easily. Sergeant Dinkins popped smoke out there and I could still see. Natick hit one out of the park with these. We'll have to see how durable they are in the long run, Sal muttered, while checking his visor for any possible signs of wear. The high-impact plastic covering the CCD cameras didn't have a scratch. The balance of the Devis is good, though. The NVGs always made my Maich front heavy. The flexible LED screen inside the visor is really sharp, Kwame Ofume added. I watched you guys creeping around out there and I didn't notice the individual pixels unless I made a real effort to look for them. When are you back in the game, Kwame? Doc says it'll still be another week or two. I guess I sprained the Achilles worse than they first thought. Doc, mail call! Steve Kunna yelled through the tense entry door. Thanks, Steve. I'll be right out. Jeff finished writing the email to his family and walked outside. August weather in this part of Afghanistan wasn't much different than at home in Massachusetts. Daytime highs in the 90s with nighttime lows in the 50s. Winter temps would be about the same as home also. It was pleasant under the awning erected by previous tenants of their platoon's tent, especially with the breeze that day. Your pile is over there, Doc, Emilio pointed out. A small mountain of packages waited for him on one table. A quick scan of return addresses told him most of his friends sent something. Keiko's letter, marked, read me first, confirmed that. His friends hadn't sent him packages. They sent enough items for everyone in the platoon. Wet wipes, various kinds of jerky, shaving items, magazines and books, even gift cards for a music downloading service. The package from Jane, Alice and Tom contained a minor surprise for him, a letter from TC. The letter itself wasn't a great surprise since they'd been talking all along, but the revelation that Heather threw out a few of Jeff's first letters to TC was, the news started Jeff on a slow burn. If she wanted to ignore him, that was one thing, but a federal crime was another. To Jeff, it signaled the definitive end of their friendship. The laughter from his platoon shook him from his bad mood. Emilio Reyes and Kwame Ofume laughed at the retelling of Jeff's introduction to the platoon. Nauert and Schulteis shook their heads at the embarrassing first-hand memories. The laughter helped reinforce the lessons of the past month that these 40 men were, as with his platoon in 91, the people Jeff would rely on the most for almost everything over the next year. Doc, you're gonna wear a hole in the floor. Jeff stopped pacing. He stood still for a solid minute before the pacing started again. He's like a caged lion. More like a nervous father, Sal, Rick replied. He turned to his platoon medic. Would I be out of line if I suggested you take some of the Valium you carry? A little, Jeff answered while still pacing. And that's only because I don't carry enough to keep me calm. The statement was true in that he carried enough to keep half the platoon calm, not just himself. His friends continued to laugh at him until they heard, X-Ray 2-2, returning mission complete, negative Kia, negative wounded, one package. Roger, X-Ray 2-2 is RTB with 0, zero and 1, they heard over the radio speaker. Thirty minutes later, first squad swaggered up to the tent laughing and joking. 
trace Dinkins' bumped fists triumphantly with Rick, Sal, and Josh while wearing a wide smile. What's with this guy, Trace asked, gesturing at Jeff. Mom was getting worried, Stan Maurer commented, jerking a thumb toward the medic. He about walked home to the States he paced so much. Oh, I didn't know you cared, Jeff, Trace commented with a chuckle. You comedians keep laughing, Jeff grumbled back. Yes, I know it's your squad, Trace, and your platoon, Rick, but I'm the one you'll turn to when something goes south on a mission. You'll take a look at someone who's been unlucky, turn to me and say, fix him up, Doc. Sure, I'm ready for that, and that's my job, but if something bad happened out there just now, you'd have come running back here, screaming hot, headed for the hospital. DJ Norm and the other guys are trained and equipped as well as I'm allowed to get them, but that's still a hell of a spot for them to be in alone. So, yes, it's like being a parent. We send our charges out into the unkind world, hoping to hell they'll be alright, and we can't do a damn thing to physically stop something from happening to them when we're not with them. Jeff shook his head and walked back into the tent. He was already asleep in his bunk when the rest of the guys walked in. The following morning, Rick Mendoza exited the tent to find Jeff gazing off at the mountains to their north. He walked over, sat next to his friend, looked at the mountains too, and waited. What's wrong with me, Rick? Jeff asked a few minutes later. Nothing I haven't struggled with myself, Jeff. Maybe I'm hiding it better, but the pressure's there. In different ways, you and I are responsible for the whole platoon. Rick turned away from the distant peaks and toward his medic. You've been a little quiet since you got those packages at the beginning of the month. Jeff shrugged. Mourning the loss of a friend, I guess. The one who stopped talking to you? Yeah. She's still there, though? Married to another good friend? I can't say I know what it's like, especially since I've never been through it and you're living it, but it's gotta be tough. I'm sorry I implied you guys don't care last night. I know you are, Jeff. The rest of the guys know it, too. All of us use swagger and bravado to keep the reality of what we're doing here at a distance. What sane person enjoys killing people? None of us are sociopaths. We care about our families and each other and can't reasonably expect not to care about people in general. What the hell are we doing here, Rick? Keeping the wolves at bay, trying to make sure they don't hurt us again, and in doing that, we're trying to stop them from hurting their own. Who are we to say what's right for another country? What makes what's right for us right for others if they don't put it in place themselves? You're asking me to solve the world's problems before coffee. You think I'm going to be able to do that when neither the LT nor the captain has? El Presidente hasn't figured it out either, nor the entire United Nations. It was Rick's turn to shrug. I don't know the answer to your question, Jeff, or even if there is one. There are plenty of opinions, I'm sure. As for what we're doing here, you say it often enough. When you take the king's coin, you do the king's bidding. National policy has us here, like it or not. My country, right or wrong? Jeff sighed. For a Navy guy, Decatur was pretty astute. You trying to put me out of business as the quote master, Rick? <laughs> you ain't the only swinging dick around here who's adjumicated bones. Well... Jeff said while rising from his seat, it's time to strap your athletic supporter around said member and fall in for PT platoon sergeant. Time for wind sprints around the airfield again, Doc. Pain is weakness leaving the body. That which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Leave it all on the field. Personally, I like to keep it simple. Be hard to kill is the best quote I've heard about staying in shape. The dark, moonless night hid the dusty Afghanistan landscape below Tutti Platoon's choppers. It also hid the blacked-out choppers from any observers on the ground as they sped across the almost ink-black sky. They arced over mountain peaks before diving into the valley where the target city lay. Through VADs, the scene appeared as bright as day at 3.38 in the morning. The choppers flared over a nondescript compound near the city's edge. No discernible difference between it and the others surrounding it existed until this moment. Ropes dropped, and dark figures slid down from the aircraft. The aircraft increased power and pulled it away, leaving silence in their wake. The silence lasted only seconds before half the assault force breached the main door on the ground level. A crash signaled the other half's entry from the roof door. Down! Get down! 
The wide-eyed terror of children contrasted with parental defiance after the house was secured. No shots had been fired, but there was plenty of yelling. Jeff raised his visor and pulled down his balaclava to reveal his face before he knelt in front of an angry mother and her scared children. Shh, little ones, no one will hurt you, he said gently in Pashto, the language in this house and the only phrase he'd learned in it so far. The mother let loose with a stream of angry words, none of which he came close to understanding except American. She spat the word like a swear word. He smiled, shook his head, and shrugged. No more Pashto. Jeff stood and drifted away. You're not gonna win hearts and minds here, Doc. Not with her, that's for sure, Josh. Maybe the kids will remember a kind word in the future. Even if they didn't understand it now, hopefully the tone will be remembered later. You're a dreamer, Doc. At best, this place is a warm-up for how we'll be received when we rotate to Kandahar in a week. You know what they say about a journey of a thousand miles, right? Yeah, they call it Ranger School. During the flight home, Jeff noticed DJ Schulte staring off into the distance with a sad look on his face. He nudged Terry Nowert and nodded toward DJ in a silent question. Terry pulled one of his headphones off and motioned for Jeff to do the same. They rotated their microphones away from their mouths to keep their conversation private. Deej hasn't been able to reach his girl for a couple of days. Terry yelled into Jeff's ear over the roar of the helicopter. There is an eight and a half hour time difference between here and the East Coast, Terry. Jeff reminded the younger ranger. I wish it was that simple, Doc. Terry sighed. I think she's stepping out on him. That's pretty cold. What's happening at home can be a serious stressor, especially while deployed. You tell Sergeant Dinkins yet? Not yet, but I'm gonna have to soon. You keep an eye on DJ and I will too. We're moving south next week. We need to be on our game down there. Welcome to Kandahar, gentlemen. Gentlemen? Is he talking to us, Rick? Trace asked while shaking hands with Sergeant First Class Paul Dacey, Platoon Sergeant for First Platoon, Charlie Company, 3D Ranger Battalion. There's always room for personal growth, Trace. <laughs> I'll bring you guys over to where you'll bunk for the next month or so, Dacey said. American troops had made headway in the Taliban-controlled South over the previous three months. Elements of the 173D Airborne Brigade seized the airfield in a company-sized combat jump two months prior to 2D platoon's arrival. Conditions were still primitive compared to Bagram, but were far above those during Jeff's previous combat experiences. We cleared our personal stuff out of here. We're leaving the TV and computer stuff knowing you left yours for us. It's a good thing we hadn't moved into those bee huts yet, Enos Torvalds commented. The guys would be pretty grumpy about moving back into a tent. We could always see if there's a fob nearby we can visit, Enos. That might change their minds. You looking for a mutiny, Jeff? Sure. We're not huddled in a hole somewhere with just our woobies to keep us warm at night, Enos. Don't forget, it could always be worse. Stude Platoon took a day to get settled then began to plan for their first mission in the South. Their preparations soon showed them they were now playing against the Varsity. The bad guys up north weren't slouches by any stretch, but the ones down here look like they're a step or two past them, Rick commented to Jeff in the hours before the op. We need to be ready. We are, Rick. You have us ready to go. Rick nodded and went back to checking his equipment. The convoy left the base three hours after sunset. To an observer, it was a standard supply run. Ten minutes in, the trucks darted off their obvious route, speeding through dense Kandahar neighborhoods before sliding to a stop in front of their target. Go, go, go! 3D squad swarmed into the house, Gavriel. Clear. Jeff flowed through the front room. He kicked open the next door. Came the yell from Jeff's left. A machete whistled toward his head. Jeff brought his rifle up for the block. Jeff twisted right, pulling his attacker off balance and toward him. He aimed an elbow at the man's chin and the man dropped. Jeff pulled his pistol for protection, not trusting his rifle now. The others in his team cleared the room. Clear! You okay, Doc? Grenadier Rory Nelson asked. Better than I should be, Rory. Jeff showed him his rifle. 
The upper receiver, ejection port, and bolt sported a deep gouge. Jeff tried to pull back the charging handle, but the deformed metal scraped together and jammed. Damn, I really like this rifle. How many lives you have left now? Hopefully enough to get me through the deployment. You guys all set? Rick asked while stepping into the back room. Got a spare rifle lying around, Rick? Jeff showed Rick the large paperweight he now carried. Rick whistled. Tomahawk. No, some kind of weird machete. Better your rifle than your head. You ain't kidding. Time to get out of here. Grab that bag of bones there and let's go. Fifteen days down, twenty to go, plus or minus, Rick mentioned during the NCO's workout one morning. We need to keep our eyes on the prize, that's for sure, Rick, Trace agreed. We're going out again tonight? Yeah, about 0300 local time. We'll have a night off tomorrow night. That'll be good. Two weeks straight is wearing the edge off the guys a little. Sal and the others nodded in agreement with that statement. How's DJ doing in your eyes, Trace? Both Jeff and Trace approached Rich a week ago to warn him of what they'd seen. He's at about 85 to 90 percent. He's keeping whatever's really going on back home in the background, but it's still affecting him. Is he the only one who's having problems? Rick asked his squad and team leaders. For the most part, Stan Maurer commented. We're only about three months into our time here in Afghanistan. Some of the guys get that blank look when they think about how much longer we'll be away from home. Eight to nine more months, especially at the operational pace we've seen down here so far, will be a long time. The others nodded in agreement again. Okay, good info, Stan. Thanks. Anyone else have anything they need to bring up? The others shook their heads this time. Bones, anything you need to report as chief medical officer? Other than seeing minor sprains and strains beginning to pop up, no. It seems counterintuitive with the pace we're at, but keep reminding the others how important PT is to keeping healthy, guys. As we get deeper into the deployment, it'll only get worse. Good point, Doc. We'll plan for a platoon run around the housing area in a day or two. We're at a lower altitude here, about 1,500 feet lower than at Bagram, but we still need the exercise. Jeff drifted over to the base hospital after his shower. He restocked his bags there and checked on the aviation forecast for the night. He wanted to plan ahead in case he needed to call for dust off. While talking to one of the Army flight medics outside the ER, the doors from the flight line crashed open. The airside ambulance crew pushed their patient into the emergency room while Jeff and the flight medic held the doors open. An Air Force pararescue man, known as a para-jumper or PJ, strode in behind them. They closed the door behind themselves while they remained in the ER to listen to the PJ's report. Jeff learned the wounded soldier was a New Zealand private from a unit operating at the edge of that country's area of responsibility. Kandahar's hospital was closer than any other from where they came from. The scene was no different than the ones Jeff witnessed at the hospitals in Boston. The only patient in the emergency room at the time, the wounded New Zealand Defense Force soldier, was the staff's sole focus. To an outsider, the ER was pure chaos. To Jeff, it was organized chaos. In the end, the chaos won. Jeff saw the disappointment on the staff's faces. No one liked losing a patient if they were in medicine, even though it was inevitable. The not yet 20 year old should be back home getting ready for his nation's summer, not lying dead in some tent halfway around the world and in the wrong hemisphere. One young doctor, another New Zealander from her uniform, began to prepare the soldier's body for viewing by removing tubes and wires. The American nurses understood why she started doing this and not them. Jeff and the Army flight medic nodded sadly to the PJ and walked back to the small hallway area. They discussed other similar outcomes in patients through the years and how much alike the disappointment of losing each one was. A C-130 and two unfamiliar helicopters zoomed in low when Jeff stepped out of the hospital two hours later. The color scheme wasn't American. He turned around when he recognized the roundels on the tails. Stepping into the ER again, he stopped beside the NZ doctor. Ma'am, I think your countrymen are here. Thank you, Sergeant. I best meet them at the door. Sarah, I was the attending on duty today, a young U.S. Army captain said. It's my responsibility. Yes, Captain Mitchell, but the private was my countryman. I'll go. 
Captain Mitchell nodded, and the young NZ lieutenant walked out the airfield doors. A soldier approached with a dark blue bundle. Sir, I have the private's flag. The soldier unfolded it to reveal a defaced British blue ensign, one with a constellation of seven pointed white stars. Begging your pardon, Captain Mitchell, but that's the wrong flag, Jeff said quickly. No, it's not, the other soldier protested. Jeff persisted. Sir, that's the flag of Australia. Look at the flag patch on the private sleeve. There are only four five-pointed stars on it. We're going to insult the private, his unit, and his country if we don't find the right flag quickly. <laughs> Captain Mitchell turned to the soldier holding the Australian flag. Find the right one now, Bernier. Bernier darted away. The young man was mercifully out of sight when Lieutenant Martin led the private's unit into the ER, a unit clearly just in from the field. The faces of his friends fell further when they saw Private Tayapa's lifeless body on the table. Captain Mitchell and Jeff stepped out of the way to let Tayapa's fellow Kiwis have a moment in private with him. I think you just saved the day, Sergeant, Captain Mitchell muttered under his breath on the other side of the curtain. I'm glad we were able to avoid that, sir, Jeff replied quietly, stressing the we. We Americans almost came off looking like real idiots. How do you know the difference? History major, sir. I concentrated in military history and studied the wars against indigenous peoples in many countries as part of that. That, and I'm a bit of a flag geek. Bernier returned with the correct flag a minute before the curtain around Tayapa reopened. Sir, Sergeant Wyahenga asked if we could spare a casket for Private Tayapa, rather than a body bag. They neglected to bring one with them. We'll have one brought in immediately, Sarah. Bernier stepped forward and handed Lieutenant Martin her nation's flag for the casket. Fifteen minutes later, Jeff stood with others on the airfield's tarmac, helping to form an honor guard for the New Zealanders. Other casualties had arrived in the interim, requiring the hospital staff's attention, but Jeff and the other Americans hadn't wanted the Kiwis to feel like they'd already been forgotten. The Americans snapped to attention and saluted their allies as they bore their compatriots' draped casket on their shoulders to the waiting aircraft. The honor guard turned to face the C-130 once they'd passed and waited in the late afternoon sun. The New Zealand soldiers placed Tayapa's casket on a temporary bier and spread out. They began to make faces and loud noises. A voice cried out in an unfamiliar language and all the NZDF personnel started stomping, beating their chests and chanting rhythmically. What are they doing? Someone behind Jeff asked. It's a haka, Jeff whispered with reverence. A what? Bernier asked from beside him. A haka, a traditional war dance from their country. The Maori people used to perform them before battle to intimidate their opponents and psych themselves up. Watching these 20 soldiers is impressive enough. Can you imagine facing off against hundreds, even thousands of warriors doing this before battle? New Zealanders perform hakas for many different purposes now. Here, they're saying goodbye. They're not all Polynesian, though. Doesn't matter, they're all Kiwis. It's their joint heritage. Kiwis. New Zealanders, Kiwis. That's why that bird, the Kiwi bird, is in their roundel. It's their officially unofficial national symbol. The Americans watched the rest of the haka in silence. Few understood what was happening other than those who heard Jeff's explanation, but they all knew it was somehow important. Sergeant Wyahenga saluted Lieutenant Martin before she returned to the hospital. Then he walked over to Jeff. He placed a hand on Jeff's shoulder. Thank you, Sergeant Knox. I heard you through the curtain while we said goodbye to Percy. It means a lot to us that you made sure he was properly honored. It was the right thing to do, Sergeant, Jeff shrugged. Wyohenga nodded, moved his hand to the back of Jeff's head, and then pressed his own forehead to Jeff's in a silent gesture of thanks. Heading home with him? Jeff asked after they straightened up. No, it's back to Helmand for us. Percy's headed home on the 130 from here, which is why we came in the choppers to say goodbye here. Hey, Konara, Sergeant. Jeff guessed that was goodbye. Sayonara, Jeff replied in Japanese. With many different ways to say goodbye in Japanese, that was the right one for this instance. Jeff doubted he'd ever see the New Zealander again. Wyohenga patted the back of Jeff's head 
and jogged back to the waiting choppers. Jeff watched them fly into the setting sun before heading back to his platoon's tent. Where'd you disappear to? Rick asked. We've got time for about five hours of sleep before we move out. What were you doing at the hospital all this time? Practicing international relations. 29 August 2004, east of Kandahar Airfield, Kandahar Province, Afghanistan. Dirt showered down over first squad. DJ, go! yelled Trace Dinkins. DJ hesitated. Move your ass, DJ! That got DJ moving. The AK-47 rounds impacting around him did also, despite the threat from small IEDs scattered through the compound. DJ's M4 chattered, spitting out covering fire as the rest of the squad bounded. First poured round after round onto the target house, trying to save the mission. Red tracers made the scene look like one from science fiction. Two weeks of chasing this band of insurgents had those insurgents pinned inside. Now first squad's premature detection threatened their successful capture. The platoon couldn't afford to let them slip out the back and disappear again. The other squads rushed to block routes of escape around the sides of the house. DJ vaulted a low wall trying to get behind the building. Ruben Montes followed as backup. A dust cloud appeared behind the wall the pair vaulted moments earlier. Doc, medic up. Jeff scrambled to keep up with Terry Nauert as both raced to the wall. Terry fired a long burst from his Mark 46 light machine gun through a window while Jeff scaled the wall and dragged DJ behind cover. Jeff didn't have to look very hard for injuries. DJ's left leg was missing below his knee and the stump pumped blood into the dirt. DJ tried to get up, but his motor control was gone. He likely had a concussion too. Jeff tore the tourniquet off DJ's armor, opened it in a wide loop and cranked it down around the remains of DJ's left thigh. Jeff ripped open the shredded right leg of DJ's BDUs. A quick scan revealed no other life threats, though a chunk of the man's right calf was missing. Jeff pulled his rifle into action and cut down an insurgent with a pistol running toward him. The uninjured trio looked for more threats but found none. Go, Doc. Get him out of here, Reuben yelled. Jeff tightened his rifle to his body. He hauled DJ up and across his shoulders in a fireman's carry. He sprinted for an opening in the wall some 50 yards away. The rest of the squad covered his exit by pouring fire into the house. Behind another wall, he lowered DJ to the ground, a pressure dressing over the stump to keep it clean during a detailed assessment another over DJ's right calf to cover the large hole in it. Jeff left the other shrapnel wounds covering the rest of DJ's right leg alone for now. Cutting open DJ's right sleeve, Jeff scrubbed at the man's arm to clean an IV site. While he attached the IV line, his platoon leader, Lieutenant Snow, ran up with the RTO. You need dust off, Doc? I need it like yesterday, sir. DJ's already lost a lot of blood. He's about to get some blood expander, but he needs the real thing and surgery at the hospital. Jeff started a second line as he was talking. You got it. Sushi, switch over to the medevac freck. Ben Suchensky, the RTO, punched in the right frequency setting and handed the microphone to Jeff. Kandahar medevac, Kandahar medevac, this is Romeo 2-2 whiskey. I have a medevac request, over. Unit calling for medevac, wait one, break, Romeo. 2-2 Whiskey, send your traffic over. Jeff gave Kandahar Medevac the report on DJ's condition, known as a nine line. He gave them only the first five lines of the report so they could launch the aircraft. He'd give the rest of the report to the medics on the coming chopper. He gave DJ's condition as urgent surgical. The Medevac Center read it back to verify they heard it correctly. Jeff confirmed they had. Roger, Romeo 22 Whiskey, return to 31277 and await contact from assigned medevac asset. ETA is 20 mics. Copy? Romeo 22 Whiskey, 20 mics. Roger, out. Jeff turned to his lieutenant. Now we wait, sir. Chopper and 20 mics. Right. Back to our frick. Yes, sir. Dust off will call us on 31277. You heard the man, Sushi. Jeff, you need any help? We're secure. Can you spare one of the other lifesavers from somewhere, sir? I'll get one right over here. The lieutenant clapped his medic on the shoulder and jogged away. Sushi stayed with Jeff to help communicate with the incoming chopper. 
Norm O'Terry ran up seconds later. He turned as pale as DJ when he saw his friend's condition. He shook off the shock. What do you need, Doc? Help me check for other injuries, Otto. We've got less than 20 minutes before Dostoff arrives. The pair found a shallow shrapnel wound to DJ's belly, but the jagged metal hadn't penetrated the muscle fascia protecting the abdominal cavity. The metal piece fell out of DJ's shirt when they pulled it open. When they removed the dressing covering DJ's stump, to flush dirt from the wound he began to scream. What's he yelling? Gibberish, Norm, he's concussed. I'm going to give him some verse to calm him down. Why not pain meds? Opiates can raise intracranial pressure. Benzodiazepines don't, and the Versed is also an amnestic. He won't remember a damn thing about the injury or transport after I give it to him. He's lost a fair amount of blood, so we probably don't have to worry about his ICP, but his pressure's too low to add opiates to benzos. The combo might drop his pressure even more. I don't want to take the chance. Hey, Doc, Sushi called, extending the radio mic to Jeff. Dust off 7-1 to Romeo 2-2 whiskey over. Norm. Jeff handed Norm an infrared strobe and pointed where he wanted it placed. Dust off 7-1-2-2 whiskey. We are marking the west edge of LZ with an IR strobe. I say again, marking west edge of LZ with India Romeo strobe. Over. Jeff described the LZ and the unarmed medical chopper set down two minutes later. Armed escorts circled overhead. Jeff, Norm, and two of their platoon mates carried DJ's stretcher to the waiting chopper. The chopper's flight medics took Jeff's brief report and climbed inside. Jeff jogged back to the platoon as the chopper flew off. He gonna be all right, Doc? 2LT Snow asked. Jeff shrugged. Above my pay grade, sir. Norm and I gave him the best care we know how to. The flight crew and the docks at K-Town will do the same. Good enough. Our ride will be here in 10. Let's get ready to get the hell out of here. Where's he headed next? Rick asked while he and Jeff watched the Air Force C-17 loaded with wounded claw its way into the sky. Landstool, probably Walter Reed after that. He's looking at a long rehab with his good leg as it is. Never mind the one he's missing. Jeff sighed. When are we getting the hell out of here? To go back to Bagram about two weeks. Not fucking soon enough. Jeff muttered in anger and fatigue. It's not like that area's a vacation spot either. I can do without an op every night, Rick. You and me both, brother. At least there we'll catch a night off once in a while. They made their way back to their tent. One of their fellow rangers there sat on his bunk rubbing at his neck as they re-entered. How you doing, Monty? Jeff asked. I'm okay, Doc. Reuben Montes continued stretching his neck. Nothing 800 ibuprofen won't take care of. More? You go easy on that stuff. You start shitting blood and it's time to back off for a few days. A decade and a half of medical training and that's your advice? Their platoon sergeant asked. Back off if you start shitting blood? You want to butt out, Rick? This is a private patient provider type of discussion here. I think one of my guys passing out in the shitter falls under things I need to know. He hasn't passed out yet, so no, you don't need to know unless and until he does. Anyway, you said you think DJ was distracted, Monty? Rick asked, changing the subject. Definitely, Sarge. Normally he would have spotted that IED, but that skank from home told him she was pregnant just before we went out on the mission last night. Why would that distract him? Didn't you tell me your girl's pregnant too? You haven't lost your focus. Roma's going on four months pregnant, Sarge. She told me just before we came down here last month. She and I got it done before we deployed. The skank told DJ she was one month pregnant, the stupid bitch. Unless DJ took a flight home and came back without us noticing, someone else is plugging her. Wonderful. Jody's got his girl and gone, Rick muttered, paraphrasing a line from an old cadence. Someone keep an eye on Terry, Jeff cautioned. He's gonna be lost without his partner in crime. Never thought I'd miss this place, Terry Nowert muttered when they walked into their old tent at Bagram. Home sweet home. Right, Doc, Trace snorted. I'm surprised they still don't have those plywood bee huts finished. I'm glad they don't, Trace. What? We need to get the job done and get the hell out of here. The last thing we need is to start getting comfortable here. That's just inviting mission creep. 
Jeff sighed. Rick, when are we getting the new guy? Should be here today or tomorrow. What's his name again, Alphabet? Nauert asked. Har, Har, Terry, Blajewski, if you must know. Wait, who did this kid blow? Still not funny, Terrence, Rick replied, crossing his arms. Hey, guys, Lieutenant Snow called while stepping into the tent. The platoon snapped to attention, but he waved them back to at ease. There's a USO show tonight, a concert. I grabbed tickets for everyone while I was over at the garrison office if you guys are interested. Lord knows you deserve it, after the past month. Thanks, sir, Rick answered for the group. 2LT Snow was sharp for a butter bar. He let the NCOs manage the minor details of the platoon while he kept his eyes on the big picture. He also took care of his rangers. Who's playing tonight? Jeff smiled when he heard the answer. They put on a really good show. That they did, Rick, Jeff replied. Not my normal kind of music for the most part, but you can tell they love to play. Not your normal kind of music? You mean because it's from this century, Doc? Nauert asked. You're cruising for a bruising, Terry. <laughs> you know, Doc, we could have been through the line and back in our tent by now if you'd have let us get up by the stage, rather than having us stand in the back. Is it past your bedtime, Terry? You don't have to stand in line to meet the band, you know. You can always head back by yourself. Terry smirked at him but didn't leave. Why did we stand in back anyway, Doc? We weren't in back, Stan. We were in the middle of the arena near the soundboard, remember? Acoustically, that's the best place to see a concert. Acoustically, that place was like a cardboard box, complained Sean Engel one of Enos's machine gunners. So think about how it would have sounded standing somewhere else. Turn around, guys. We're finally at the tables. That night's band sat behind a series of tables signing autographs. Progress through the line was slow due to the number of photos they also allowed the service members to take. The band couldn't say no to requests from their country's fighting men and women. Jeff shook hands with members of the band, thanking them for coming to Afghanistan to play for the troops. They in turn thanked him for putting himself in harm's way in their name. Jeff made his way down the line of tables collecting the signed pictures until he reached the lead guitarist's table. Who should I make this out to? The man asked, his question fading when he looked up and recognition dawned. With as long as you played tonight and how many photos you've probably signed by now, I'm surprised your hand hasn't fallen off yet. You dried up old has been. What? Woo. You always this articulate these days, George, or are you still dealing with jet lag? George Adler stood, came around the table, and wrapped the man he considered his savior in a bear hug. His eyes watered while he slapped Jeff on the back over and over. Jeff's platoon and the other servicemen and women stared at them in shock. The two friends separated, smiling at each other. You look good, George. You lose some weight. A little, George said, smiling wider. Kelsey's got me on a diet. What about you? Did you swallow a set of weights or something? You look even bigger than when I last saw you in 2001. I had to show these kids I could keep up, Jeff replied while hooking his thumb at his platoon. George? Kelsey Goodacre asked as she stepped up to the two friends. She slipped her arm around George's waist. He did the same to her in return. Kels, you know the Jeff I always credit with saving my life. This is him. The gawker's shock grew when Kelsey Goodacre, the biggest crossover artist in American music, pulled Jeff down to kiss him on the cheek and give him a hug. The trio looked back at the now stalled line when she released him. I should let you two get back to work, Jeff said. <laughs> you think you're just going to show up like that and disappear again? George protested. How many of your friends are here with you? My whole platoon, about 40 of us. George looked at Kelsey who nodded before walking away. Was it something I said? Actually, Jeff, yes, it was. She's going to find our senior production assistant so you and your platoon can wait for us where the after party's supposed to be. Like I said, you're not getting away that easily. I can't believe you know George Adler, Rick said, shaking his head five minutes later while they waited for the band. I've known him for 10 or 11 years, Rick, but haven't seen him since the summer of 2001. How'd you meet him? It's classified classified. I'd rather not violate federal law by telling you. George can if he wants when he gets here. 
The platoon stared at him in silence. 